What's happening, guys? How's everybody doing? It's Friday. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little late, but you guys knew I was going to be a little late. Always, right? All right. How you guys doing? How's everybody doing out there? Talk to me. Let's see. There's that. Wait. Um, boop, 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 boop. Did I not do that? Apparently. Okay. Who's out there? What's going on, guys? Sorry, hold on. Let me see something here. I forgot to do something. Pop up where am I at? Not that. Who's out there? How's how's it going, guys? What are we doing? What are we doing? Let's go. Let's go. What's up, Mr. Powell? How you doing, sir? Don't want to hear about no. 114 over there in Vegas, huh? Love it, right? It's gonna be a good one. I know. Yeah, we'll be talking about Rebel Moon. For sure. Actually, when the panel gets on, what's going on? How's it going, guys? Stephanie, how you doing? Greetings, Mr. Hummingbird. Ahoy, ahoy. How's it going, bud? How you doing, Mr. McKenzie? Nice to see ya. Let's see. Everybody good? Let's see. Uh, trying to reach me on Twitter. Hmm. I'll have to look at my uh, I'll have to look at my messages, my requests, because sometimes my requests get a little too uh, get a little crazy. So, so if I didn't see that, so um, I'll check though. Debating on seeing Black Widow tonight or not? Hmm. No, you should be watching the vodka stream. What are you talking about? What are you thinking? Come on. What are you doing? Just kidding. You, can, you know, go see it. And have a have a night at it. But it is Friday. Or I don't know. I don't know where you're at. So maybe you're in a different time zone. So cheers. Cheers, sir. Mr. Lobo. What's going on, Apara? How you doing? We got Jason here. Fear Jason. Yes. Release that Schumacher cut. Absolutely. Uh, did you see the Pearl Jam Funko Pops? No, I did not see those. Now Pearl Jam is getting a Funko Pops. When, when is Dave Grohl going to get his Funko Pop? You know, the Foo Fighters. When's that happening? You know, that's what I keep on waiting for. I know, uh, I actually, where was I? Mm. I was, uh, yeah, I was at the mall yesterday before I, I went and saw the movie. And they had this, they had this like bigger, like, uh, Lemmy. Yeah, they had like a Lemmy pop that I was tempted to get because, you know, it's Lemmy for God's sakes. But yeah. I saw that and I was like, oh man. And they do have like, you know, they have um uh they have various like rock stars, you know, like Freddie Mercury, of course, and I think they have some Led Zeppelin ones, and then they have some AC DC pops that just came out. But I'm like, man, where's where's the Metallica pops? Where's the uh, Foo Fighters pops? I mean, that's what I'm talking about, right, guys? You guys know me. All right, let me see here. Make sure I got this going, but yeah. Uh, doing the bourbon tonight, by the way, I was like, you know, I thought about vodka and I really enjoyed the vodka that I had last week, which was the, um, which was that, uh, kettle one cucumber mint really enjoyed that. Not going to lie, especially right out of the freezer. It's pretty, it was pretty refreshing. I'm not going to lie. That was pretty damn tasty. So Dave, you get the, oh yeah, there's, they're doing a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles two ones, huh? The Mikey pre-fight donuts. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. They did have one of those, didn't they? Interesting. Hi, Mom. How's it going? Uh, yeah, man, the Nationals just tied it. Come on, Giants. Got to keep that lead. Got to keep that lead. Let's see. What's up? Doing the bourbon. All right. That's right. I was, bourbon? No, bourbon. I'm doing a... Uh, Doing the bullet bourbon, of course, right here. I haven't even opened it yet, because if you guys watch the uh, if you guys watch the pregame show with um, with Paul from uh, Heavy Spoilers, 
let's see let's make it let's make it red if you saw that i i told you guys i was <laughs> that was like my last bit of booze just for that little pregame so um so yeah i went went out and uh got some bites you know i was just feeling i was feeling like doing bourbon tonight so of course bullet is always the one i usually go to so but uh yeah hopefully you guys enjoyed that little pregame show with uh of course paul heavy spoilers really enjoyed talking to him uh that's not the thing what the hell Sorry, I'm trying to upload something here. I'm trying to upload the thumbnail, and it's not working for me for some reason. Having technical difficulties, you know how it is. So I've got that save. Why is that not working? Interesting. Got that. Huh. But yeah, so yeah, I got the bullet bourbon today. No bourbon. There we go. Got it right there. Just going to break the seal on this bad boy right now. And yes, it is hot. It is hot. Especially when I was like setting things up. I got hot again. And for some reason, I didn't turn my AC all the way up. So now it just shut off. So throw it away. Oh, gotta love the sound. Oh, love that sound. All right. Let's have some fun tonight. It's been a long day. I tell you what, it's been a pretty damn long day. I think I was up by five o'clock this morning. Five o'clock, no nap, no nothing, but hey, what can you do? You know, bullet, yeah. Ah, what's going on, Aloxy? How you doing? So cheers, guys. Happy Friday. Ah, end of the week. The week has ended. Like I said, it's been, even though it was a short week, it felt like a long week. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know if it felt like that for you guys, but man, it was fun. It was, it was an okay week. It wasn't like I had a bad week or anything like that, but it was just... A lot of things that were happening and stuff like that. So, and then of course today, you know, like like I said, there was something that I was supposed to like sh um, shoot today that didn't that ended up getting postponed. If you guys saw that, saw me teasing that that was going to be posted tomorrow, but then it got postponed by like a you know a couple weeks probably. But it's definitely going to be um, it's definitely going to be something fun. It's going to be something uh, that you guys are going to enjoy. I'm definitely going to enjoy it. That's for sure. Okay. We got that. Let's see. Make sure I got my stuff here. But uh, yeah, so we'll see what happens with that. But um, yeah, it's freaking. Uh, uh, when I went to go, you know, it was about six o'clock, six thirty, and I went to go to the store. It was ninety-seven degrees outside. But yeah, I know I shouldn't complain, William. If you're listening, I know it's a. You said it's probably still a hundred degrees over there in Vegas. But uh, yeah, so yeah, what can you do, right? And uh, I think they just announced that now oh, we're starting to we're starting to ease into a drought again here in good old California. Just remember, I think uh, I think the Mr. Governor Mr. Governor was talking about that. So that's not good. But hey, what can you do? Yeah, we got out of the other drought, so I think we'll I think we'll be okay. But yeah, cheers everyone, cheers. Oh, it's good stuff, man. It's good stuff. And uh, I just posted my my uh, black widow review it was like down to the wire. I was trying to get that damn, that damn video out there. I didn't even tweet it, but you know, I'll just let, I'll just let, I'll just let it be for a little bit. I'll tweet it later. But yeah, finally did that. You know, got that out and I'll have my spoiler review out tomorrow because obviously with these movies, you got to do a spoiler review too, because even though it's like, even though a lot of people were talking about the whole Taskmaster thing today, <laughs> it's just like, oh, it's trending. And then you look wide, you go, oh, because people aren't really, okay, interesting. I don't know. I guess we'll see. But anyways, all right. I think uh, I think it's about time to bring my guest in. Um, you guys know this guy. I know a lot of people uh, follow this guy. Uh, of course, he's done numerous things. I mean, uh, I'm there's I'm gonna have a lot of questions for this guy, and uh, I really uh, really enjoying his uh, movie film podcast, and uh, that's where I started going. Okay, yeah, maybe I'll see if uh, he wants to come on and talk some movies. So, and he definitely does. So, without further ado, Mr. Zaki Hassan, what is up, sir? Hey, how's it going? It's going pretty good. How you doing? Thanks so much for having me. This is great. No, no problem, man. Thanks for coming on. I mean, like I said, I've been enjoying your podcast, and I uh, like the little dynamic you got with you and your uh, your co-host. And uh, so That's I thought great. thought I'd reach out. Um, let me uh, let me pull this up here. But uh, yeah, you guys can follow him, of course, 
over on Twitter, and then uh, and then of course listen to his podcast, the uh, the moviefilmpodcast.com. You got a lot of stuff underneath your bio. Author, film critic, professor, bylines of SF Chronicle, IGN. Geez, you just got a laundry list of stuff. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, when did you start doing all this stuff? When did you start getting into like um, you know film critique and all that and everything? Uh, I started writing film criticism in uh, high school. My my, I want to say my junior year of high school. So mm-hmm. that would have been. Uh, uh, I'm aging myself about 26 years ago, yeah. uh, and so I started doing it for my high school paper. And then when I went to college, uh, I started doing it for my college paper, and it was that was a, a job. I mean, it, that was. Uh, uh, that wasn't just for credit. That was, I got to actually be a professional critic. And so uh, I went to school in the suburbs of Chicago. So I got a lot of opportunities to go to screenings and, and sort of hone my craft there. And then even when the job ended, I just kept doing it right. uh, because I, for me, it was like, you know, I, I, I enjoy it. Number one, but number two, I just, I feel like it's like a muscle. You don't want it to atrophy, you know? So I would just keep doing it. And I created a, a web space where I could just sort of post reviews. And then uh, I've been very fortunate in that uh, by virtue of sort of continuing to do it and building a body of work, I've been able to write for a variety of different venues. These days I write for the San Francisco Chronicle. I do movie reviews for IGN. And I mean, it's, it's more than I ever could have possibly imagined. It's crazy. It's crazy how like, yeah, when I talk to people who've like been in um, the business for a while, I'm always very curious of like, you know, how, how did you start? What led to the various different things? I mean, obviously, you know, you said 26, I mean, it was a whole different, I mean, it was a whole different ball game two years ago. <laughs> right. It just seems like it's constantly evolving. I mean, I think, especially with the whole pandemic, I mean, when it came to me, I was like, all right, let's just start live streaming like crazy. And everybody mm-hmm. started live streaming like crazy too. And it was just like, it was a thing to do and you know, <laughs> really a lot of fun. But I mean, it's constantly just like, what's the next thing? And then we got these Twitter, what, spaces or whatever the hell it's called. Right. And I see, you know, Rotten Tomatoes and Eric Davis and, you know, those get, you know, he's, they're utilizing that space a lot. I haven't tried it yet. I don't know if you have. Uh, I've, I've been in a Twitter space. I, I can't remember who. Um, what the context of it was, but that was my first time being in that. And yeah, this, like, as you say, a lot it, it, the technology and and the forums in which we're able to have these discussions changes so rapidly. Sometimes it's very challenging to keep up with it. And it's you know cert- certainly for me, you know, I've been writing for long enough, I've been podcasting for long enough, where it's easy to just get comfortable. Yeah. with sort of the routine and you know you that's that can be challenging to to shake yourself out of yeah it definitely does and when did you um start your podcast uh i have been uh, doing the podcast now it'll be nine years next month nice um so in that time we've done uh 200 something regular episodes we've done uh i don't even know how many com- yeah yeah we i don't know how many i think 50 60 <laughs> at this point and uh, that, that, you know, it's very funny because the podcast essentially started uh, as, a, as a way for me to talk to my friend, uh, essentially, because what I found is as I was getting older and, you know, uh, at that time, about nine years ago, you know, I had uh, three kids already. Uh-huh. And, you know, my, my partner, Brian, who lives in Chicago, he, or excuse me, he lives in SoCal. We met each other in Chicago. Uh, but, you know, I would go down every couple months and just kind of spend a weekend or whatever, and we'd work on stuff and that became less and less because you know children require attention and things like that so i i told him i was like why don't we start a podcast and that'll give us an excuse to talk to each other there you go and and to be honest that's that is the reason i do it as cliche as it sounds i mean i'm grateful and and honored and unbelievably uh, uh, you know, uh, blown away by the fact that people have continued to listen to us for this long. But ultimately, what it comes down to for me is I want to talk to my buddy. We like talking about the same stuff. We like making each other laugh. And so that's that's the show. Yeah. I, I, uh, like I said, I like you guys. You could tell that you guys are friends when you listen to the podcast. And uh, it was funny, too, because um, when I was listening to your last episode, you actually brought up something because last week on the Vodka Stream, we had a major fast and furious um discussion mm-hmm. and you actually brought up something that made me go huh didn't think about that it was when you said that essentially you got the first fast 
the fast and the furious. Um, <laughs> and then you have too, too fast, too furious, and then Tokyo Drift. And you're like, but essentially those are spinoffs. And then when you have the fourth one, which is they drop the thes and it's fast and furious, that's essentially almost like the direct sequel to the first movie. Right. And then you kind of wonders like, okay, so if the other two didn't exist and that was like, we just went to that one. Would the would the franchise be as successful as it is now, or if they would have went with what Vin Diesel wanted? When you know, obviously, he's always like, family, 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 <laughs> and and I guess you know he wasn't having it when it came to what they wanted to do with the sequel. But yeah, you brought up that, and I went, huh, that is interesting because yeah, that is essentially a direct sequel to the first one because it brings back all the players. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know what. What I, I speak to that a little bit just from my own experience talking to my students because, uh, you know, when the first movie came out, I was, uh, uh, when was that? 2001, right? So I was like 21, 22, I think 22. Mm -hmm. And and I was, you know, I liked it. I thought it was fine, but I wasn't like blown away by it, by as like a lot of people who I, yeah. you know, I think younger people were. But in 2009, I was, I was teaching a college class and talking to my students when fast and furious was coming out and yeah. they were like this is man you know that one came out when i was a kid and oh my god i've been waiting so long for this <laughs> and i was like all right like you know I was, yeah. and I, I wasn't i wasn't judging it negatively but i was like all right i think i get it and then and even then i'll be honest i, I think i've said this on on the podcast i didn't jump into the sequels until the sixth one Mm. So, so I watch number six, not having seen any of the other ones after number one. Okay. Um, and I watch the opening credit montage, which is like the whole thing, you know, clips from all the other ones. And I see the way people in the audience are reacting at that point. I was like, all right, <laughs> now I get it. I was like, I was like, this is for them. What for me, when I was a kid, lethal weapon was. Yeah. Um, when I watched Lethal Weapon 4, which came, you know, several years after the third, it was like, hey, all right, we're all back. This is great. That's what Fast and Furious is. And I and and once I viewed it that way, I'm like, you know what? I it's you can like or dislike any individual movies, but you got to respect the the sweep of this whole bananas thing. You know, yeah, it, it is pretty crazy because, you know, I, I I think I didn't see Tokyo Drift in the uh, theater, but I think I saw all the other ones. OK. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was right there from the beginning. And yeah, I, I mean, I enjoyed the first one when it came out. I think, yeah, I enjoyed it pretty good. I mean, I, it was I always found it kind of funny. It's like, oh, these these 10 second races are lasting two minutes. What the heck? <laughs> I, look at that. I mean, I, but I get it because, you know, you can't just you can't just have two cars just, you know, go and then stop. You know, you got to make you got to build up some suspense, which they did a pretty good job with doing that. But the, and then uh, when it came to the sequels, yeah, I didn't see Tokyo Drift, but then I had friends who really loved Tokyo Drift. Hmm. And then I just, they would always like have it on. So I was like, all right, it's fine. You know, but I didn't, you know, I thought it was kind of weak. But then when it came to the fourth one, I actually think the fourth one is probably might be my favorite. A lot of people even say, like you said, six, that's a lot of people's favorite is six. Hmm. And that's what I've noticed. I mean, just talking to people, they're like, oh, yeah, fat, uh, the sixth one's like five, five and six are, are yeah. the ones I found. Yeah. Yeah. I think when like Dwayne Johnson like got into it and it really yeah. got into the whole like, all right, we'll have fast cars and then heists, you know? <laughs> that's right. what we're doing now. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I mean, I remember when Fast Five, that trailer came out and you just see that car just going over the cliff. And, and they're just like, oh, let's just leap, let's just float off of it. And it was, I think it kind of blew people's minds because you saw that in the trailer and people were like, what the hell? This is just, this went up a notch. And I yeah. think that's where it really just kicked into gear. And then for me, you know, after Paul Walker, you know, may he rest in peace. It's just, yeah. it just doesn't feel the same anymore. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Did you end up I, seeing I, F9 yet? I I did yeah I actually I went opening night and it's very funny because it's my uh, uh my partner Brian Hall he he was not going to be able to see it for a few weeks and so yeah, I get out of the, vacation or something right? he, yeah exactly he's uh he's um uh, he's engaged so he's he went across country uh, and he's coming back with his fiance and so he's like I'm going to be off the grid for a couple weeks I was like no problem but um. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Hey, go watch F nine before you go, and we can quickly record." He's like, "I want to see it with my fiance," and I'm like, "Fine, you know? I guess." <laughs> but it gets out, and and this is my first movie, by the way. F nine is my first movie since in the Invisible Man March of last year. Wow. So 
first back in the theater. And so I, I call him up and I'm like, I, I know you haven't seen it. I don't want to spoil anything, but I will say that uh, there's a moment where, where Tej and, and Roman are literally actually in space. <laughs> and, and I thought to oh, myself, no, I, know. I thought to myself, this all started with stealing DVD players from the back of a truck. That's where <laughs> this started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember you said that. It was like, yeah, that's exactly where it started. I mean, and it was funny too because I remember the big thing like when that movie came out. I was like, I, you know, I live kind of close to Hemet, and they shot that that opening scene or where they kept the cars in the city oh, of Hemet over here. Nice. And I was like, ah, and also that was always like a thing. Like, oh yeah, they shot it so close. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it essentially. It, I think I even thought about that too after I saw F9. I'm like, I think I just was thinking about the first one. I went, man, they were just. Remember when they were. They broke into like someone else's like garage and trying to see what they were what they were driving and stuff right. like that. I'm like, it's just it's just not. I mean, they went to fucking space. <laughs> like, and that's you know, it's I I'm told I'm like it's it's all about like your frame of mind. That's what I decided. I'm like, you're either down with this or you're not. And I'm yeah. like, you know what? This is where we are. This is what and 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 I I applaud the fact that somehow no pun intended they've kept gas in the tank for twenty years. Yeah. Come on, you know there's there's one point where Ludacris is like he's telling Roman he's like it's all about physics man and I'm like how dare you say that <laughs> it, you have a car oh. swinging from a thing and landing on another thing and rolling over five times and nobody is injured even do how dare you. I know. How dare you say that? <laughs> it's all about I, physics and math. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think like with my, uh, I think with my, uh, like my my review of it, it was which was kind of a rant because I kind of I, I I also mentioned too, like speaking of like Ludacris's character. I mean, you have um, Tyrese's character, and it almost seems like they never tell him the plan. Is it me? <laughs> and he's always just like surprised. And then like, I think you guys even talked about it too. It's like, he's literally yelling out what is happening. <laughs> wait, we're going into space now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, wait, did you not get deep brief? What's going on here? <laughs> wait, that little blue ball underneath <laughs> us is earth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh man. And it's just so funny too, because when it, when it comes to that moment, I mean, they just briefly go, oh, let's just, you know, I mean, they had to set it up and it's funny how they set it up with the Tokyo Drift guys, yes. you know, and it's like, oh, wait, how, OK, what's the time frame on this? Because these guys are like 16 years older. But is it right. supposed to be a couple few years? What is ha What's the timeline? Because Tokyo Drift comes after a lot of this. That's true. I, yeah, yeah, we were talking about that last week. Like, wait, wait, the timeline. Tokyo Drift supposed to happen like after Han died, which, of course, Nobody stays yes. dead in the fast saga either. Right? Yeah. I just love how first of all, I'm so I'm glad they brought Han back because A, he's a great yeah, character. And I B so I, I didn't like that the you know, by making uh, Deckard Shaw a good guy, it almost made it necessary to bring Han back. But there's the scene where Han is like explaining what happened. Yeah. Which is a retcon to a scene that is itself a retcon. <laughs> So we're we're like incepting. It's like a Jeff Johns comic, you know. He would do that, right? Yeah. Like, oh, this is the thing that. And remember when this happened? And you see that scene. It's from another thing. So we're like three layers deep. So I'm waiting for the next one to be like the person who witnessed what happened to Han, and he's like, "Well, here's what actually happened." Because Han was really dead, but he's a cyborg who I created. And you're like, "Oh, damn. Okay." I would not be surprised if they went that way. I'm, That's where we're headed. I'm like, where where else can they what 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 else can they do? I'm like, time travel, multiverse, what is gonna happen? I mean, obviously they're and it's funny too because they've been talking about like, well, what if they crossed over with Jurassic World? And I'm like, uh, and they've joked about it. And I went, wait a minute, they joked about space years ago. Right. And now we're here. Oh shit, it's gonna happen. Isn't it's it? it's all in the same corporate umbrella, so don't rule it out. Oh my god! I mean, I just, I, 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 I would not be surprised if they incorporate some kind of time trap. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you, you mentioned the Tokyo Drift guys, and I just going back to what I was saying earlier. That's what. So when I watched it opening night, um, what's his face? The guy I forget the the actor, um, the man, the Tokyo Drift guy. I forget. Josh Luke, no, it's not Lucas it's Black. Luke, Lucas Lucas Black. Black. Lucas Black. Yeah. So he shows up, and and somebody behind me is like Sean Boswell, <laughs> and like really excited. Yeah, and I was like. I was kind of like, really? Like not, and not because I don't 
like Tokyo Drift. I did like it, but I was like, it's amazing to me that people have this affinity for yeah. all these. You know, like to me, it reminds me of a couple of years ago when when Black Panther came out and it had the post credit scene mm-hmm. with with Bucky and somebody in the audience goes Bucky, like yeah. really, and I'm like, that's what the, that's who the fast characters are. That is true. The generation that's growing up with them, and I think that's awesome. You know, that's again. That, that's what I. That's kind of what I love about it, even more than the films. Yeah, I just love the 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 fandom that there is for it. I think that's cool. Yeah, I, you know, and I can appreciate that too. I think it's just because you know one of my gripes was you know, I mean, with the next ones, they're gonna have to do the CGI Paul Walker. I mean, mm-hmm. because I mean, yeah. how many excuses can they make of like why he's not there? But his to, wife to is just there. Miss like, Brian. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's watching the kids. Well, okay, and then it's like, oh, <laughs> he's gonna show up at the, you know, and it's like, I just, uh, I, it, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, I kind of, I mean, I, I mean, I know they wanted to respect. And not be like, oh, he's gonna, they're gonna kill him off. But I almost think, like, maybe, you know, if we, if Paul Walker, if we somehow, some, he'd probably be okay with, like, hey, if my character died behind the wheel, well, I mean, mm. you know, I, I just don't know. I mean, it's, it's tricky. Like a touchy thing. It's a tricky thing. I mean, I mean, they're, they're dealing with it with Black Panther too. And I'm kind of, yeah. yeah, I'm kind of on the, on the, you know, I, I don't know where I, I kind of go, well, Maybe they should recast. I don't know. But then at the same time, I'm kind of curious what they do with that. Have you heard like have you heard anything like what they're gonna be doing with Black Panther? The I, well, so I don't know anything for certain, but but I was actually just discussing this with my friend yesterday. Yeah. Uh, he was asking, like, oh yeah, what's going on with Black Panther? And I'm like, I guess I guess people assume I know. <laughs> um Well, you we, got a you got a lot of uh, you know, credits to your name. <laughs> I well he, <laughs> <laughs> but it's mainly critique. I get it. It's not like scooping it, stuff or anything. Yeah, like I yeah. I don't know this for certain, but I would not be surprised if they set the second one during the snap, mm. which gives a, oh, a, a little bit of a little wow. bit of buffer, right? Okay. Because, because to me, they've said they said uh, you know they're not even thinking about recasting right now, and I'm like, well, you have a five year time period where T'Challa is not even on the board. And wow. speaking as an audience member, I'm like, I would be interested to know what happened in Wakanda during those five years. How did you reconcile? Right. It because does. because if it's a monarchy and the king just disappears, they're not just holding the throne open. They, I'm assuming he, they think he's dead. So I, that'd I be- think you're on to something. I did not even consider that. I did yeah. not even consider that. I think it's because, you know, anytime you think like sequel, you just think, oh, the next one, the next one. You know, I mean, I, did you see Black Widow yet? I did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what'd you think, by the way? I thought it was all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, kind of just like a. Huh, I, okay. I mean, I, I, yeah, it's. I don't. I think what I said on Twitter is like I don't regret having watched it. I, I <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, it's not. I'm not in a hurry to rewatch it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'm not. I mean, it was just kind of. I just posted my review too, and I kind of, you know, I was like, after sitting on it for a day, I went, eh, you know, it's just it, the the problem that they had was like, okay we wanted to have a black widow movie, uh-huh. but then they killed her off in yeah. end game, obviously. So it's like, how do you do it all? Oh, let's just squeeze it. It's, I really think they should have just went full fledged. Hey, just do origin, just do an origin or they could have, could have, ba- you know, balanced it for like, I mean, I get what the plot was and it made sense, but at the same time, it's like, all right, well, let's show why she wants to take down, you know, the red room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, obviously we know why, because she was a part of it. So show a lot of that instead of just kind of, they kind of just brush right through. I mean, obviously, you know, we won't yeah. go into like big time spoilers guys. Cause I know it's still new, but you know, they, it just, to me, they just felt like they kind of brushed through like the black widow origin part of it. And yeah. just like, okay, now we're at this, you know, now we're at this point right here where it's after civil war. And it just felt very out of place to me. You know, it just was like, okay, this has happened. Now she's going to go on and find Steve and then we get infinity war. But I I just really felt like that. I was like, I was intrigued back in, you know, age of Ultron has its issues, obviously. Um, But I kind of dug when they kind of showed some of the, the, her origin, like her at the, that school and whatever that, I just kind of like, was like, okay, I kind of want to see that. And then they just kind of went, no, we don't want to do an origin. So I was like, all right, I don't know. What do you yeah, think? I no, I I I I agree with what you're saying, and and I would add that, I think I think um, 
a big part of the appeal for the MCU at this point is whether we're talking movies or the television shows, it's all one big, very big television series in essence. And so by that perspective, every film, you kind of look at it as an individual episode and you say it has to serve two purposes, right? It has to sort of set stuff up that you're excited to see pay off. And then it has to be interesting on its own. And, and in that sense, the stuff it set up, I didn't, I was like, all right, well, let's see where this goes. So it wasn't like, yeah, you know, again, it's like, I'm, I'm on board anyway. So I'll, I'll be seeing it. And my (laughs) kids, you know, my kids live and breathe this stuff. So for me, that's part of, that's part of the fun. Um, As far as the story itself, it, for me, I was like, well, this is like one, one last chance to hang out with Scarlett Jansen as his character. And so let's sort of enjoy the experience. That was how I looked at it. Okay. Um, it it felt very very episodey to me. Yeah. You know, so that it, it yeah. felt like the the formula. Like it's, yeah. You know, it was like all right, start right here, it's right there, and then we have this big ending where something's falling from the sky. <laughs> yeah. Like, right. It was like all right. I don't know. I just you know. I, I think I always when it comes to you know specifically when it when I when I when when I was thinking about like. Black Widow, I'm going, okay, try to make it as much like Winter Soldier because she was great in that. She was so Mm -hmm. awesome in that. I'm like, try to make it Winter Soldier as possible. And it just kind of didn't really, I mean, maybe certain parts of it, you know, it wasn't all all bad, but at the same time, and then even going back to, you know, the Fast Saga, I mean, Jesus Christ, you want to talk about people who are like (laughs) rolling in cars and falling off crap and walking (laughs) away unscathed. Holy shit. (laughs) I think I think with with the MCU stuff, what I've found generally is there's like a baseline that that it doesn't tend to go below. Yeah, and I'm 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 okay with the baseline. Sometimes it it really exceeds that, and there's a handful that are really, in my opinion, exceptional. But to me, I'm like even the lesser ones. I never I never feel like I wasted my time, and I think that's yeah. ultimately where I'm at with this one. No, I mean, I, I I feel like that. Too. I mean, I think I'm like that with like every movie, you know, yeah. if I'm going to go, if I'm paying to go see a movie, you know, it's not, I don't think they owe me something. If like, you know, oh, <laughs> how dare you owe me my money back. Cause it was terrible. I mean, I even yeah. felt like that, like even going to, to see, you know, justice league back in 2017, sure. you know, sure. I mean, there were some fans that were like, Hey, you know, Warner brothers, you sold me the wrong movie and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, well, it's not how it works. I mean, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I never look at like a movie like that. I'm like, hey, if I'm going to go and pay money for a movie, you know, I'm not, it's odd. Sorry, there's sometimes I'll walk out and just hate the movie, you know, and that's just yeah. the way it is. And, you know, when it comes to these movies, it's like, yeah, I mean, they're all not going to be winners. And I don't, I, I went in with low expectations for uh, Black Widow and I kind of walked out like, yeah, that's what. I kind of was expected. Just nothing really. I'm intrigued to see where it goes because yeah. yes, it does do that, you know, as every Marvel uh, movie does. It's like it sets something up, and I'm intrigued because I, you know, I, I really, I really liked uh, Florence Pugh's character. I liked she's Jolina. great. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she really. But I, I did feel like it was kind of, man. Why am I more intrigued by the side characters more than the main character that this is about? You know, it's like, yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, I I wonder if I would have liked it more, not knowing where her story ends. I, right. I you know, I, I and I that's sort of an unknowable, uh, uh, you know, question. But I, I did think about that. That is true because we all know her fate. So it's kind of like, all right, you know, let's let's just do this. And I mean, I think they they try to do as they, they try to do as much of a job of like. Hey, remember she's doing this. This is during this time as much as they could. Like they, yeah. there was a lot of references to that she's an Avenger and this, that, and this. Which I actually kind of like that. I kind of like that when she meets back up with these people that she once knew. They, they kind of just go like, I mean, they have kind of a, you know, there's a little gripe about like, oh yeah, you're an you're an Avenger. Look at you, uh, like, yeah. fancy pants over here. Like what the hell? <laughs> and then, but then right. there's like at the same time, you got some characters going, hey you became an Avenger. Look at you, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So I did kind of dig that little uh, back and forth. I thought Florence and uh, Scarlett had a really good dynamic I agree. and everything, but then there's just sometimes where I'm like, Oh man, Ugh, that's a lot of CGI and it's just <laughs> right out there. I'm like, 
you know, sometimes it's just, eh, you can kind of see the seams a little bit. And I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> That's when you watch Loki and it's like, oh, that looks beautiful. You yeah. Know? Loki yeah. WandaVision, they had a lot. I mean, are you enjoying the uh, the shows too? I am, yeah. You know, it, uh, as I was saying earlier, for me, uh, the fun of it is uh, getting to share it with my kids and experiencing the 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 Marvel universe through their eyes. Um, the way I, you know, for me, the Marvel universe will always be the comics, right? And um, the, the, I, what I realized long ago with my kids is like they're never going to be interested in my comics. I got I got decades worth of issues that they're not even going to look at. <laughs> but for them, they get that experience through the the movies. You know, well, this oh, come is, on, they they knew about the Thanos cop copter right come on <laughs> they actually did believe it or did they? Oh, nice. <laughs> and that's that's what happens when you're zaki Hassan's kid you get you yeah. you know random uh, factoids like that it's just actually just before i got on with you i was sitting here i was reading um an x-men comic from from 1980 something and there's a uh they end up there the x-men are in asgard and so there's a reference to like um one of the characters like oh thor isn't here because blah 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 and there's a little there's a little editorial note, like read that in Thor number, blah, 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 you know? And I was reading that and I was like, this is what it's like for my kids to watch the MCU. It's true. Where there's this whole universe happening where we happen to be in this portion, but meanwhile, there's a whole other thing happening there. And so they're experiencing it on the ground floor. And I, I always, I'm like, that's, that's great because they're going to, for, you know, when they into their adulthood, they'll they'll have these very distinct positive memories of of experiencing this universe in real time. Yeah, just like yeah. you know what we did as kids reading yeah. you know these books and stuff. And you know, I mean, it's same thing too. I mean, like not every issue is going to be a winner. Exactly. I mean, probably most of them are forgettable. Like you know, we don't remember every single one. I mean, there's some people like you know my buddy Scott who you know probably join us in a little bit, uh, and he's a, an encyclopedia when it comes to stuff. <laughs> but I mean. You know, I mean, some of the books that I even have just right here, I mean, these are like, you know, Killing Joke, Ego, you know, there's just uh, yeah. Long Halloween. I mean, those are the classics. You remember right. the classics, but sometimes, yeah, you just have like a book like you just read. I mean, are people going to know that, you know, right. like, like off the bat, you know, some people, but yeah. Um, so like going to um, from Marvel to the DCEU, what are you looking forward to when it comes to what they're doing up <laughs> over there in, at uh, Warner Brothers? Oh man, I think I think I'm looking forward to everything they got in the pipeline. You know, we got uh, I think Black Adam probably the most. Yeah, um, and mainly because I'm just I'm like I want to see how these characters are are imagined. Um, in in this universe and i mean granted we we saw hawkman on smallville but i mean he didn't look look he didn't look great yeah. uh when you say all this hodge as hawkman i'm like i want to see that you know <laughs> yeah uh, obviously dwayne Good johnson yeah. dwayne johnson as black adam like you can just imagine what that looks like but the uh, other stuff dr fate you know like yeah. i'm like this, Brosnan, this, oof. yeah it's great um and then what else that uh, we got the aquaman Aqu I loved Aquaman. So well, I, I know they got the. They're going to have you know various JLA members. I mean, yeah. Gonna oh, and then of course Flashpoint or, or whatever it's called. The, oh the yeah, Flash, yeah. Um, I'm that, I'm excited. Batman, of course, yeah. The, I mean, yeah, yeah. To me, um, I I see nothing but exciting projects on the horizon from DC. I think, uh, you know, it, whether whether the 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 Zack Snyder the you Snyder know five verse. part thing the Snyder verse stuff you know and even that it depends on what we consider the Snyder verse because arguably he's got DNA in every single one of these other things right I mean he is they him and Deborah are executive producers on the Suicide Squad which kind of scratches makes me scratch my head because you know I mean I don't anytime like somebody's like put as executive producer I'm like well I mean sometimes the EP doesn't even show up to the set I mean. I, I mean, I get that, like, you know, Christopher Nolan was pretty much, he was a producer on Man of Steel and then executive producer on the, the next two movies. But right. I mean, you know, but I don't know, like, the whole logistics of, like, okay, so is the reason why they're executive producers? Because there is some characters that came from his movies? Because essentially, Suicide Squad, I mean, yeah, it was based in his universe, yeah. but... 
you know, that was David Ayer's like characters and his, you know, the casting and stuff. I, I don't know exactly if I'm, is it just because maybe he was part of the universe and that's why they're EPs? I don't know. I, I, well, for on a creative level, I, I doubt he had anything to do with, with certainly with, with the new Suicide yeah. Squad movie. So yeah, it, it would probably have something to do with whatever uh, contractual, you yeah. know, language existed for him that, that gave him an EP credit in the first one. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think whether, whether his five part thing ever gets completed, which I mean, we'll see anything's possible. Right. Yeah. Um, I think if you're a fan of what he started, you should feel pretty good about the fact that it's not like his vision is blinking out of existence. It's not fully. You know, I mean, Momoa is look for ask the, Anyone on the planet, what does Aquaman look like? They're going to describe Jason Momoa. And yep. that is because Zack Snyder said this is the guy. Same with Gal. Yeah. And Gal Gadot. Ben Affleck, it's so funny, right? I, I was just showing my kids the other day the clip of Ben Affleck when he was on Jimmy Fallon's show describing going on the internet right after he was announced. So this is like 2013 for Batman. Yeah. And and it's like, no, you know? And I remember experiencing that in real time from people. And I remember oh, yeah. saying... I think he's a good choice. I think he's going to surprise people. It's actually yeah. funny because as much as I love him now, at first I was like, eh, I don't know. I went, yeah. I was like, I literally like posted it. I remember posting a video about the announcement. I was at my mom's house doing laundry, uh, of course. Um, and, and when it got announced, I was like, oh, because I had my short list. And it, wh right. what's actually funny about that is Joe Mang Magnello was my top choice. I was like, oh, he sure. would be a great Batman. And then it's kind of funny how like he ended up being uh, Deathstroke, but yeah, it was like I was the like, opposite number. Anyways, that kind right? of works, right? right? And uh, <laughs> it's so it's like thinking I was like oh, Ben, I don't know. And then all of a sudden, I think it was just as it set, and I saw like people doing fan art, and I'm going, oh man, he does have that chin. He's got yeah. that dimpled chin, you know. And I'm going, oh, he's got it. Yeah, okay, I'm on board. And then I just, and then you know, I I love him. Uh, you know, he's my favorite cinematic Batman, you know, to date, obviously. But I mean. You know, of course, we got Pattinson coming out, which, of course, when that was announced, same shit. Everybody's going, really? The Twilight guy? And yep. then you have me going, um, watch other movies. <laughs> right. You know, there's, uh, you know, he's done these indie films, and you might be uh, pretty impressed that the guy actually has some chops. I'm the guy's an actor. Lost City of Z, he was really good in that. And, yeah. Uh, Tenet, he was good in. Um, yeah, and uh, Lighthouse, Jesus Christ. Yeah, Lighthouse, right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, see, this for me, it's funny, because the, the Affleck controversy, uh, immediately followed by the, the, the Pattinson controversy, I'm like, what live-action Batman actor in the modern era has not been controversial? I think other than Christian Bale, every single actor was controversial, and for the most part, they all turned out fine. I mean, arguably, George Clooney wasn't great. <laughs> You know, but, but you know, was, but I, he was more like the cinematic Adam West 66 Batman in my eyes. I was always just, like, yeah, not just that. I will, I will go to my grave saying he, he was let down by the script because I oh, think yeah. you look at him and as like Danny Ocean, you're like, he's Bruce Wayne. You know? He's totally Bruce Wayne. I don't know right? about that. But when it comes to Batman, it's a little tougher to, <laughs> to swallow. But I, I was always like, hey, Kilmer, man, that guy. Uh, first off, Kilmer's Bruce Wayne. I mean, don't I mean, when you watch Batman Forever, I'm like, Kilmer's Bruce Wayne does a lot in that yeah. movie. I mean, from being at the circus to being, you know, to, to basically yelling out, oh, I'm Batman, and nobody heard it. Even you know, <laughs> <laughs> Chase didn't hear that next, nobody guy. heard it. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. But then he like went on, he was like, all right, I'm gonna start fighting these guys in my tuxedo, right. and you know, and then just, just a lot of things that he does. I mean, it's like, I really. You know, I did a live watch, you know, a few weeks back and then, you know, just, just, you know, I just appreciate that. And I really hope we get that Schumacher cut because obviously, you know, not, it's not the full situation that we got, you know, with the Snyder cut, but at the same time, it's like Schumacher was trying to give us something kind of fresh, dark, gritty, but of yeah. course the studio was like, no, we got to sell fucking Happy Meal toys, <laughs> you know? So. It's, you know, I, uh, the, for me, you know, my Batman, uh, I think will always be Michael Keaton because I just, that was the right age, you know, but I found out retrospectively about the controversy around his casting. Oh, and yeah. then when he, when he was replaced by Val Kilmer, Mr. Oh Mom, God. what? Mr. Mr. Yeah, Mom? Beetlejuice. Yeah. What? Yeah. What the heck? Yeah. But two movies later he got, he was 
fully embraced in the role. People were upset when Val Kilmer replaced him, and then people were fine with him. People are upset uh, about Val Kilmer leaving, and well, the franchise ended anyway. But like <laughs> Affleck, Pattinson, guess what? Here's a spoiler alert from a year from now. People are going to love Robert Pattinson, and well, they'll be upset when he leaves. Well, I mean, look at the trailer. A lot, I mean, that yeah. trailer at Fandom last year, everybody went, oh, well, shit, I guess I yeah. was wrong. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, yeah, he kind of just, you know, that whole trailer just blew everybody's minds. Yeah. And I can't wait. I'm like, oh, man, I, I, I'm i already pretty. I mean, obviously, we're going to get probably a new one at this DC fandom. But the right. fact that the movie kept getting pushed, I mean, we, we were already supposed to see it by now or something or getting closer. I don't know. I, I'm, think, so. I, I think it was supposed to be this fall, right? Yeah. yeah. God, it was actually supposed to come out on my birthday, October 1st. And I was like, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I want to be doing. Jeez. I want to watch it twice. <laughs> No, but like, uh, yeah, just yeah, with with COVID and everything, of course, everything got messed up. I think even Dune was going to be out on October first, but that keeps getting pushed too. And I'm like, that's a movie because I'm rereading the book right now. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I'm just kind of going, all right, and and it's cool to do that because now because I've never read the book before, I watched the the Lynch version, of course, um, and I want to revisit that too when uh, before I see this version. But just reading the book and going, okay. This, okay, that's 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 Oscar Isaac. That's uh, Josh Brolin. That's Momoa. I'm going okay. Now I'm like seeing it in my head. Like well, as I'm reading, I'm so now I won't be one of those people, those sticklers to say the book was better you know? <laughs> because I was already visualizing the actors and everything. You know, because, because I always <laughs> I always I always say that to be. I'm like, oh, the reason why the book is better is because you were making a, your own movie in your head. Yeah, and then you know, know, somebody I, else's version. Can I tell you something? Yeah, when I watched the trailer. Yeah. Um, earlier this year or whenever it was, um, I, you know, I read the book like 20 years ago, whenever, when I was in college and watching the trailer, I was seeing the movie I saw in my mind's eye. Nice. So that shit, like Duncan Idaho looked like Jason Momoa and I didn't even realize it. You know, it's like wow, that. Look at you. So, so for me, th th I'm so excited and so terrified for this movie at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. Because I like I know my expectations are going to be sky high. The other thing I'm terrified about is it's only half the book. Yeah, and I'm like, if true. people don't show up, then that's all we get. We get like half of a kick-ass adaptation and I never, know. you that, know. I think I'm worried about that too, and I, I think we've had some discussions, especially with you know my my buddy Scott, who's you know he's also doing a reread too. But you know he's I think he's read the book a couple of times. I actually you know when it comes to pronouncing some of the names on here, you go to him because well. He knows how to pronounce. He's also a teacher too. So, but um, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of worried about that too because, you know, when the pandemic happened and everything started getting delayed, and then HBO Max comes out and goes, well, you know, Jason Kyler goes, well, here's the solution that we have, guys. How let's do the whole simultaneous like release and blah blah blah. And when that got announced, and all of a sudden it was just like there was that was a controversial thing. Um, and it almost seemed like at the time that was that was the right thing to do, essentially, mm -hmm. yeah. because it's like, well, how else is going to happen? And I know D Denai, um, I can never say his last name, Denai. V v villain with? Yeah, there you go. Him. <laughs> with, you know, he's, a, he's an excellent filmmaker, so visual. I mean, Arrival is in my top 10 favorite movies of all time because that was just, an you know, to have a movie about aliens arriving and mm -hmm. it's not, you know, blowing shit up and people getting killed. And it was like this crazy little, you know, psychological, philosophical fucking thing that just, I mean, that movie is just, <laughs> and it was so beautifully shot. So everything was beautiful about that movie. That movie should have won uh, more awards than it did. I think it won some maybe, I don't know, but um, I know he's going to knock it out of the park because it's yeah. like, who, who are you going to get to, <laughs> to make a movie look pretty that takes place on a desert planet? <laughs> Right, <laughs> you're gonna get you're gonna get him because look what he did with Blade Runner 2049. I mean, yep. those some of those shots were like, especially when they go to Vegas. I mean, Jesus, it's like, how did you accomplish that without? I mean, I'm sure, yeah, there's some maybe tweaking in post a little bit, but not really, probably. Yeah. I'm like, like, so I think he was like the perfect choice, but like you said, people don't show up because they sent you know, they didn't show up to Blade Runner 2049, right. which was like disappointing because I really enjoyed that movie i really like it a lot and so i'm kind of worried too because like you said it, it is half the book because that book is you know it's pretty it's dense it's yeah. 
It's a, it's you know a couple of years, I, I want to say 2018. I I met Timothy Chalamet um, at a press event. Oh wow! And, and this was before Dune had started. And I asked him. I was like, "So is it going to be uh, the whole book or half the book?" And he goes, "I can't tell you that." Uh, and I go, "Okay, so half the book." Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah. When they say like, "Nope, I can't say anything," it's like uh, you kind of yeah, you just answered it. Yeah, you just realized you answered it, but I'm sorry. You answered it. Yeah, I know, man. I'm, I, and it sucks too because it almost seems like that story should have been maybe in a streaming series of like eight yeah. episodes. Or, I mean, that's that's the thing about uh, the you know we're currently in like the streaming wars with everything. It's like, and then when when COVID and and this whole solution of what do you do, what do you do, what do you do? It's like, yeah, I understand. I want to go to the movies too. I go to the movies once a week. I try to do that at least because it's just a way to get out of the house first off. And, you know, I love just going to the movies. I literally turn my phone on airplane mode. I'm like, leave me alone. I'm in my sanctuary, people. Just turn (laughs) it off. I want to just watch the movie and take it in, whether, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, I'm all about it. But at the same time, I'm going, oh, there's people that are just not going to be, you know, you know, that they, 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 they're not going to want to go out. I mean, we, we're all locked down for a year, you know? Right. I mean, what that did, you know, I mean, even though like people are more and more people are getting vaccinated and stuff like that and, you know, things are getting lifted, but then it's, then you got variants and stuff like that. It's like, is Loki doing something? What's going on? We hear this Delta <laughs> thing. Is that Loki? Oh, shit. <laughs> no, but it's like, yeah. So I understand, but I, that's why I totally was going, okay. What Kyle R was trying to do. It's like, yeah. Give somebody the option to just be like, hey, we got this service, put it on there. Um, but at the same time, I'm going, yeah, but some of these movies like Dune, I'm going, maybe that should have been drawn out more in uh, because, you know, even watching these Disney shows. And I even thought about that. I think I even said it in my review. Maybe it was my spoiler review. It was like when it comes to WandaVision, Falcon, Winter Soldier and Loki, I'm going, see these like it, it all worked because it had a lot of time to breathe. Hmm. And, you know, we got this Black Widow story that could be very intriguing and compelling to go to dive into her backstory. But it's like, oh, we don't have time. We don't have time right. to do that. We, she's yeah. got to like, you know, she's got to do this, 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 and this. We got to fit it in two hours and 15 minutes. And I'm going, you know, man, imagine if there was a Black Widow series where you could have like eight episodes and you can have dedicate some episodes to that backstory of her becoming a widow and being mind mm-hmm. controlled and shit like that. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's, there's just going to be, I think when it comes to CB, you know, when it comes to like this comic book world, I mean, even Zack Snyder's justice league, I mean, that's, that's played out like a series. I mean, you could right. literally watch it yeah. like a series. It's seven parts, you know? And yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just kind of going, man, I'm just wondering like how, that's probably like the next step with it. You know, you had your daredevils and, you know, the, the daredevil and Jessica Jones and, you know, all those guys on there and those worked well as series. So I don't know. Well, and well, know? with, with Dune, I mean, they do have an HBO max series coming, right? It's like a spinoff. That's right. I um, totally forgot about that. Hmm. Uh, I forget what it's called. It's about the sister. I think it might be called the sister head actually now that I think oh, about yeah, it. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. It's, it's a challenge because Dune, you know, be, between this version and the Lynch version, there was a mini series version that aired on sci-fi. I think yeah, in, the I remember that. in 2000. And, yeah. and that was one of those things where it's like, well, you got this, you got the breathing room, problem is you don't i mean it looks like a dinner theater you know what i mean (laughs) and it's a shame because the cast is decent they had i know it was like a it was a pretty like you know well-known cast like there's some names in there right yeah yeah william William hurt plays plays leto atreides and in the second they did the sequel miniseries called children of dune that has uh, james mcavoy and it's like the first thing he ever did or one of the first things he did that's right he was a young one yeah he's yeah and so so it's it's this weird thing because I look at Lynch and I'm like, well, that has the look and the money, but it doesn't have runtime. And then these ones have the runtime and some of the story points, but not the look. If you could merge these together, you get something reasonably good. So hey, you know, uh, I've I'm I'm hopeful but not optimistic when it yeah. comes to how Dune is going to play. Unfortunately, you know. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> I really I wanted it to do so well, so badly, but. I guess we'll see what happens. But uh, um, I wanted to ask you about, of course, you know, talking about Zack Snyder's Justice League. I mean, I, I think I've seen your tweets. You enjoyed it. 
Huh? I did know? very much so. Yeah. Very much so. My God, so good, huh? I I went, I've been on a journey with Zack Snyder's DC because mm-hmm. I loved Man of Steel. I still do. I was very negative about BVS. Yeah. I I liked the theatrical cut of Justice League, and then watching the, the, in the lead up to the Snyder cut, I went back and I watched everything. So yeah. Man of Steel, BVS, JL, theatrical cut, and the Snyder cut. And number one, I'm like, well, the, the theatrical cut of Justice League is like the the painting of the Jesus monkey. I don't know if you've seen that, where no. the, the woman took like, it was like a painting of Jesus uh-huh. that was like worn down. So she's like, let me fix this. Oh, yeah. And yeah. she <laughs> made it look like a monkey. Well, that's Justice League theatrical cut. <laughs> yes, yes. It's good comparison um, like that. And and watch so I'm just like okay well I'm never gonna watch that again, yeah. um, but watching all three including the extended cut of BVS which I hadn't seen since since 2016, um, I'm like this whether it continues or not I'm like you've got this amazing mini series and I include Man of Steel uh, like all three films I think of as like this one big mini series and I'm like. I I I'm down to see it continue, but I'm like I even if it doesn't, we got something really impressive here. You got nine and a half hours of like some pretty good shit, like with yeah. that involves these characters, you know. And I mean, it, you know, it's funny that you say that too because when uh, when it came out, when Snyder Cut came out, and you know the buzz was just so high. What yeah. was also great about it too was people were going back and watching BVS and Man of Steel and going, oh, I get it now. Mm-hmm. This is yeah. what it was leading up to. It's like, yeah, that's what us fans were trying to tell you. It's like, yeah, yeah this, okay, this, you know, when 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 people were like, oh, Man of Steel, he's, you know, he's too sad and he, look at all the damage and stuff like that. It's like, oh, yeah, he was, that was the beginning. And then he died and then there's like a rebirth and then he's the Superman. Look at, look at how he, kicked steppenwolf's ass yeah. in in jl it's like oh yeah that and everybody's even like the you know tough critics who were like you know all about the you know christopher reeve superman and everything they were coming back and you know going oh 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 now i get what he was trying to do the same with batman it's like you know and batman how much of a dick he was and you know the in bbs and then all of a sudden in this one it's like almost like a complete flip but then you realize why because he's like he's got this guilt and he realized he just fell off he just was going down a path and then all of a sudden it's like all right time to course correct and now you know all of a sudden he's saying faith to alfred and alfred's the one going what are you doing <laughs> you know yeah. wait wait you're, you're you're just going too much like what and then Bruce is like, well, what are you talking about, man? It's faith, man. He's going to be here and stuff like that. It's just like, you love to see it. I, I agree. I, you know, I think um, for me, it seems unlikely we're going to get another Justice League movie uh, from anybody in the near future. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, let's assume for the time being, this is it. I'm like, this is an achievement. Really and is. and and everybody who clamored for it should feel really good about it because you're you know to your point faith hey your faith was rewarded i mean this is a thing like Jeez. it it's hard to encapsulate what a absolute bank shot this thing was the the likelihood of it happening of all the pieces lining up that and that it sees release not just in um you know, it, uh, in its intended form, but even more than its intended form, because you would not have gotten a four hour plus version in the theaters. So nope. this, I mean, this, it's, it's one of the, I keep, you know, I, I went through this wanting for years and years, the, the Richard Donner edit of Superman two, which by the time when it finally happened, I was like, yeah, <laughs> because, <laughs> because it's, I mean, it's, it's a flawed, film by virtue of the fact that i mean they they weren't able to shoot everything they wanted right so you sort of squint past it and what i say about the donner edit is i'm like it's a in, it's an interesting dvd bonus feature but it's not a complete film you need to stitch it together with essential parts of the theatrical cut in order to get a complete film so for me that's you know that's what the snyder cut of justice League could have ended up as as this curiosity but it happened not merely because he said, hey, 
either we put it out my way or we just don't do it, which I think good on him for doing that. But the yeah. other thing is that all the, you know, the pandemic happened, not to say that that's a good thing, but it sort of created this scenario where that they needed content to put out and this was like ready to go. And then this happened and HBO Max happened, which wasn't even an option four years ago. You know, so all this stuff and we get this thing and guess what? It exists now forever. It's there. And it have and and if it, if we go one frame past the end of Justice League, it doesn't matter because this thing is here, and it's fantastic. It is fantastic, and and yeah, like I said, when we got these three, like I mean, like it's again, if you combine all those run times, it's almost like it's like nine and a half hours of just like, look at this, look at this, you know, this new type of this Superman that's, you know, that's actually getting challenged with not just, uh, you know, Lex Luthor trying to sell real estate, you know, it's not, it's, yeah. it's a different, it's, it's just a whole different, you know, and of course we all want the Snyderverse to continue, but at the same time, it's like what I keep telling people too, it's like, okay, don't lose faith. You never know what could happen because, you know, for a while there, we didn't think the Snyder cut was going to come out. Okay. You just never know what's going to happen. But at the same time, it's like, you know, just the way that, Warner Brothers, Warner Media. I mean, I mean, I mean, there was that. I mean, going back to that Ann Sarnoff article that came out like the Monday after it came out, and she's just like, "That was it. We're done." And then mm-hmm. she's like, "No, no air cut." It was like, "Whoa!" It was just kind of like, "Man, they had that prepped and ready to go." It was very interesting. But then, of course, you got the Discovery merger happening, and uh, you know, and all this stuff. But at the same time, I keep telling them, "It's like, well." Zach's not going to wait. I mean, he's got the army franchise franchise that he just started. That's like booming. And now he's got this new, you know, rebel moon star Wars, like franchise. And it's like, he's got he's busy. <laughs> he's, he's busy. Well, And and you know what I said right now, uh, or, or rather what coming out next year, 30 years after he last played Batman, Michael Keaton is playing Batman again. Isn't that crazy? Never crazy say never think about that. Never say never. Never say never. I mean, like, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and and even like talking about that too. I mean, yeah, there was like you know when it came to when it came to the Flash, it, it was in pre production hell. It seemed like it was just right. like it just went through how many directors and you know, and I was so excited because he's you know he's you know second to Batman. I love the Flash. You know, <laughs> it's just um, and you know the TV show was cool for a bit, and then <laughs> kind of you know all right, uh, <laughs> you know. So I didn't, I didn't know if I like, you know, I just didn't keep up with it because after, I think it was after like season three, I was like, eh, I'm just, it's not for me. It's not for me. Definitely isn't for me. And, um, so I was always very excited. Like, okay, well, first off, I wanted to see what Zach wanted to do with the character and what he did with the character was phenomenal. I mean, that, that, and that scene where he just, you know, where he's turning back time and doing all, I mean, that's just, that's, it just gives me goosebumps even just talking about it. So, yeah. So, but then when it came to the flash and I know there's controversy behind that with Ray Fisher and everything like that, but it's kind of hard because I'm going, okay, yeah, the studio sucks. Yeah. There's some ego, some pettiness. We hate it. I get it. And then what they did with Ray Fisher, but at the same time, I want to see what the Muschietti's are doing. Right. You know, they are essentially taking the flashpoint story, but they're reconfiguring it to like this multiverse kind of thing. And they're bringing back Michael Keaton. What the, yeah. I mean, when, when that was announced, it was just kind of going, Oh, oh right. Okay. You know, and, and you know, I'm like you, I mean, that's, that was my first cinematic Batman. I mean, he's standing <laughs> right there. I mean, I, you know, I love the, I love, I love Michael Keaton's Batman. I mean, I watched Batman 89 religiously, like when I was a kid. You know, Batman Returns, I was always like, eh, I don't know why. Batman Returns <laughs> was always for like, eh, for me, because I think it felt too Tim Burton-y. Yep. I always had this theory that, you know, when it came to the first Batman, it was like, all right, Tim, we want to make something. And he was like, all right, let's make it dark. I know, like, you know, referencing some comic books, you got the architecture and, you know, he there's some Burtonisms in there, but then when it came to the, when, when that was a success, Warner Brothers was like, have at it, Tim. Yeah. And he did. <laughs> the second one was full on Tim Burton. I mean, with the snow and it, everything was like, yeah, it just felt very Tim Burton with the next one. It's I, I think I, I agree with, I, I, I'll always have a soft spot for returns, but that's fully acknowledging that it's a Tim Burton, you know, uh, Tim, Tim Burton, uh, nighttime squiggly line movie featuring occasional appearances by Batman. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah, that was always funny. He always said he liked the villains better. That's why. And that's pretty clear, right? Yeah, it definitely <laughs> but, is. But I, I think for me, when you look, when you take a step back and you look at the majority of these DC movies, I think that's a great strength that they have. And I think this is something that Marvel by virtue of existing within a universe doesn't much more of a corporatized structure, I think uh, does not have the advantage of, which is like you have, that's Tim Burton's Batman movie. That's what yeah. that's going to look like. That is Zack Snyder's Superman movie. That is that what that's going to look like that, you know, um, uh, yeah. David Ayer did his DC movie. That's, you know, and notwithstanding, you know, the hope for a or cut. Um, yeah. I think, I think that's, that's the, the strength that DC has. And I hope the company realizes it. It's like, man, these are characters that, that benefit from just being constantly reinvented. Let people go wild, let people do their thing. And yeah. then, and then, you know, do a different thing that's not connected to it at all because you can just put this version on the shelf. You know, I, you, we can put Zack Snyder's trilogy next to Christopher Nolan's trilogy and you got these two, you're not going to confuse them with each other. No, but that's, not at all. but that's great. You got these great, completely different interpretations. And then, and then same thing with, 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 and let's all go all the way back to Bill Dozier and Adam West, you know, that's that version and that's unique and special. That's, you know, you, you, you don't have that kind of variety with Marvel. You can't. No, it's all yeah. You're absolutely yeah. correct. I mean, you're Marvel. I mean, it'll eventually get there, and that's why I, I'm kind of curious. Like, because the first step into like something like that is going to be when they cast Wolverine for the MCU. Mm. Oh, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm oh. the internet's going to explode. Whoever, whoever that poor bastard is. Oh, that poor good. bastard. Like, he's going to get <laughs> shit on, man. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. But well, uh, and and by the way. Yeah. By the way, I remember when Hugh Jackman was announced, and there was plenty of this pretty boy. He's too <laughs> tall. He's Australian. He's too what tall, yeah. I remember it all. I remember yeah, it all. A lot of people are like, "Yeah." I, I kind of wonder: Will they ever? Will they actually do a, uh, you know, a height accurate? Wolverine ever or is they it almost just, need to right like that? Yeah, like get somebody you, short. Eh. You need to do, in my opinion, somebody as close to the comics and thus by extension as different physically from Hugh Jackman as possible what? just to kind of just to shake up the etch a sketch otherwise you're just inviting these comparisons that i mean i mean that man embodied this role for 17 years yeah in a, a, a to and perfection he got sent off sent off in such a beautiful yeah. way yeah that's what you know the people are like oh we want him to come back it's like dude no, he, he he left it on the field, man. He he no. he he got his finale. What are you doing? You know, just exactly. let, let him enjoy pizza and hamburgers. I think I said that <laughs> exactly. on Twitter. Yeah, no. yeah, he didn't need to cut weight <laughs> for those shirtless scenes anymore. <laughs> Dehydrating himself. All right, we got my buddy Scott joining in. Mr. Scott McClellan, what is up, sir? There he is. I am so is. excited because I have been talking i'm gonna use air quotes here with zacky for years so it's like yeah. when i when i saw that he was gonna be the gut vodka stream guest i was like oh, i get to meet a person <laughs> hey man how's it going it's going okay i unfortunately missed most of the first part of the interview because heather and i were watching we were having a a, a streaming movie night so uh, we we're, just we're finished uh fear street 1978 oh i still haven't watched the fear street movies yet are they good I'm enjoying them. Good. 78 is even better than 94. And I'm really looking forward to 1666 next Friday. I gotta Friday. catch up on those. I gotta catch up on those because you know me, I'm an I was an R.L. Stein fan when I was a kid. So I didn't get into Fear Street as much as, of course, Goosebumps. Goosebumps was my jam. Like, I mean, come on. Um, and I actually really did you guys enjoy um the first Goosebumps movie that came out with Jack Black? I have not seen it. I have. <laughs> I I will. I have to preface this by saying the first and only time I saw that movie was in a movie theater full of screaming middle schoolers oh, because no. <laughs> it was a field trip. There was no way in H E double hockey sticks I was ever going to be able to enjoy that movie surrounded by twelve hundred eleven to thirteen year olds. That just wasn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. I mean, you know what's funny though? I'm not gonna lie. I actually enjoyed that first movie. Like it, it had, you know, it was Jack Black, which I like, 
and it had a nice, you know, it had many little callbacks, little Easter eggs. That's the part. Yeah, it, it was the yeah. e it was the Easter eggs of. I read that book. I yes. saw that episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. saw that episode of the Fox Kids show. You exactly. Know? Was, Night of the Living Dummy. Yeah, I mean, it, that was like the main antagonist was the dummy and stuff. Like, you know, it was just stuff. It was like it was when I watched it. I, I I did. I watched it with low expectations, and then when I saw it, I was like, okay. That was that would actually that was satisfying. That was actually satisfying. But it, did they make they made a sequel? Too. They did make a sequel. I, I never bought. It. But I didn't. Jack, I don't think Jack Black was in the sequel, right? He no, wasn't No, okay. he that's wasn't. why I kind of went. I don't want to. I'm not even gonna. No, no. You had yeah. me with the first one, but mm, I'm like, I don't know if I can uh, deal with that. But I do remember the um, the afternoon series of Goosebumps, um, which was kind of like, you know, it was funny because. You know, there was Nickelodeon had Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> yes, that's right. Did. I remember that. I remember yeah, that. That was, that was yeah. my jam, too. You know, Saturday nights, you know, the Midnight Society, all that stuff. But it was funny, too, because I remember, like, they, like um, I thought, Are You Afraid of the Dark? They had an episode that literally had was, like, almost the same as, like, a Goosebumps book, which was about a camera that predicted your death in the future or something. I like remember that. that. Yeah. Yes. There was an episode of you. Are, are you afraid of the dark that had that? And then I'm like, well, that was the fourth goosebumps book called say cheese and die. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that was like, when kids book kids books said, say cheese and die. What the hell? <laughs> dark. Man, the things, the things we got away with, you know, growing up in the eighties oh, and the nineties. I mean, even seriously, the cover, even the cover of that book had like a family at a barbecue and there were skeletons. Yes, I remember that cover yeah. so well, dude. I was like, damn, this is. I mean, this shit was dark. Arl Stein, I mean, he pushed it a little bit when it came to those goosebumps, but those covers were pretty damn freaky, man. They were welcome to Dead House. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> what was the first book? Welcome to Dead House. What the hell? Crazy. Snick, man. I remember it was it was uh, Ren and Stimpy and Are You Afraid of the ah. Dark? That was like my nineteen early nineties uh, experience. <laughs> man, and I missed out on all of that because I didn't have cable. The only time I got to watch any of that was when I went down to my grandparents because oh. they had <laughs> they had cable, and then I usually end up catching like Nick and Knight. So I was getting like Alfred Hitchcock presents. Um, Dick Van Dyke show, the George Reeves Adventures of Superman. You know, that's what the I was. The classics, catching. the good I, stuff. I mean, you know, Mr. Ed, you know, that's that's why I have such an appreciation <laughs> for yeah. like black and white and stuff is because like that's what I grew up on, man. I've I got people complain about black and white. I'm like, suck it. I love black <laughs> and white. <laughs> my three sons, come on. I, mean, I don't know why my three sons just like came to my brain right now. I have actually never <laughs> seen that. What can I say? You never seen that? <laughs> no. I have before. to admit though, I was I was just before I came on, I was listening to Zach you talk about the Hugh Jackman thing. And I was just like, dude, I still remember like I can a vision standing around the pool table at my old house going, They recast Doug Ray Scott. Who the hell is this Hugh Jackman person? Mm -hmm. And then the weirdest thing being seeing him on the Today Show the Monday after opening weekend. I saw it Sunday night and then to see him talking to like Matt Lauer or Katie Couric and he starts singing, Oh, what a beautiful morning from Oklahoma. <laughs> and I was just like, this guy, this guy, <laughs> <laughs> this guy's Wolverine. I know it is. It, it was when people found out that, Oh yeah, he's like, he likes to do, you know, musicals, musicals. Uh, and I, I mean, I remember when people were like, like going, wait, wait a minute, this is our Wolverine. It's like, yeah, that's called range called range that is, <laughs> that's what that is called you know and he's about to be on broad once they open a broadway he's going to be in the music man playing harold hill so you know what uh needless to say i'll be picking up that cast album i want to hear him singing 76 trombones come on <laughs> yeah, absolutely but uh yeah but like like we were talking about it's like what do you do when you cast the next one do you do that you just brace for impact <laughs> <laughs> You got to get, so, I mean, it's just, I, yeah, like, you know, what we were saying, it was like, you got to get somebody who looks, you know, not five foot four, <laughs> five foot four, maybe has some hair on his shoulders and forearms, like more than Jackman had. I don't know. It's, it's going to be, I mean, I know there was a lot of fan casts out there. Like your, uh, who was a uh, uh, Tadger Edgerton? T T what's his name? Edgerton. Mr. Um, Joel Edgerton. Yeah, no, 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 not him. Uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, the Kingsman guy. Uh, yeah, 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 Kingsman, and uh, you know, who played Elton John. That's right. Tadger. Oh, I can't Aaron, remember. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. I was saying Tadger. Yeah. 
What the hell? That's amazing. I was too busy enjoying him because he was in that he you know he played John Constantine in the Audible Sandman yeah, uh, series. Right, huh? Yeah. So see, I mean he's he actually was a pretty was, decent Constantine. Yeah, he was uh <laughs> I mean like he'd be a good choice, but at the same time, I think he's still, you know, I think he's like five nine, five ten. He's not he's not Wolverine short, but at the same time, I'm like I, I mean I'm just kind of wondering will they go that that level of Wolverine, but at the same time, I'm going, well, just imagine him going berserk, like a, sh you know, a shorter, you know, character going berserk. -y. I mean, you could really have some fun with that, but you know, there's always like this whole thing about in Hollywood about heights, especially with male heights. I mean, let's face it, you know, there's some people, I mean, going back to Vin Diesel, you know, he's not eye to eye to Dwayne, the rock Johnson, even though whatever <laughs> that shot shows, he's, he's definitely uh, standing up on something. You know, so there's always like that thing. I think even James Gunn, didn't he recently talk about like how actors and their heights or something like that? Did he tweet out recently? Like they shouldn't well, lie about them or something? He got into, he got into a, a few beefs, uh, as I recall, by, by posting that on Twitter. Yeah. Oh, I'm shocked. You, you mean, you mean Twitter? You, you, we got, we got no beef. We got no beef. We, we got no beef got no on beef. Twitter. I mean, seriously, nah. that never happens. Zachy. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I saw some of your, I, I saw you having a field day the other day with what the, did a full moon rise? Like I'm trying to understand what happened that day. And oh, what I, was it? I don't know. Like everyone just suddenly like, People came out of the woodwork for you, and you were having some fun that day. And, and I applaud you for the way you handled it. So very That's, good. It was it was the Boba Fett uh, tweet, as I recall. It was the Boba. You said Boba Fett, and I, because uh, was it them renaming the, the ship? Oh, the ship. It, it was, and I. The point I've been making is they're not even renaming the ship. They're just not putting the name on the box of the the toys. So instead of saying Slave One, it'll say Boba Fett's ship. And I'm like, all right, whatever. That's like, a, I, in my opinion, that's the normal adult human reaction. Well, so at, the, <laughs> at the same time, it's like, okay, if they're just going to change the, the, the name on the box, you almost go, okay. Yeah. I, because it's like, yeah, it is Boba Fett's ship. Okay. Like, like the, if they're not wrong. That, so that is, is not Boba an incorrect Fett's description. Ship, so like, I could agree with that. I'm like, okay, it is Boba Fett's ship. Sure. Like, yeah, I mean, it, they're not changing the name to to uh, contracted employee with health benefits dash one. <laughs> no, it's just it's still called slave one. You can call it that as much as you want. You can shout it into the wind okay. uh, with your shirt off, screaming at the moon, whatever you do. Uh, and I'm just like, all right, whatever. And so I was amused by how people on on Twitter, which admittedly is not nor the real life. <laughs> well, like, I think I think posting posting uh, pictures holding the ship and they're like for me it will be slave one forever and they're like hugging it and I'm like that's an insane reaction to this utterly who cares kind of a story. I think, and so I, I, think I think what it is like nowadays is like when when things like you know obviously there's like the whole the whole woke thing and I and, you know and I and I get like sure would, would people like say that but I think. What, what what's also happening is there's like this counter reaction that goes that tries to go above and beyond, you know what the initial reaction is, and sometimes it gets a little too like you said, like holding like the the ship like that. It's like okay, but at the same time, it's like you okay, what you said. It's like it's not that they're. I mean, who knows if they mention it in the Boba Fett series? Who knows uh, if they mention as you know the slave one? But at the same time, it's like okay, if they're just renaming the box, I almost go. You know, I, I, maybe that's just my brain thinking of it as a, a Google uh, SEO thing. It's like, well, that actually would make sense. People would actually find it more of like, oh, that's Boba Fett's ship. How about right. that? Right. You know, as opposed to if it just said one thing. So, you know, I see, I mean, I see what you're I, saying right there. Ultimately, this is about Disney wanting to keep selling a toy. Mm -hmm. And they're looking now, now, in my opinion... I think it's an overreaction because I don't think most people are thinking like, oh, that name is offensive because, well, Boba Fett's like a bad guy anyway. And it's like, I, you know, yeah. I, I think it's overthinking. But I'm also like, you know what, whatever. It's just it's a company. This is what they do. They're trying to get out ahead of th something that before it becomes a problem. Yeah, and they want to they want to keep selling the thing. So this is not like, for example, we're not selling the the what's her face, the Gina Carano 
action figure anymore, but, <laughs> right? This is them being like, well, we want to keep selling the thing. How do yeah. we keep selling the thing? You know, and this is yeah. them doing that. So it's like, whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's like, and, and at the same time, it's like, well, you know, I mean, when it comes to Boba Fett, if, they, if he names it that, it's it's not like, I mean, I'm pretty sure he had various uh, species that were uh, slaves on that Slave One ship. So it's like, hey, let's relax, guys. But uh, we got Stephen Colbert joining. What's up, sir? Hey, hey there he is. How's it going? Your, hey, your volume, your, your mic's that? low. Yeah. <laughs> your your it, your frame looks beautiful, of course. Though. Oh, awesome. There um, you go. Now you sound I, good. Okay, cool. I always I I when I unplug. Never mind. You guys don't need to know about that. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Steven stopping himself. I, I need a timestamp. Yeah, I, did you see I, that? I, he was like, "You don't need to know." <laughs> I mean, I could. Uh, if anyone wants to know, I can tell you why it's always down when I join. Throw a knife at Steven. <laughs> but i don't i don't think anyone wants to know um the um the the jumping right into the end of the discussion though i i i haven't commented much on this because it's not it's one of those things where it's not even really clear like zaki said like what they're doing like is this just on the merchandising box is this just and like in the past i've had enough instances of like I don't know. I'd like to think I didn't freak out, but where I've said things and then like, it turns out it was like, Oh no, they just took it off the box for the children's toys. Um, that then it was like, Oh, okay. So now I've got this tweet out there being like, how dare you? And it doesn't even mean <laughs> anything. Um, but I think that to me, the kind of more interesting thing, a part it, a uh, thing about it. And it was another thing that Zaki pointed out is that the it's, it's almost like, I don't think anybody was really making that connection because Boba Fett's kind of a villain and and the name isn't um, it's not like a it's not it's not a like I don't know without getting too far into it. I don't think slave is a word that like inherently has its roots in racism. Obviously, it's very closely connected to it, but it's just kind of a, a, a bad thing um that that came to be associated with that later on well, well i think and, like sometimes it, it's just like sometimes there's like overcompensation i remember they're like in the real estate like you know when they were selling a house they're not going to name like the master bedroom master anymore it's like okay you're overdoing one, it a little bit there but by know, the by, by this by this logic you can say that that makes sense though because the reason it's called the master bedroom is be it has its roots in a uh -huh. in a slave culture Right. Whereas the word slave is just a, you know, you have a hard drive on your computer can be slave to the primary drive. That's that it doesn't mean in your car. There's like a slave cylinder, isn't there? Or something like that. Yeah. Or, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and and kind of the more interesting thing to me, it reminds me of like in like the business world, you have guys often who will um, will like objectify women or who will criticize women for for being like uh, they'll slut shame them or whatever, like for their LinkedIn photos. And they'll be like, well, if you don't want that kind of attention, then why would you put that photo up there? And it's just like an attractive photo. It's not like a like a like a pinup photo or something. It's like, yeah, oh, you just can't tell the difference thing. between like between someone like looking attractive and someone sexualizing themselves. And so for for Lucasfilm or Disney or whoever to be like, oh, we're going to change that name because it's offensive. It's kind of like, well, I think you're the one that's making that connection. Not anybody like you made it weird by mm -hmm by making it weird that nobody was really weird about it until you were like, well, that's an offensive name. And now it's like, well, no, but, but now that <laughs> yeah. you said it, now we're in this weird spot where it's like, you're making people defend it, which isn't really, nobody wants to defend that, yeah. but also like, why does anybody need to attack it either? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, and, and, honestly, let's be, let, and let's be clear here. We're Star Wars. If, if you're a Star Wars fan, you've got to be used to things changing all the time. I swear I have a Star Wars encyclopedia that I read in the 90s <laughs> that got completely <laughs> wiped out by the prequel trilogy because there are things that when I was watching the prequel trilogy, I was like, but that's not. No, oh, there it is. No, no, mine, mine is actually mine's like like oh. short and squatty, and it's got like uh, like the tie the, the tie bomber on Even the cover. Better. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I remember no, that. Yeah, here's yeah. my uh, this is my fire spray slash like slave one combined with a B wing. <laughs> <laughs> this is my Millennium Falcon combined with the Outrider. Nice, wow. nice. Um, I don't know what this is. Anyway, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's all like 
we've been in this stuff for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, in the entire EU being, you know, chunked out because, you know, for 20 something years, that was quote continuity and now it's not. And they'll borrow from it when they want to. And, you know, it's like, I don't know. I'm a Star Wars fan. I'm just, I'm kind of, I like, I got the scars, man. I'm, I, 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 I get it. <laughs> You well, know what's funny is it is, also it, it, it sets ahead. weird. Sorry, it, it opens up like a weird precedent and kind of sets a threshold now where like, can Lando's ship still be the Lady Luck? Like, <laughs> is that is that misogynistic? Um, it, like, like where do you? <laughs> like, Steven, where do you... Steve, don't just don't give me one idea, Stephen. Yeah, I don't yeah. know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exact Somebody's listening, listening out there. No, no, Somebody's no, listening Steve. somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what were we gonna say, Zachy? Oh no, I, I mean. uh one of my favorite runs of Star Wars stories going all the way back to when it came out is the Marvel Comics, the original series, 102 issues, whatever it was, um, which was non-canonical like right then, you know, mm -hmm. but I still even now I reread those comics and I enjoy them and I don't care that nothing in it really fits with anything anymore. Because I enjoy it reading it, and I'm like, I wish more fans would just have that approach. Like th the, you know, the heir to the empire, the the Zon trilogy. Guess what? It's still good, whether it's canonical. Oh, it's or still not. amazing, and I don't right? care where it. Right? Because once again, it's still there. I yeah. can go back and read all those. I have all those books. Yeah. I go back and read all those books. I got the Dark Horse. Exactly. I got the Dark Horse comics. You know, that's. I mean, that's why when Patty Jenkins announced that she was doing a Rogue Squadron movie. I'm sorry, I got excited because, dude, those Michael Stackpole books and mm -hmm. the comics, I mean, those were some of my favorite Star Wars things. Huh. So you're telling me I'm going to get a, I'm finally going to get a Rogue Squadron movie? I don't need it to stick to those plots. I just need it to be, you know, badass, you know, <laughs> dogfighting in space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, that's right. And then, uh, you know, and, and then kind of leading into, I mean, we, when we're going to come to Star Wars, now we got, we're going to get a Zack Snyder type Star Wars. We're going to get Zack Snyder's Star Wars. Yeah. Zaki, Which, what do you think about that when you, that was uh, announced? I, you know what? Anything he wants to do, I will be interested in checking it out. I yeah. think it's, I'm, I'm still trying to get through um, Army of the Dead, not because I don't like it. I do, but I have five children in my house. Oh, so, yeah, <laughs> so the ability, yeah. So I'm basically like, well, I want to watch this on my big 4k TV and not on my little tablet. So I'm literally watching it in like five minute chunks. I'm basically quibbying um, <laughs> Arm army of the dead, but I like what I've seen so far. And I'm, I, you know, and I love Donna dead. And so for me, you know, when there was all the talk about like, oh, maybe Zack Snyder will do a Star Wars movie. I was like, why? And not in the sense of like, wh why Why would we want that? More like, why would he want that? Because he's like, he's been through the, the corporate just, you know, dragged through. He was like Andy Dufresne, you know, crawling through a just a river of shit in the <laughs> corporate. <laughs> and then he's just going to go next door and like, yeah, because it's going to be easier at Disney. It's going to be the same thing. So. This right. is his universe. Netflix is clearly like, hey, man, you do you. I want to see it. I, th I think it, like this is like the best case scenario for him and his fans. I don't see how anybody can complain about it. I completely agree. And especially when, you know, I I'm someone who has been privy to what that Star Wars pitch was. And so as much of that that can serve, like I'm going to be watching Rebel Moon wondering how much of that actually like survives into this new iteration. And then that also becomes, you know, it's, it's like watching five versions of Blade Runner or mm. you, <laughs> or, or you read the making of, of a movie and you hear about the evolution of a script and it, and I don't know. It's like, I like seeing all the sausages made. So it's going to be <laughs> fun to be able to follow it and go, Oh, that's, they kept that. They kept that. They changed that. I wonder why. And you know, it, it's, it's like literature. It's like you, you dig through it. It's like why you buy like multiple drafts. Like I've got Jack Kerouac's on the road, both the original and the one that came out where it was like the, it was called the original scroll. It was like when he was like high and like just, typing the, the <laughs> typing the thing it's like i like comparing that kind of thing so i mean rebel moon's gonna have all kinds of levels plus i appreciate the fact that in the news article it was like no this was a star wars pitch it's based on kurosawa 
You know, it's obviously like Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven-esque plot. And I kind of appreciate that when the Hollywood Reporter published the article, it's just out there. So, like, yeah. people aren't going to be able to complain about that when they see the movie because, well, like, well, don't get well, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but what, what, but what? at least it's <laughs> out there in the forefront going, no, this is the inception of the idea. Hmm. Suck it. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> deal with it. Well, and I like it because. And and like I just just joked about a second ago, it's it's a little bit unfortunate because with with Snyder and Star Wars both, you kind of know some of the things that we're gonna ha have to deal with ahead of time. Yeah, that are and, and some of it's already being said. Like there was um, an unspecified publication. the the <laughs> The way they they covered it was they wouldn't let Zack Snyder make a stupid Star Wars movie, and so he'll make his own stupid Star Wars movie or something like that, which yeah. is just like such a like, can we leave that style headline in like the 2010s? Like, but didn't, why? You, did, didn't right. you post like something where it's like, where yeah, so I photoshopped it or I edited yeah. the or I edited yeah. the, the um, the, yeah. the site code so it said, um, um, they won't let George Lucas make his stupid Flash Gordon movie, so he'll just make his own stupid Flash Gordon movie because that's literally what, <laughs> yeah, like that's, that's what, exactly Star Wars what it would be. Is. And so, the fact that it's unfortunately, and I think that like long term, it might not be an issue, but at least in the initial reactions, I think there's going to be an unfortunate focus on what is and is not lifted or taken from Star Wars when like literally that is Star Wars. It's it's Kurosawa. It's Arthurian myth. It's it's um, Joseph, I mean, Joseph Campbell, yeah. like 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 he used it as like a roadmap to, mm -hmm. to lift that stuff. Um, I flat, you know, Fl Flash Gordon is like a, is like a massive. I mean, he. He, like all of these things were massive inspirations for him. And some of them were directly lifted. And the whole point of it is that it was all the stuff that he loves. And conveniently now Zack Snyder also loves a lot of those things and he loves star Wars. And so he's going to take them all. He's going to mix them together and he's going to make something new that star Wars wouldn't let him make, which is kind of like the, the very essence of ingenuity and iteration and like advancement of like the way we tell stories like on its own. And and I think that's really, really, really cool. But at the same time, there's going to be way too many like, oh, this character is just a rip off of that character. And this plot point is just a rip off of that plot point. And that's, that's coming. But like, yeah, I you know, I, I I think what we're in this age where everything is a franchise, everything is a brand, everything is an IP. And it's there's something very suffocating about it. And I, I sound hypocritical because I'm a Star Wars fan. I'll watch anything that has the, the name on it, but I'm also like, I want other stuff. And the problem is, I mean, think about it. Uh, 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, the matrix was the new big innovative thing. And here we are 20 plus years later. Oh, here's another matrix. Right. And, really? and it's like, yeah, but where's the next thing. Right. And it's Snyder's like, here's something, mm -hmm. here's something new ish, let's say, because yeah, there's, there's going to be, uh, influences, but there's always influences, yeah. but it's something new. And don't we want that? Shouldn't we encourage that? You know, uh, M Michael Bay, it, I would love to see Michael Bay do something just totally bananas. That's just him. That's not plugged into a franchise that people have pre-existing expectations. Six underground. Of, yeah. yeah. Six underground was, there, was kind of yeah. that thing. And I enjoyed it. There you go. What it was. Yeah. Look at what, um, what Vaughn did with the Kingsman or what Nolan yeah. did with, with inception. Yeah. Like sometimes there, people are inspired by a franchise to go off and make something, you know, kind of like bond but not bond and with a dream aspect or some yeah. like i guess both of those are kind of bond <laughs> like inspired um both of those examples and and so that's kind of what's what's cool about about this and and there's an element too where it's like this should be the movie that everybody wants to see like based on the way people normally talk about this kind of thing um and i and i agree completely with the the fact that the way these franchises are and everything is so kind of focused on IP and like the same IP these days. And while I like a lot of stuff that has come out of Disney star Wars, one of the like more frustrating kind of things about it, I feel like is once um, like Disney got a hold of the property, it, it kind of instantly becomes like, how do we do as much of this same thing that we know people like as possible, which is great because you get a lot of the thing that people like, but also and I guess this is maybe the more controversial part about Star Wars in general is like the prequels wouldn't, I don't think would be made under, under Disney. They would have been the version of the prequels that everyone kind of yep. 
that people yeah. wanted to see, which I, I know it sounds backwards to phrase it that way, but that's like less interesting to me because George Lucas said, Hey, I want to go out and do something different. Let's do it this way. And sure. People overreacted or reacted how they did. And then, and then people are still going to debate about it today. But the fact of the matter is we didn't get a retread of the original trilogy. You know, we did, there's a version of that where it's just a fill in the blank um, story and and he he did so much more than that and in fact in some ways created potential plot holes by saying you know what i don't want to just dot my i's and cross my t's i want to actually tell this story the way that i want to and um that's not that's not something you're going to get today unless you say hey Zack snyder make that movie that you wanted to make about star wars but that could never actually exist and just take the star wars name off of it and make it your own thing like that's I wish we had a hundred of those because there's so many filmmakers oh, who are I'm making sure. movies because of Star Wars. Yeah. And to be able to say like, hey, go make all of them and just take the Star Wars name off of it is like super cool. There's well, Amanda. It's, well, it's kind of <laughs> like what, you know, the movie Predators with, you know, that mm. Robert Rodriguez produced. It was like, that was a movie that he was like, if I ever got a chance to make a Predator movie, this is, this is kind of like what I would like it to be. And then he just got the opportunity to actually produce a branded Predators movie, and honestly, it's it's a really good Predator. It's like, very underrated. It's a really good Predator. Attempted movie. sequels, Jesus Christ, yeah. Well, and yeah. that would have been a great movie. Like, even if they said no, it can't be a Predator. He'd be like, "That's fine. I'll just make it Alien Z instead of <laughs> like, like Alien just, Z." <laughs> yeah, like just plug in, you know, plug in a different <laughs> a different <laughs> villain, and it and it's literally this the, like there's nothing about or nothing. <laughs> I don't know if this is controversial or not, but there's nothing about Predator that says that it has to be that way. Like you could take 99% of Predator and just like change the alien design and it's it's a different franchise altogether. It's basically right. like, the most dangerous game, except for right. being the old rich guy. It's an alien. Like that's, I mean, even, even then, yeah. I mean, what's that saying that there's only like seven or eight actual plots and every story yeah. we tell is just repeating the same seven or eight stories over and over again. Hey, what it, what it makes say the same thing about guitar riffs. It's only like the same chords in various different ways, you know, but, just... that, but that's where the innovation comes yeah. in is how it, it's, it really, it's what makes it a challenge. And that's why I think when certain movies connect with us, you know, it's because they did something. They told this same kind of story, but they found they found some sort of hook, some kind of character. I mean, I remember when Zaki, you know, I, I, Zaki and I share a wonderful love for the Godfather movies. I, yeah. I, I know, I know this about Zaki. <laughs> and come on, I mean, it's 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 a mob it's a mob movie. Like, like if you really wanted to be pedestrian about it, it it's a mob movie. Yeah, but you know. Puzo originally with the novel and then Coppola because this is one of those rare times that I'll say the movie's better than the book, y'all. Oh. <laughs> what? Well, because no, Co uh, because because Coppola said no, it's not about the mob; it's about the family. It's about the it's about the father. It's the father. So he's the son becoming the father kind of deal that really gets lost sometimes in the book, but Coppola like zeroed in on it on 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 the movie and that's what makes it intriguing because you spend the entire time going michael don't become your father and what <laughs> happens at the end he becomes, he becomes his father <laughs> exactly you gave it <laughs> okay before we start we got, we got another buddy that's from uh, uh, we got mr ray flycast what's up sir? hey, hey ray. hello hey um, how's it right going yeah you know, hey. and i you know oh, scott no, no. i always forget to play your drop when you come in scott but then, of course, we got Ray coming in, so I got to play his drop. Ray, Ray, Ray. There you go. We Why did throw a knife at Steve, and so all's yeah. Well. You know, as we're long all as good we can now. Throw a Bobby knife at Steve. Have a drop because I don't have a drop yet. I, you don't have a drop yet. I'll I try to find one for you. I don't know. Got to find no, a it's fine. drop. Just make it something that's like in the background of something else. So. <laughs> um, Ray, hi. Hello. Um, now that Ray's here, I'm going to leave. No. <laughs> I have to go to bed. I'm super exhausted and my mom's well, busy. Uh, uh, okay, before you go, I, uh, there, and I do want to comment on... Did the... you watch it? I did. <laughs> I did. 
today I had one of those days where it, I, I haven't done this in a couple of years where I actually did a double feature and it worked. It, I timed it so perfectly because that was at one and then like Black Widow was at 3.30 and it was like mm-hmm. as soon as the as soon as the post credit scene was over or the mid credit scene rather was over, I walked out of the theater, down the hall, into the IMAX. As I sat down, the previews for Black Widow started. It was perfect timing. Perfect timing. But yeah, you guys were pretty <laughs> spot on <laughs> about that. But I still loved it. I still loved it. And I'm and I am still we're so talking about sold. F9, right? Yes. We yes, we're talking about F9. Yeah, see, yes. that's, that's what I was saying last week. I was like, no, I still liked it, but like you gotta understand where I'm coming from here. <laughs> no, I well, see, the other thing I did was I finally I also finally watched Fate of the Furious, which I didn't know that there was an extended director's cut of that. Oh, but right. I well, there's an extended either. cut of everyone five on. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. Didn't know that. So so watch the I watched the extended director's cut of Fate of Furious last night because I I I I'm a completionist and I wanted to know and I follow the series so it's like no I want to know what happens and how this connects and there definitely are some threads obviously that go into F9 you don't necessarily need them but I wanted them so yeah going into it it was just like okay well let's Fate of the Furious is pretty ridiculous at certain points let's see how ridiculous this gets oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hold <right>. my beer. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello. Hey. In the first ten minutes, you're just like, oh, it, it, oh okay. This is only the first ten minutes. Yes. Okay, you know what though? <laughs> but, but nothing tops the last half hour. Oh, oh the, the Pontiac Fiero. Uh, that, that, that just the. Uh, that's. Well, yeah, would, I was just when literally when Amanda and I were listening it, listening you know? earlier before you brought the the guest on, I was commenting and I said, you know what? The thing I don't think I, art- I could articulate properly is like. People and like Zaki was saying, watching them be in space, and you think, oh well. Remember how this started with them stealing DVD player or blue? Um, no, no, DVD <laughs> no it was DVD players. Like, you gotta go that remember? far back. Yeah. Um, yes. And 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 that's always kind of the running joke of like, remember how it started that way? And I don't have a problem with it being that escalated because I think there's a really cool. Like the idea of them escalating from that, like look at like Armageddon, for example, that's ridiculous. But like Michael Bay, like they they take it so seriously <laughs> that it's absurd. Even and the they go like, like the reverse theater. way, and it's like imagine if they took the going to space part like as seriously as they did in Armageddon, and that was the kind of absurdism they went for instead of being like, oh, the car is in space, and when you ha- press the gas pedal, it goes forward. <laughs> 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 like that. That's where it gets weird. Where it's like there's nothing wrong with them going from DVD players to. Did space. he actually turn the wheel? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes he did. did. Yes, That's he did. Weird. Yeah. Like, imagine yeah. if well, they did like a suit up montage with Roman and well, Trej and like. It would j- just the. I mean, aside from the ridiculousness of of it of a Fiero with a rocket strapped to it in space, the <laughs> idea that you're gonna like you know General Zod it at a satellite, you know, like that's. That, like, like that's the idea and it's like okay so then what what are you doing like because my whole my brain is like how are they getting back to earth yeah huh. they're getting back to earth and they that didn't was, even they show that and, oh, and they, not, they went to the space station it's, right? oh. and it's, it's it, like it's funny and it's entertaining and, and everything but like there's a version of that where it's also funny like taking it seriously actually makes it more funny like the, the when we people say take it seriously they don't mean like it needs to be dark and serious they mean like right. Like, don't be winking at me while you're doing it. Like, yeah. you, you're you're right. no, you're almost breaking the fourth wall. Like, isn't this hilarious? Well, well and, like... and and as, as Roman breaks the fourth wall, the majority of the movie because he, yeah, he's he keeps talking about like, hey, how are we walking away from all this shit? Right. And it's you like know, he might as well look that... at the he might as well look at the camera and go right. like one one of the most ridiculous bits with him where like they broke the they broke they jumped the shark with him really early with that tank falling on him where like he gets yes. smashed by that tank. Um, and then he's just like not, and they just and they make a joke about him just being like, I'm not gonna talk about it. Um, initially, I expected him to kick the back door of that thing open, like he had fought, like he had gone through a turret. Or I 100 thought that's what. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, it it was like <laughs> who killed Roger Rabbit, but with no cartoon animation. Yeah. No, I love that Brad Brad Curran keeps on saying, I'm waiting for the animated cat from Last Action Hero to show up. And I'm like, yeah, I agree with you, Brad. And it better be voiced by Danny DeVito. That's all I <laughs> it, well, it, it, it's It's clear. And one of the things we were talking about before is like how different the series is with 
Brian, you know, minding the kids, whatever. <laughs> but like the, I think it's just like since seven, they they they're just superheroes now. They they're they're in oh, they're the Avengers. They they're in invincible. they're in superhero no, mode. Seriously, like, that's what the next ones are. Like they when are he's really gonna be like, no, but we actually are invincible. Well, because well, it's like, and even when watching Fate of the Furious last night, it's like, okay, the Rock is just gonna beat up twenty guards in a prison. By himself. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then Vin Diesel's like, well, I will have my own scene where I rip the chains. Yeah, and, I know. And that's, that's, all, that's like, what it, yeah, that that's what we were talking about last week. That was like, I am Samson. Hear me totally. take out this temple. Yeah, wow. Okay. Hey, Old yeah. Testament. But, but, um, but, <laughs> but one of the things that Dr. and I were talking about at the beginning and that he said on his podcast was like, you know, that intrigued me was the whole thing about like, if you didn't have too Fast, Too Furious, and Tokyo Drift, right, right in the between one and four. I mean, would this? I mean, what what would happen to this franchise? I mean, it's almost like I mean, it it's, it kind of blew my mind. Like, what, I, I seriously, when I was listening to that, I went, "Holy shit!" You just blew my mind. I mean, okay, okay. Zachy, for for those of us who didn't, I, I can you give me like the the the, the Cliff Notes version because I'm intrigued by this theory. I, yeah. I have an idea what he's going to say, but go ahead. Um, well, the only yeah, the the only point I was making was that um, by virtue of the fact that Vin Diesel didn't come back for the second one, Paul Walker wasn't in the third one. It it sort of it robbed audiences of the direct sequel to The Fast and the Furious. And so when they did Fast and Furious in two thousand nine, it, it was in essence the legacy sequel. It was like the hey. Remember all those years ago when you saw that movie? Well, here's the direct sequel to that. And so it, it you know, no pun intended, it put a lot of NOS in there. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it bought them this sense of, of this um, being part of this legacy, you know? Yeah. And, and, and this well, is not an original observation. You demand for like that to happen, like by excluding it, they created yeah. a demand for it to exist. Exactly. Right. And then, um, and I, I can't remember who said this. It's it's not an original observation from me, but by the time you got to five, uh, it was like the Avengers of the Fast and Furious movies where you got everybody and oh, here's so and so from that one, and here's the oh we're, they're all in here now, you know? And 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 then really when you think about it, I mean number five is what really Absolutely. turned this into a perpetual yep. motion machine, right? Just yes. keeps going. Absolutely. So, yeah. I, I would add to that, you know, I where I thought you were gonna go with it was just like because you're right in terms of the absence of Vin Diesel and Paul Walker in the second and the third one, but also that's when that's where you know you, you added Tej and Roman in right. the second film, and then Tokyo Drift is essentially where you added Han. Right. So it's yeah. like so so that's where you started filling out your the rest of the group, yeah. right? And then and then uh, what Giselle was that Giselle, yeah, the, Gal Gadot's Giselle? character, right. Yeah. right? She comes in in the fourth movie, you know, where like they were the legacy sequel, so so. Even with the two main actors out, they were able to fill out the rest of like the group and keep the dynamic. Like, that I, I part that's part of the nos that they added to it. Not just <laughs> yeah. not just the the you know the the demand kind of artificially inflated for Paul Walker and Vin Diesel, but also more dynamics so that it's not just those two that you're focusing on. Yeah, you know, because because there are people who watch this franchise flat out. For Michelle Rodriguez, there are people who watch the franchise. For Tyrese, I'm not one of them. But and, and then there there are people <laughs> who you. watch. There Shoot. are people who watch the franchise for 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 Ludacris. I he's Tej is probably my I, favorite. I really character. like his character. I really like Ludacris's character. But they but they always have him paired up with Roman, and he's always telling like how stupid he is. Right? I, he's kind of a dick to him, isn't he? Is that just yeah, oh, absolutely I am totally ready? Oh, for, nice. leave dick. him alone. Damn, I am, I am totally ready for <laughs> Tej <laughs> and Ramsey to just be their own pairing and. <laughs> kick roman out they're so mean to him i'm like god damn all right we get it you're smarter than him shit yeah well, <laughs> he's a little brother he's like Rome, the runt of the litter yeah, but, Rome, you know, but you got that new dynamic when ramsey got introduced in in seven yeah, yeah. so so once again it's like you, you brought them together it's almost like you said the avengers i was thinking like almost like that cw crossover when you have like the five <laughs> shows and suddenly right. everyone everyone shows up like all the all your supporting crisis. cast crisis. Cr 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 crisis of the fast and the furious Although, yeah. the furious. I, but I, I will then, say a roman and they've gone on sounds more interesting than a uh, hobbs and shaw spinoff now that we're talking about it <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, 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 Roman and Tej spinoff would go off the rails so quickly. 
<laughs> so quickly. But then, but then they continue to add on because then you get Vin Diesel in five. You get no, it's fine. You'd you'd have you... Roman comment on how it's going off the rails. And like, oh, we're going off the rails now. Right. Like, oh, okay, they get no, it. I'm yeah, waiting seriously. for someone to actually say. Man, did we just jump a shark? Like, I'm waiting for them to actually <laughs> jump a shark. I yeah. really, I want them to go that meta. I don't, I don't want a Roman and Tej series. I want, I want Roman and Tej watching Fast and the Furious, unaware that it's them. Like, <laughs> right. SP3K style. Well, like, um, like the rap okay. was watching himself play football in uh, <laughs> yes. Fast in Seven and Furious. Yeah. Was it Fear yeah. 7? I think so. When he was in oh, the hospital, right? Shit. That was Fear 7? Yeah. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And that was him playing football in college on TV. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I have to admit that, that one right. of my favorite winks in Hobbs and Shaw, however, was the Mini Cooper with it that was in uh, Shaw's garage because he talked about that job in Italy. And I went, yeah. I right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I get yeah, that one. Thank you. That. Mm-hmm. I get that one. Thanks, yeah. man. Yeah. Thanks. Now you were there with Cipher, right? Uh, ha, ha, ha. Oh, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because Charlie's there on. That movie never got a sequel right. and needed one badly. Yeah, that what that that movie um, could have. Yeah, they were planning one. They were they were definitely yeah. planning one. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah I, I was really confused because I thought there was one. No, it they was like planning. it like almost started shooting a few times. I think it was in like. It was going to be in, in the Brazilian job, maybe? We- I think you're right. I think <laughs> some, something like that. I don't know. I wasn't I wasn't that big on Norton's hey, Please, Please do not movie. Google Brazilian job. I, I don't know. That's <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah like, no, that's a good idea. Not a good idea. Nope. Just probably not clear of that one. No, not at all. Uh, hmm. Um. So, yes, I... <laughs> See, I, I did see that earlier today, uh, along with Black Widow. So I, I'm, I'm caught up on both of those. But, you know, you guys were bringing up a point earlier with respect to Rebel Moon. I wanted to interject this. I didn't know if anybody had talked about this yet. I tweeted this the other day. Like, I'm ready for all the people that watch Rebel Moon and go, this is how the sequel trilogy should have gone. Yep. I'm ready for oh. that. That's going to happen. That's well, that goes back. Well, that goes back into what Stephen. Was, I think Stephen's point earlier was more about you, we already know baked in what the criticisms are going to be. But that's an interesting one. That that's a baked in, like yeah. You got, there's a segment I, of fans that are going to be like, "This is what Disney should have done." It's like, how about they just absolutely. do their own? Disney can do their thing, and Zach can do his thing, and they don't have to fight about it like Disney has with all their other creatives. And yeah. like everybody gets what they want. Like, right? Let's just go with that. True. Can, can we? Can we? Can we not make everything into a I into a hissy Zach fit? Of course. Oh no, no, you don't have. Yeah, that's the way the Zach internet just is. Fjorded a river of shit. Yeah. For the last exactly. Month long ass years so. exactly and then and then what thank you for it for the super chat but yeah i've always had that complaint too is like yeah tyrese's character was serious in too yep. fast too furious but that was mm-hmm. supposed to be essentially dom's character uh yeah but rewrites and stuff like that but then yeah but then when when diesel came back it's like all right what do we do with tyrese well let's make him be the character that yells I mean, a lot I- Honestly, though, I'm going to be completely honest. Do we expect great character development? We, you know what? Uh, Let me, we don't expect great, but we do expect character development. Yeah. I would agree. I I think there should be, there should, there should be progression, I think. Or Um, a a direction instead of, yeah, like a wild card of a character. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, one of the scenes I remember, oh man, that was like kind of badass. That in in uh, Too Fast, Too Furious, which was kind of cool, it was like when um, him and um, Brian, when Roman and Brian, like like they have to like get to like this car that's in a junkyard. Yes, like, yeah. And he just walks up. He takes. He just like peels his shirt off, and then he wraps it around his fist and breaks the window. But then it's kind of funny because then Brian goes. And he just opens the door like, hey, it was fucking open, dude. What the hell? But it was right. just kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. There was something just like kind of cool and kind of funny about that, about that dynamic. And then I'm like, I, but the whole time I'm going, that was supposed to be Vin Diesel. That was, right? I mean, like, but at the same time, yeah, what Forrest said, I'm like, I've always said that. I'm like, yeah, they just kind of went, all right, we got, we're going to introduce this new character that's supposed to be Vin Diesel, but not really. And then when Vin, Vin Diesel came back, they were like, all right, now Tyrese is going to be the guy that yells a lot and they're not going to debrief him about anything. <laughs> well, Jeez. also, I want to talk about when did Tej become a hacker? Like, 
Go back and look <laughs> yeah. at Too Fast. I, I'm sorry. Go back and look at Too Fast, Too Furious. Yeah. And I'm trying to understand how by five he's Q. I'm just, <laughs> I, you, you know what? I you know what? I mean, that's a great question. I I don't care because I love him I better as a actor. But oh, yeah, that's, I that's, but that's a that is a good question because I I didn't remember when all of a sudden in five when it's like okay he's telling him how to hack the vault he's telling him how to do he this it's like is at his local community college you know well um. I mean and once again that's the benefit of me watching all of them in five days is like <laughs> I'm able to watch has anyone the else ever done that. <laughs> I didn't Look, he, he's a peacock. He was just okay. waiting for the opportunity to fly. <laughs> yeah, you gotta let me fly, Cap. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> no, but like, but but that's that. But that's a case of like a change that, like, in my opinion, was for the better. Like, yeah, in terms I agree. of making yes. this character like that, because that's because the only way that something like this works, and clearly it's working, because they're nine movies deep. You don't get nine movies deep if it's not working on some level. The only way that it works is if you have enough dynamics to appeal to like almost everybody. You're not necessarily going to hit every mark, but there's got to be at least like everybody's got to have like at least some favorite character that isn't named Paul Walker or Vin Diesel. Yeah. Like it's got to be somebody you got to have more than just right. It's the same thing that I say about the Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang Theory, whether people like that or not. If the Big Bang Theory was just Leonard, Sheldon, Penny, Howard and Raj, like it was when the show started. If it was just them and it, and no one else, show lasts five or six seasons max. Yeah. When they added Bernadette and Amy Farrah Fowler, that's how oh, they yeah. got to twelve. That's how they got to twelve seasons. It's exactly how they got to twelve seasons because You're right. yeah. they changed the dyna- the group dynamic and they added more dimensions so that now people could go, oh well, you know what, Bernadette's funny. You know what. I like I'm a Blossom fan. I'll watch for my MBL like that kind of deal. Like that's mm. what added to it. You know what's funny about that too is like when you watch that first episode when Bernadette comes in, she doesn't have that kind of voice. It, it like it, it kind of like it just went to there. The first episode, her voice isn't that kind of voice that we know that right. character to be because mm. you know, a lot of shows do that. It's like okay, we introduce a new character and it's like oh, you got to add something new. You know, so yeah, I mean, sadly. When they told Tyrese, she's like, hey, you're just going to yell a lot <laughs> about it. everything. Uh, yeah. y- y- yell and try to be funny. And try to be funny. It's too bad. But uh, Zaki, you gotta, you're got going to take off, huh? I'm going to bounce. Thank you so much. Yes, man. This is, I, I, sincerely, it was such a great experience to talk to all of y'all. I feel like I've I've known you in real life for years, so this is, yeah. this is great. <laughs> no problem, man. Hey, the door's <laughs> always open, you know, if you want to ever jump on. And it's just- true shoot the shit, you know, like this is what we do pretty much every Friday is just hang out and talk about, well, lately we've been talking about a lot of fast saga. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, but uh, I appreciate you coming on and uh, yeah, guys follow Zaki on, um, on Twitter and then, uh, you know, follow his podcast. Uh, podcast is called, man, I always movie. What's it called? The, the movie film podcast. Movie film. But I always, I was like the film movie. I'm always, <laughs> you got that close. <laughs> yeah. Close. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you guys listen to that. Listen to the commentaries and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, Zaki, thank you for. Uh, okay, okay. I have to me. ask: Are we having a commentary for the Mask of Zorro? Because you were watching it tonight. Oh, that's right. You Is were that coming. It, 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 it will it happen eventually. Today was just my <laughs> son was like, "Hey, I want to watch that." But oh, you're a good I, father. That's a good I, son. Good yeah. father. <laughs> <laughs> it it will be happening. I, I would in that vein. I would expect in a few months, uh, within within the next few months, uh, the Phantom. So that's coming. So look for there that. you go. Oh, the yeah. Phantom. There oh, you go. The Phantom. Talk, talk about a go. superhero that needs to be updated right there. Even though right. Billy Zane, man, good stuff. All right, thank you, <laughs> Take sir. Take care. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Yeah. Take Bye. Appreciate Take it. it. Cool. All right. Yeah. yeah, the Phantom. I mean, that's one of those. That's one of those like um, '90s kind of like, hey, let's try this. Oh yeah, I, and I, I really that. enjoyed it. To be, I mean, I did enjoy it when I watched. I haven't watched it in like probably mm, fucking 15 years, but still, you know. I need to revisit it, and we're yes. going to on uh, Squawkcast Movies Patreon because that's that's, that's 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 coming that's coming up. But I saw it at the Dollar Theater. And then I remember my dad and I were kind of mixed on it. So then we li- we literally walked back into the theater and watched Dragonheart. So we did our own oh, double Dragonheart. feature. Heart. That the dragon was voiced by Sean Con- Connery. Yes. Yeah. Oh, right. 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 With yeah. that one, with yes. Dennis yeah. with Dennis Quaid Dennis as Dennis Quaid. Quaid. Yes, yeah. right. 
Give, oh give my us god! A line. Give us yeah. a line, Scott. Come on. Oh, but, uh, god. I'm but trying what? to. Oh, I'm trying to remember some lines from. <laughs> I, I do don't your, even remember. Do, you, do your best. Do your, your best, Sean Connery. Come on. I am the last one. Yeah. You know, or something there like that. that. There you <laughs> go. No, but uh, go into what Fourth said, and thank you again for a super chat. Okay, so the, yeah, female version. I mean, I don't get exact. I mean, because there is a part in in F nine where, like, literally, you know, Letty and um, my Mia go off to try to, and they find Han, and then they find Han's uh, adopted daughter i guess whatever the hell she is like you know i forgot exactly what her name is and that's a pretty good scene it was a really yeah. good scene like the way that they, they like kick everybody's ass i was like oh, all right i'm enjoying this part but at the same time i'm like okay we're gonna have a whole female i mean i i, I get i get it do a spin, do a spin like, off at least you, I mean, you know what though I mean, you know what the weird part about that though is dave is like and i and we get why they would do an all-female version i'm not yeah. against I'm not against an all, all female version, but generally speaking, when I, I feel like the rule of thumb when you are going to do an all female version of a movie, it's because perhaps the original version was a little too, for lack of a better word, word to use, homogenous for whatever reason. Sausage fest? Well, not just sausage fest, but also maybe one color or a major or a majority color over the others. And that's not something you can say about the Fast and the Furious franchise. They have always all. been a very dive. I mean, it's a very diverse yeah. film it's franchise. The topic, the content of street racing is not rich white kids. I mean, no, yeah, it isn't. No. Do. no, that's not who lives the culture, though. That's like right. some shithead yeah. who fucking crashes four of his daddy's cars and. Anyway, right. So it's so it's almost so so it's like you know again you you, you look at the franchise like well Letty's there, Ramsey's there, uh, Dom's sister whose name I I know I forget what her name in the Mia Mia that's right Mia yeah. she's there. So it's not like they you know and, and even with Cipher who I can't wait for her to like you know get crashed into a tank. I don't like her character at all, but uh, that you don't like haircut. villains winning, Ray, because you don't no, like I, villains winning. I don't like villains that go that far. Like that was the worst uh, part of this movie of like nine, like especially opinion. watching like the fate of the Furious and seeing that whole scenario. Is like, oh, please kill her, please kill her. Like <laughs> you know, so I, I no, I don't like that. I'm I'm not big on on villains winning like that at all. But like, it's not like this franchise is lacking female representation. Oh, and yeah, I, I really can't, I can't, like, let's let and the I can't women forget. have a chance to shine in this franchise for once. Like, right. And and I can't forget Helen Mirren, who is oh, just continues yes. to be in the franchise. It's like, oh, okay. Seriously. So I I, I I get it, and I and I'd probably still watch an all-female version, but it doesn't really feel like this franchise. I'll need, watch an all Helen Mirren need it. version. Need it. Doesn't need it, yeah. Helen Mirren, starring Helen Mirren, directed well, by Helen Mirren. <laughs> and, you know, and Helen Mirren and Ian McKellen and all of that, like th that generation of Patrick Stewart, like, Patrick Stewart of, of British Shakespearean actors, there's a part of me that has to go. There's someone who does good work every day they show up, but also doesn't say no to a paycheck. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm sitting here going, did Helen Mirren need to be in the Fast franchise? No. Are I we grateful like that she's there? Yes. I am enjoying the hell out of her. Does, does, does she need to be the villain of Shazam Fury of the Gods? Yeah. No, but I can't wait to see it. I'm sorry. Helen Mirren and Patrick Stewart are equals. Okay. Helen Mirren on the set of Fast 9 is a goddess. Okay. I would pay me to show up there. Hell yes. I'm sorry. It was a like good scene. Like it was a good scene. I'll, I'll give it that. It's like, it's like her, like, um, Oh, let's let's buy a, a a miniature pig on a whim. It's like every once in a while she'll see a script and you know what? Yeah, let's do some absolute cotton candy. I'm just feeling it. Like is, yeah, and and then what what Ford's saying right here. Thank you for the super chat again. But it it was like yeah, when she was like complaining, I was like wait well, wait a minute. I'm like I don't know. It seems like the you know women have had a pretty good you know. I mean, was, was when did was that before like Letty was that like when Letty came back or like is that why she left or Dude, like she came back in the I fourth remember one? Her complaint being well no she died in the fourth one and then came back in the sixth one 
Oh yeah, that's right. You're I right. remember right. the yeah. complaint being that the only reason why the women were involved was because of their relationships with the men, uh, not because like they wanted to like go make their own money. But for example, in F9, Michelle's like, this is who I am, bro. Gotta go. Bye. Like she wasn't part of it or asked to be a part of it because. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, it, it, <laughs> it was. I mean, it, that's what I remember though. Yeah. Years ago though. So I don't, well, because I, 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 you know, even just making the joke, it's like, it's like, you know, Dom and Letty are always trying to be like, hey, let's let's live a life, let's try to do the, you know, let's go to South America and wear white, you know, you know, and wear silk yeah. and you know, drink Coronas all day and like, you know, and be in this world. And then it's like, no, that didn't work. They found us, and then they try to go and like, hey, let's be rural this time. We have a kid. You you have a kid now this time. And then, but then Letty's like, no. Nah, Nah, this is me. I'm gonna ride a I'm gonna ride a dirt bike or whatever through this shit. And uh and then, you know, of course Dom can't fucking, you know, walk away from it either. I'm like, I really hope with the next one they don't try to do that again. It's like, dude, just Dom live live in a fucking uh, you know, a nice uh, just one of those movie style like apartments that has like one of those elevators that you have to pull the fucking door up and be <laughs> you know? Dom, Dom should just Dom should just have a he should have a bat phone yes. at this point for when for when whoever and I don't know what the date we, we never They're saw a body crazy. for Mr. Nobody. So like yeah, Mr. Nobody. No, like, you think he should have a bat phone? They make a joke in this movie. They don't have phones. <laughs> yeah, well that's <laughs> yeah, well, right. That's but that's the point is like the next I'm totally with Dave on this. Have a bat phone that you could that the team that the, Mr. Nobody calls you and then on the one line and then click over to the last line, call Tej and Roman and Ra Ramsey, Wait. whole team assemble, or have a furious signal, right? Like have a just have and a, you a, have a conference 10. call and right. they're like, what is that? Right. It just has the it just has the word family. There you go. There you go. The, the speed word dial, family. like <laughs> fast ten. Yeah. First grade cop. The next generation up from Kindergarten Cop, but it's with um, Dom and Letty, like, answering that bat phone in between, like, soccer practice and <laughs> PTA meetings. Oh, and... that is an element they absolutely do not need to add to the no. next movie. <laughs> well, and, and, and The Rock You're already welcome. did, because and that was the that was another crazy thing from The Fate of the Furious, too. The, the Rock, like, having... That, this was funny, though. Like, hey, teaching his soccer team the haka... <laughs> so oh, yeah, they, yeah. And, it, and the whole intimate the whole like intimidation thing like that they've already done the soccer practice thing with him so like they gotta they'd have to find something i don't know i'm not sure i i almost I feel mean, like you can't stay with brian forever right well just, they but, but i agree with dave really kill off the kids so they don't I, have to explain I, that like, i agree with what dave said before though they got to figure out what they're gonna do about paul yeah, walker i mean they can't keep having that <laughs> Like I don't know. Like I don't know what the the logical well, my, course of action you know, is. I remember when when Fate came out. I uh, I think I went on a little diatribe of like, hey, let's do this next time around. And I went. They should take the uh, you know when it comes to Dom and Letty, they should like okay, they're back. They're let go off, do your own thing as you know. You're you're now this family, but get it back to the to to the roots like the first Fast and Furious, go back to street racing and just like this small contained story in like, you know, do that. Don't go bigger. Just go, you know, do this. You can have your spinoff. Sure. And they but, listen to you, Dave. They listen uh, to you. And they, totally. space. they went to fucking. Yeah, they went to. The Technically, they did listen to you because they do end up in the same house at the end. True. So. It's all being rebuilt and blah, 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 family and. There comes Brian pulling up, and then cut the credits. You fucking ugh, god! No, but but I, but I but I but I I will tell you no. I that that mid credit scene. Oh no, I'm 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 in. I'm totally in for it. And the oh, next yeah, like the that. next movie needs to start with that. Han, Han and Shaw. Yeah, I, yeah, I need to cool. see. I need to see Han like just wail on. I need to see that happen. Dude. 
I that was that was it was cool like how he was just like oh it's just him working out and then all of a sudden you realize there's somebody in the bag that he's right playing. like that's cool and then all of a sudden he opens the door and there's han it's well, like oh okay cool well and that was, i read a, an interview like justin lynn was saying you know like a lot of people he said a lot of people were assuming that han coming back was going to be like justice for him but no he's still rather pissed off about Shaw and the whole situation, that whole situation in general. So, no, there's there's still definitely a score to settle. He says with respect to the two of them. Um, as my parting shot, because I really I'm exhausted. I gotta go to bed. <laughs> um, to mildly change the topic from Fast and the Furious just a little bit. Um, somebody brought up something about. I don't know, naked. Oh, yeah, me. It was me. I want to see Han naked. And now I'm going to say, speaking of naked, <laughs> I have two words. <laughs> Four syllables. Yes, I had to count. Adam Driver. Hmm. Oh. His, I mean, it's, it's, it's in the name. <laughs> Can yeah. we pull it up? Can we pull it up? Pull up the picture. Have you guys not seen? I, I don't. I, won't they get? Won't they get Dave's stream taken whoa, down? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Are you talking about like like on Twitter where like there was like that Adam Driver updates? Event? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where like he's like lying. I don't know what movie that is, but I that's that Annette. Was... That's that musical that's going to be at, like. Oh, where, where where he does kind not... of this while singing? Yes, yes, that's okay. the movie. Yes, yes, with okay. Marion. Uh, Cotillard, I can never pronounce her last name. Cotillard. I was close. I was yeah. close. I think I made the joke. I'm like, is he mainly humming? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, just humming. Is he humming mostly? I mean, what's Ray, happening? Ray, have you seen this tweet? No, no, <laughs> okay. I haven't. I have not Hold seen on, it. I'm on it. I'm on yeah, it. I don't think, I, I don't know if we should pull that. I mean, it's no, but I'll, I'll, I'll show privately nipple. to Ray. <laughs> Things have been pulled for less. Okay. Well. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, it, it doesn't really show nippies or any any. Well, no, that's you know, one of the. Okay, booty. I just I just texted well, it to you, Ray. It, yeah, right. it's on your way. It's on your way. It's fine. It's just you don't have to show it. I'm just telling everyone go look it up. Enjoy. You're welcome. That's my parting shot. My parting shot is naked Adam Driver grasping the breasts of Marion Cotillard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. Wow! Oh, oh. Ray. <laughs> wow! Ray. Damn! Uh, wow! That's and this okay. is gonna be a musical, Ray. A musical. Um, I, I so he He's so got they're gonna so they're gonna You're start singing. Gonna be a musical. <laughs> they're, he, they're gonna start sing. They're gonna break into song. Like yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, from Appar that position. Uh, well, apparently from other positions as well. Is what we've been told. Uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Things are gonna be buzzing. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not really getting a Stephen Sondheim vibe from that image. Just saying, I don't know. All right, okay, well, fair enough. I was I thinking more like Rogers and Hammerstein. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> oh, right. oh. She goes out like that. Right in on that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, come on! It couldn't be Cole Porter. I mean, <laughs> hi, mom. <laughs> Ray, oh, okay. Ray, Ray, I'm gonna like remove you real quick and see because you're kind of grainy right now. I'm gonna see if you let's see okay. if I remove you and add you if that helps. One, two, three, four, five. No, nope. I don't know. Maybe it's your internet connection. Let's That's... find on, on my. Uh... Yeah, I don't. Uh... No, I'm have... seeing. I'm seeing what I'm seeing. What Dave's seeing. Yeah. yeah. In, mm. in Streamyard or in YouTube? Because I've got the YouTube stream pulled up, and he looks fine there. Okay, right? looks okay, fine. good. In, in Streamyard, he looks in like Streamyard. He's not. He's, he's like in standard like, definition. He's a little yeah. pixelated in in YouTube, but that's that is so weird. Like, fine. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. But um, what the hell? Hey, somebody from Michigan from uh, you know Twitch has just said hi. Hi. Anyways. Um, oh, so, hello from the neighborhood from the area. There you go. I know. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know what's what's great about Michigan? I think it was actually uh, Meg that told me this. It was like, you could literally just say where you are by holding up your hand because it literally does look Meg like did that. say that. She yeah. did say yeah. that. She said that. Yeah. She lives directly, like, right in the middle. I'm like, no wonder you, you've never left because yeah. you're, like, you're, I, you're just right directly in the middle. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, right around here. 
I guess, <laughs> like right in, in this this area, essentially, yeah. right? This is like this whole this is like southeastern Lower Michigan, so like Wayne, Oakland, Genesee, like like right down in there. No, Meg is like a good hour north, at least of of where of where I'm at. Yeah. Um, but I but I have met her because she was at the uh, the BBS, the BBS thing, event. Yeah, yeah. I know. You and totally. too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. And Dave and I are just sitting here going, I want to be where the people are. I know, right? <laughs> oh, like, oh look at that. that. Yeah, but uh, but no. So, uh, so yeah, you guys were talking earlier about Rebel Moon. Um, yeah. Has anyone brought up how awesome it is that he's doing the Star Wars movie for Netflix and he was able, they let him keep Rebel in the title? Right. That's fantastic. I mean, that was I the first that. thing I thought too. It was like, wow. I'm like, the, the I'm like the the word rebel is in the title. There's there's some brass balls on that. Netflix is like, yeah, we're doing it. So what? Yeah, you know, and and I think uh, that's yeah. no moon. That's a space station, right? <laughs> but uh, but uh, the the you know to the point you guys are making earlier about franchises and like the whole idea of you know doing something outside of like traditional IP. Well, essentially. Studios, traditional studios are just not going to do that anymore because in the traditional marketplace, it's all about return on investment and ROI. And it's like, okay, they're only willing. And, it, and people will tell you this. You go into pitch meetings and the first thing that they tell you is, hey, what is your script like? Like compare your script to like whatever other movie that has already succeeded over, over time, right? Like that's literally part of how you're supposed to pitch a script in Hollywood. They want to know what else it's like that has succeeded. So Hollywood is only interested in really doing things that they know will get them, you know, a certain amount of money or whatever it is. And they're not willing to take nearly as many chances on original ideas. I mean, even look at somebody like Nolan. The only reason he got to do <laughs> Inception and Interstellar is because of all the money he made with the Dark Knight trilogy. If he doesn't succeed with any of those Batman movies, we don't get Inception. We don't get Interstellar because they won't give him a blank check essentially to do any of that stuff. And it's so what it's leading to now is, you know, for people that lament the streaming wars or the streaming age and, you know, want to be all traditionalist about it. The problem is going to these streamers. That's where they're taking more chances. That's where, so it, and in Netflix's case, it's because they need content. They always need content and the lifeblood of any original of any streamer is original content. So they're more willing because there's no box office expectation and, you know, you don't have all the traditional like responsibilities attached to it. You can take more chances. They're more apt to take chances on streaming. So you're never, Zach was only ever going to be able to do this on something like Netflix. They, none of the traditional studios are, are even going to remotely entertain something like this, unless you prove to them like a Nolan did, Hey, I made you a billion dollars with this. You should trust me. Well, and that's where not to. I've got a piece coming out this weekend. That I don't want to. I don't want to spoil too much of it. But, and I, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, though. That that's so much of that is why we have Star Wars in the first place. Not just because it was it was Lucas springboarding off of other kind of established properties and and turning it into a, a new IP like with Flash Gordon and whatnot, but also. Like you have the Netflix factor here, for example. Lucas was trying to, to avoid working with the, the the big studios so he could kind of retain that creative control also. Like the combination of factors going into this is um, incredibly similar to the number of factors that went into the Star Wars coming into existence. Like like the Rebel Moon exists for the same reasons Star Wars exists. Um, and it's like that sounds hyperbolic to even say that, but it's not at all because it's a creator wanted to make a movie and a franchise, and he was told he couldn't, and so he, um, so he removed it from the franchise, but told a similar story, um, and and got got his own financing, and then like Lucas used that to build Lucasfilm, where he could, where he, he could do more of that without the studio intervention, which like is very much where where Snyder is now, trying to get away from having to to deal with studio notes and executive notes. And, and that's like what Netflix provides for him. So um, for him to be in a like kind of on track with that, like character arc 
as a director, the same kind of course that Lucas was on. I mean, that's, I've always, there's always been some interesting similarities between them, but I think that this uh, is a, is a really cool step in his, his life story. <laughs> well, and think about, and think about Lucas film in general. I mean, what's the other big franchise that Lucasfilm has that can be, if you wanted to be pedantic about it, could be derivative yeah. Indiana Jones. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, both Star Wars and Indiana Jones are Saturday morning serials. Well, it openly. So I mean, openly, openly like, 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 they're, like they're, they're, they're hanging a lantern on it and saying, Oh no, we're doing that thing that you like. Yeah, and so the fact that anybody would look at this and be like, "Oh, he's just ripping off Star Wars," is like, like I, I I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna love it, but I'm gonna have a hard time. Like my eyes are already rolling out of my head at like, at the the way this is going to be talked about for, for the next few. I can just imagine when they announce the characters, like we're gonna have oh, years it's... of like. Yeah. Like they've they're already saying like oh Belisarius is just Darth Vader and like we don't even all we know is that he's the villain character and people are like oh that's the Darth Vader <laughs> right you know and maybe but, it, that, maybe but he's it, the Darth Maul like what do you <laughs> well it, it well, and it's and they're gonna, they're gonna go so like it, it's gonna be so banal and so like basic you know they're gonna find that it, well there's the Luke Skywalker character there's the, the 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 Han Solo character as soon as they yeah. cast a black person there's the Finn character. Yeah. Right. You know, whatever. Yeah. They're just going to go down the whole. And it, you know what a lot of it is, Stephen? I, I feel like a lot of it is generational because you talk to a Star Wars fan now. And do they even know about Kurosawa and like Seven Samurai? Do most of them know about it? Like as far it, as it depends on who if, if they I don't know. And I don't want to characterize too much. But I feel like that is less of a focus. I feel like most like original trilogy fans or even like prequel fans or people who are like have been Star Wars fans or are like fans of the whole saga um, are are very much rooted in that. Because like me personally, I I learned about filmmaking from watching the making of Star Wars. And that's what made me like interested in behind the scenes. Empire stuff. of Dreams is a fantastic yeah. document from that first DVD box set. Yeah. And then and then um, and then learning about uh, Joseph Campbell and Akira Kurosawa and and John Ford and. And like all of of you know, Coppola, like learning about all of Lucas's friends and inspirations and collaborators, and then going to look at you know you look at Joe Johnston and you're like oh Joe Johnston's awesome, and then he also you know he designed Slave One, a uh, Boba Fett starship, and um, and the Millennium Falcon and Tie Fighter and 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 Boba Fett, like his his actual design, you know all of these things that are like you know iconic Star Wars, and then he went on and made the Rocketeer. And he went on and made um, the first Captain America movie. Like these are all things that like people that are fans of Star Wars are like fans of because it all spins out of this, and it's all borrowing and sharing. And so it's funny that now something's going to spin out of it that involves Zack Snyder, and it's like whoa, 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 no more borrowing ideas from other creators. <laughs> right. like, yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it yeah, and, and he's obviously like you know the the he after however many years he's still the one to pick on for whatever flipping reason and it's like okay fine you know but he but he all of these directors does anybody i i i know one or two people in real life that have called quentin tarantino a hack ripoff artist oh yeah oh yeah there's there's you can find youtube videos where it's like hey look at this movie that they had some that two people dance and look at that Right. They'll, they'll do all that. Yeah, I know. It's it's it, it's always a you can probably always do that with anybody. You can really You can do that. that. I'm sorry. I can do that list. I can do that with John Williams. Yeah. Do, oh, I okay. can do that with do, I mean, I oh, have an old friend of mine it. used to swear up and down that John Williams was just has just been ripping off Holst his whole career. <laughs> no, dude. <laughs> listen listen to to Mars from the planets. Yes. Mars is the Imperial March. It is. No, it is. Yeah. No. I mean, mm -hmm. and there's another, and there's another piece that's um like the Star Wars theme. Like I remember, and I wasn't even looking for it. I'm just listening to some to some classical music and I go, what the you know, it's one of those moments where you go, what I, the hell? I, I have a funny meta story about that actually. Um well it might not be funny, but I'll tell it anyway. Um <laughs> So, you know, my, my old job, fact, not uh, even a story, you know what? <laughs> right. <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> no, but like, 
Uh, my, my old job at the TV station, I had to do, you know, I, I did promotions and, you know, we'd have like, we'd have reporters that would do like special feature stories. And one of our reporters did a, a Sunday special feature story on, we had the, the Star Wars costume exhibit at the Henry Ford Museum here a couple years ago. And so the, he called it Star Wars and the Power of Costume because I think that was the name of the exhibit. And so when I went to do the promo for this, I, you know, I put in like white, you know, the, the George Lucas wipes and I had like the star field and I, I found a, a, a cheap uh, text called star Jedi, which is free. That looks exactly like the star Wars font. And I put all that in there. Right. And then when it came time for the music, it's like, okay, what am I going to do? Well, we can't use music that we don't have the licensing for. And so we did our, got our licensing through Warner chapel. And so I go in there and I just type in the planets and there were free versions of the planets available. So I totally used Mercury, the winged messenger for the music, for the star Wars promo. And people were like, "Whoa, that sounds like star Wars. That's good. Where'd you get that from? Uh, it's literally the planets by Gustav Holst. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was just a, just, just to, to, to tie that in. I totally did that. I totally used Holst to promote a star Wars story. Or well, Williams used it to write the score, so you know yeah, it's like. I mean, but, and that's but what it, I'm fascinated about trying to figure out what what this is going to be because we know it's inspired by like the the idea, like it was origin originally a, a Star Wars concept. He's going to obviously differentiate himself on the design to some level. So, what direction is he going to take that? And and then also on top of that, you've also got like I think as I was thinking about it, the biggest thing when you talk about like the tapestry of this movie and an aesthetic and, and tone and feel is so important to Snyder is what is the music going to be? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I, gotta, I, I got a match as junkie and which after Jack Snyder's justice league, it makes me fascinated to think about like, wow, if junkie is told to make a score for a Ooh. space opera, Ooh. What does that sound like? Uh, that's that's, like, that's very intriguing because it's not it, it, it's because it's not the big he he's from the Zimmer school. It's not the big bombastic old school themes and, and the heavy brass and the orchestra, like you know, and I don't think that they would necessarily go for that either, but it does need if it's it, it, it's because it's going to always be compared to Star Wars, it both has to be different, but also has to be as lasting and and epic and that means it needs a score that makes it iconic that gives its characters meaning outside of what is on the screen you know that tells the story on its own you should be able to listen to the score and it tells the story and and junkie can do that i mean the like the justice league soundtrack is is i think amazing so it's a masterwork and um, i don't think that that exact style would necessarily work for for something like this but i am i'm fascinated to wonder like what i don't even know i don't even know how you start develop like there's so many ideas with this where it's like you look at concept art or you think of like what where what do you do to be like this is our star destroyer but it's not a star destroyer like how do you right like or this is a yeah. lightsaber but it's not a lightsaber like and see i don't it, yeah it, well and and that's like I mean, I hear you totally on the music, but that's the, the thing that that even more intrigues me is what is he going to do for the for for the devices and for the and for the ships? Like, what is his version of a lightsaber going to be? What is his version of an X-wing going to be? If there's well, even something like that? Yeah, I, I would say like if he's going to have like his version of a lightsaber, it probably would be like a samurai blade, and maybe there's going to be something. I mean, a, you know something around it, a glow or something like that. But at the same time, maybe it look like the black saber from Mandalorian. That's, that's what I'm always like wondering. I'm like, what does he have up his sleeve? I could almost think like, um, like going to what you were saying, like a star destroyer. What's that? What, what are these ships going to look like? And I'm kind of going like, well, what if he took like, you know, those designs from like alien from the alien, like franchise, like those, like the Geiger kind of yeah. designs. Yeah. Those kind of designs. Yeah. And, you know, like when you see those, those like designs that look like, you know, with the alien and like human bodies and we know, we know Snyder is like a big, you know, he's big about like the human anatomy and stuff like that. There's going to be something that's going to incorporate that maybe. So, you say gonna, so Dave, you're saying there's going to be penis ships. Yes. 
there's going to be penis ships. Okay. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, you I'm watch just, soccer yeah, fonts, there's dicks everywhere. Like, I mean, yeah, you know. Uh, and I think that kind of gives you an idea of, <laughs> like, we already have these other civilizations that he's envisioned in one movie. Right. Well, and I think at the I think at the very least, I think the one thing that he knows he probably can't do is he can't be geometric. No, especially not with the star to start. Like it, no using triangle, no, no triangles, yeah. no rhombuses, no. No, no, none of that shit. It's got to be more complex. There's, you know what? It, all, it almost is a right angle, <laughs> <laughs> right? Only yeah. squares. No, but like the, but like you said, the ge- like the Giger design, or or even like Chronicles of Riddick, <laughs> like stuff like that. You know, like it's got to be something that is probably more organic and less elemental than what we've seen in Star yeah. Wars. But I, I was commenting on this, that something that was cool about both for Kryptonian, but especially for the apocalyptian design is look at like the apocalyptian like ships when, when Uxas invades and, and the weapons that they have and everything, and then try to imagine them using anything that would be traditionally considered like technology like a computer. Imagine them having a computer on that ship with a hologram or anything, and I, it doesn't seem to fit. I mean, they've got like the the molten, like the yeah. geo um, images and stuff, but they don't. I, it's so hard to imagine them having like a console with blinking lights. It feels very, not even organic, but like like <laughs> it, it's like the spaceship version of like a Viking warship, right? You know, as opposed to a a a a battleship <laughs> yeah, well yeah um, you you just have a tough time wondering where the hell the pilot is on those on those ships and 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 if there's a pilot it's it's not nor it's not the normal controls right it's no, something no. really weird you, you almost feel like when you look at the uxa ships it's like it, it it blends itself more along the lines of you know the pilot is wired into the mainframe like you know with with tubes coming out of his Almost all like the, uh, all the sides Pacific and everything, rim, like a Pacific Rim kind of thing, where like there's like it, a it, it, even more organic than like because that was just like through the that was what, what was it that was through the back of their neck, wasn't it? It was like helmet, yeah. but there was still... yeah, they were they were jacked in, kind of like or, the Matrix, or right, it's, yeah, it's, it's, or it's controlled. I mean, look at the look at the scout ship, and then look at like the way that Apocalyptians rely on mother boxes. I mean, maybe it's controlled by its own sentient I mean, it's not it wouldn't be like a computer necessarily but i mean like controlled. battle beyond the stars like nell from battle beyond the stars maybe i mean i, I don't know what that is i don't oh. see that <laughs> um that's that's a that's a 1980 roger corman it's basically magnificent seven in space yeah i've i've heard of it but i've never seen it but yeah um, that's a he... steel book for it yeah th- there is a ship in there uh the main ship in there is like her, her name is her name is nell and like that's like that's literally what it is. She's a living ship that talks yeah. to Shad, the, the the pilot or the whoever is is there, and is like literally talking to him organically as she controls the ship. Yeah, cause, I mean, think about like the scout ship in when Cyborg interfaces with it, or 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 this like Luther interfaces with it. Yeah. You don't have like they're not working with a control. Like they just kind of bypass that whole like what does this look like altogether. And it's just, I mean, I guess you got like the Zod or the, um, the Jor-El hologram and, and stuff in the other scenes, but um, like Luth, like Lex doesn't interact with anything directly at all. He just does the, like the fingerprints and then, and then it like talks to him and he just tells it what to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, but I like the fact that like, maybe like, you know, the stormtroopers have like these biomechanical suits that are like, you know, they look like they're I mean, almost like going back to independence day. Like those aliens were inside biomechanical suits. Like when they cut those open, I, I always love that. That aspect of that was the fact that, you know, the aliens weren't what you saw. That was just, that was freaky. And they had these tentacles and shit like that. But well, when they opened it up, there was like a whole different alien in there. And then, okay, this yeah. is this is reminding me way too oh, much of this right oh. now, Ray. It's <laughs> why? Me, wh- why? Why? <laughs> what did Dave just say? Like the suits and the yes. typically thing. Like yeah. remember every time a Slayer gets killed. Yeah. And- oh yeah. Well, okay. Well, you just watched that like a couple of days. I did. Ago, so so yeah. But no, that but that Dave, that you, you you have seen that, Dave? I've seen it. Yeah, a long time ago. That was yeah. like. That was a that was a, a frequent watch. When that, I was that, that is a movie that I unabashedly enjoy, and if I still believed in the concept of a guilty pleasure, I would call it my yes. guilty pleasure. I don't, 
I stopped believing in the term guilty pleasure because I don't feel I don't think I should. Yeah, feel you guilty. don't feel guilty anymore, right? Right, exactly. But so I I just say I enjoy that movie. But yeah, we 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 talked about that the other day. We did. We <laughs> talked about that film. The other day, coming to Patreon, folks. It is. <laughs> this was a watch. Wow, yeah, man. I gotta um, rewatch that because, man, I'm just like trying to. I'm like, my brain is going. Oh yeah, remember? Blu-ray yeah. was six bucks on Amazon. Nice. So yeah, that, it, was, that, it, it was cheaper than buying it digitally. Yeah, no, it is. It's like half the price of digital because digital is like thirteen dollars. But uh, damn. But yeah, how that is. No, but one thing that we uh, that we haven't really mentioned when it comes to Rebel Moon. You know, when it comes to like, hey, this is Zack Snyder's Star Wars. R-rated Star Wars? Oh, oh yeah, of course. Oh, please, yeah. yes. I, I, yes, I, I think I so. Mean, I mean, when I think about, it's basically Seven Samurai, which means it's like the Magnificent Seven, which yeah. means you've also got two different versions of the Magnificent Seven that you can watch depending on your generation. Like, do you watch Denzel or do you watch... Um, Yul Brynner. Yul Brynner, all right, right. exactly. <laughs> And Steve know, McQueen. The, the Denzel version was fucking good. I'm just I saying, enjoy the Denzel version. I enjoyed version. the shit out of that movie, man. man but so I, and that kind of goes back to the idea of are they are they going to have swords? Like, if you really want to go Kurosawa, you really want to go samurai, they're going to have some sort of sword. And think about what you can do with that. Like, you know, you're going to be hacking things off. I expect a lot of people to die. You know, I mean, go back to go back to seven samurai magnificent seven <laughs> they don't make it <laughs> you know well, it's it's kind of the plot <sighs> in addition to the the kind of universe trappings of like how do they how do they portray not just the aesthetic but lightsabers the force and all that i think there are you know there are ways to do it i'm just curious what they what they are the other thing is like if especially if this is going to be a franchise that they're building out this was originally written to be slotted into a particular spot in the yeah. like, Star Wars timeline. So if this is being entirely reimagined, my my anticipation with Snyder is that he's not going to be like, oh, this is Dan Bolo and, and Chewbacca. His, his, and they fly the <laughs> Millennium Delkin. Right. And Dan like, right. Right. so, so like, like it's not going to be what they're doing. And so they're not going to be like, oh, yeah, no, the, the replicant wars happened and then and then the evil imperial dogmatic kingdom took over like and, right, and, and, gonna... and, and and the tiny like spatial robo robot has yeah. the secret plans to yeah. the moon and the alliance of rebels unites right. to like right like that like that's not what it's going to be and so obviously there are there are th that is like the least creative way to, to skirt that but there are some major brush strokes in terms of the way lucas penned it, the the rise and fall of the old republic and the empire and the clone wars and and even if you repaint all of that the the landscape shape is still iconic and and recognizable and so i'm really curious to see you know and you know what if you look at army of the dead and the way snyder, <clears throat> snyder builds universes Maybe that's not even a concern yet for for this movie. It may be. But so, there'll be like, a thing here and a thing there that if you're paying attention, that opens doors. Yeah, it's for... not like they need to. I mean, you look at like you look at um, the original Star Wars and and they like they they reference the Clone Wars, but you have no idea what it is. And I mean, they and there were multiple different versions of that even up until the prequels that got, got retconned and changed. And so. So I don't think it's a huge, you know, they don't, they don't have to have the entire like landscape and history laid out, but but it is curious to be like, okay, how do they how do you take a script that's that's the product of a very well established movie mythos and unplug it from that mythos and and then totally change the context around it and yet still keep like <clears throat> I don't know like the seven samurai story I think is easy because it's been done in so many, like there's so many, like every, every show that has, you know, more than three seasons has a seven samurai episode, <laughs> right? Where it's like that basic, we need protectors to whatever. The like, Mandalorian did it in the first season. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, the dark, I mean, <laughs> Stephen King did it in book five of the Dark Tower and hung a lantern on it. Like, I mean, they're, I mean, they they have that because you show up, you're always reluctant, you know, you hired somebody or, you know, and there's somebody coming to town. It's almost, you know, it's, and it, you can still almost do like Tombstone. Think about the gunfight, the OK Corral. So, good. you know. I mean, it's oh, still yeah. well, and I'm also it, really it's an archetype curious yeah. and like not looking forward to in addition to the, the the kind of general discourse and commentary around it. The fact that like I appreciate that they're up front out the gate about, hey, this was originally a Star Wars movie and they they're changing it to to no longer be a part of that franchise is that how therefore how much of the like the press coverage and not not like the 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 op eds and whatnot, but the the in, like how many interview questions is Snyder going to have to field about Star Wars and about yeah. is this inspired by this and how did right. you avoid stepping yeah. on this and was this yeah. in the original version? What did Lucasfilm think about that? Like those are all interesting things, but like man, imagine how much of a nightmare of like can we talk about my movie instead that's, of the that's, fact that's it's not Star a Star Wars? No, movie it's going to be it's going to be brutal, and then and. You know what and, I'm like. I said, wondering. I get those questions. They're all fascinating stuff, but like, it's a ma- talk about another franchise dominate. Like, it's gonna, it's yeah. it's gonna be almost impossible to get out from the shadow of yeah. Star Wars. And if someone can do it, it's Snyder. But like, man, that's gonna be hard work to to separate. The only thing I was thinking about right now is like, how many sound effects is he gonna go through before he finds a distinct sound effect for whatever lightsaber type thing that he has? Like, there's got to be something that's gonna come out. Yeah, it's not gonna look like a straight up just you know, you know, it's gonna probably look more like a blade or something. I don't know, but he's gonna there's gonna be some kind of sound effect that maybe that's gonna be. But what is it gonna be? What is Zack Snyder's like? You know, well, it's not gonna. There's a part of me that wonders if he's going to, um just bypass that altogether and just go straight samurai sword. I, you know, I was just thinking that he could go completely there's old school. Something maybe. I don't know. Well, maybe. okay. Going, like, going back, at, there's, going there's back no... to this, uh, example. Oh, yeah, this. Uh, right. Right. It was just, they were literally just like medieval swords that yeah. when they clashed Can red he... lightning, yeah. you know, right. shot out. I mean, yeah. 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 That he... was, he had something that he threw, right? The glaive. Know. Oh, the, the glaive. glaive. Yes. yes. Was, oh, yeah, yes. yeah, right. And then it was it was kind of like some kind of little weapon. Yeah. It was it was it was like a I mean it was a five bladed like yeah. ninja almost like a ninja star essentially. No, listen, but that a was boomerang. Like that. <laughs> yeah, well, cuz cuz it, it, it was mind control like he controlled it like telepathically he had the force. or whatever. <laughs> and yeah. cuz to me the the way that Snyder operates is very much like he doesn't want Unless he's got something that's going to make lightsabers look stupid, he's not going to have a knockoff lightsaber. And the easiest way to do that is to just say, you know what? These are samurai. And like right. it is like it is a noble tradition. And despite the fact that they live in a, in a world with laser guns, they a rite of passage is honing their own blade it's and taking kind of care of this, of this um, ancient weapon throughout right. their, their lives. An and elegant like, weapon for a more civilized age. That that yeah, I could I could totally see that thematically remaining what, in his. What if, what if it's like a like a metal type su- substance that does shoot out, but it it's solid. It's not a laser. It's not lit up, but it's solid. Like but that's shoot. still that's still just yeah. Snyder's yeah, uh, Snyder's yeah. generic version of a lightsaber, though. Right? That's still <laughs> yeah. hot, like like what do you, what can he do to make this mo- to make the elements of this movie? not Snyder's version of the Millennium Falcon and Snyder's version of lightsabers. Like everything's going to get that label unless he can so drastically separate it. And sometimes that's bad because sometimes you're better off just to say, yeah, you know what? It's a lightsaber. You can't beat it. So that's what it's an energy sword. That's what it is. Let's not think about it too much. Um, But, but also there's, there's sometimes where you're like, you know what? Let's not try to compare. Let's just, let's just make it, you know, make it what it is. And I think the, even harder than that is going to be like the force. Right. And like, what are the, like, how do you, how do you depict and show and show the force without it being I, considered a, a ripoff or B a commentary on with like, like, you know, people are going to talk about metachlorians and, 
and oh, it, right like who who had the oh. better interpretation of this mystical and it's like we've had wizards in movies like forever how is that hard to be like it's a wizard but in space um well that could be so, how he that could totally be just how he decides to approach it it's just yeah, I okay think he's gonna go okay. more arthurian with it like the excalibur right. is gonna be the swords right and right Merlin and, and is gonna be the jedi like. It, exactly like we have wizards they're they're called he's probably just gonna call them wizards that's yeah. probably just what it's gonna be man there's so many so many things I'm, I'm, i even going back to that i'm like how do you like uh like what if people were fighting you know with the force but they were like very you know separate or something like that and somehow but then it it reminds me of rise of, uh rise of skywalker when kylo ren and ray are not in the same spot but they're fighting i actually thought that was that was actually my favorite part of the movie was when they were like on that one planet and they were fighting each other but they weren't in the same spot and it kept right. switching backgrounds i was like there it is. That's something new and cool. And I was like, I like that. So I, yeah, but I was just, that was, uh, that's what I was kind of thinking when you were like saying like well, stuff, but I mean, how on one hand I can talk? see like, there's a cool version of like the kind of original version of the force. Like at, there's no, I guess Darth Vader choking is the most like influential, ver but in, in, in a new hope, the force is presented as it guides you it, it speaks to you if you listen. It, it guides your actions. And then in Empire Strikes Back, it was kind of a big moment when he called the lightsaber to him because that was like a that was adding to canon, right? Where he was hanging in the in the ice in the Wampa Cave and he like pulled the lightsaber with the force. That was like, whoa, you could do that with the force. Right. And so there's an element where it's like, okay, go go the go the warrior monk route and have these people just be like very mystical but not overtly having power but then there's an, on the other hand you're like ooh, but i'm sure zack snyder would love to have people shooting lightning out of their hands <laughs> like how do you yeah where do you um, well and, and that could even be a case where like okay every maybe maybe it's not just a sith power because that's the thing in star wars it's like okay your power set is tied into whatever side of the force you're on light or dark and maybe in this case he's just like well jumble them up everybody can shoot lightning or Maybe lightning is a good power and not a bad power, or maybe you know, maybe there's not a choke, but maybe there's still a throw. Because it almost, I almost feel like that's the like the push and the pull. I I feel like somehow he's got to work that into it. Like how do you? Because it and I know it's going to be tough to like differentiate, but even if you just call it magic, it's almost like you gotta have that. Right? right, and then it's like, and well, then you think like, if you go back to the lightsabers, like, what if they just produce it out of their hands? Like, it's not even like a device or well, anything. It's just yeah. I was gonna say to make the lightsaber like a product of the force, but like, I don't think there's any way the lightsaber, especially, I don't think there's any way around that without it being Zack Snyder's Associated, lightsaber yeah. replacement. And if that's yeah. if it's gonna be Zack Snyder's lightsaber replacement, you either just do a straight up lightsaber or you make it as a, a, a sword. It's you make it a ring. The right, Schwartz right. is as big as your Schwartz is as big as mine. Jeez, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's so frustrating to even have this conversation because I'm sure people are watching and they're like, "It's not that hard." Lucas didn't invent these things, right? Lucas didn't invent energy swords. Lucas didn't invent wizards, but it's, he made them iconic. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And well, in such a way that you you can't. Yeah, how do you get around uh, that uh, without like paying the toll? <laughs> well, right. Well, I, I I go through this as a writer all the time. It's like you know, especially with science fiction, it's like so many. You have an idea to like solve a problem in a story, and it's like, well, damn it, somebody already did. like they. You're on a ship and you're trying to get to a planet. Oh wait, I could just use a matter energy. Oh wait, Star Trek already fucking did that. Transporters, <laughs> you know, and it's not an original concept to Star Trek. Matter energy transporting is a scientific principle, but Star Trek made it transporters. So anybody yeah. that does that, it's like, oh, you're ripping off Star Trek. So that's yeah. the same thing. I will say that the the kind of premise of this, the fact that it sounds like it takes place like in the same star system inherently separates it a little bit because it's a little bit less of this like star wars has this like light speed and galaxy spanning kind of feel whereas this i feel like a, is a lot more of it is going to take place on the ground i bet it's going to be swampy or 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 foresty kind of like um you know think How about, about deserty <laughs> right um 
and and but you're gonna have a lot more um like on the ground stuff happening and even though they're going back and forth between planets it's going to be like neighboring planets and not not gonna have to worry so much about like going into light speed and then finding a death star and and all of that stuff i think you're going to focus way more on a on a much more micro level like a medium micro scale that star wars didn't get as often and like you get a little bit in empire when they're like on hoth and they go to to best bend which is like in the same system but it it, it seems like it's going to be the the way it described it to me at least i pictured it um a lot less uh um, a lot more familiar, I guess. I should, maybe is the, is the best word where it's like the same neighborhood, which sounds like a cool. You're going to visit more planets. You're going to spend more time on the ground, and it gets away from a lot of that stuff that would typically be associated with Star Wars. Um, and it lets oh. them explore this kind of territory that people are like, I wish Star Wars would do this. And it does a lot more of that, which sidesteps a lot of that, the kind of comparison points. Well, it, it kind of reminds me of like how you can do something intriguing, like if you've ever read or seen The Expanse. I mean, that entire, you know, it's at least early on because I haven't read the entire series yet, but it completely takes place in our solar system. Like, it's amazing what kind of stories you can tell when you're literally just going like, a, I'm sorry, a solar system is a big place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah it, a lot it, of planets have some moons. And guess what? There, this rebel moon is... It? Right. It, right. It is a moon, which suggests something about a moon. Yeah. I mean, it suggests a planet that it is revolving around because that's the definition of a moon. Exactly. Right. You know what I just thought about right now? I don't know. I Maybe I was like thinking too, too much Scott Pilgrim. But I mean, what if the uh, the sabers are like made of like fire or something like that? Like not not like a laser, but it's well, like that, but then it's just a fire lightsaber. Yeah, exactly. See, that's that's the thing. No matter what, somebody's gonna pick it apart. Yeah, yeah that's what we're getting at here. <laughs> yeah, so I, I I I really am leaning towards the idea that he's just gonna sit the swords. Bad. Yeah. Um, no, and there's I, something I, really cool. Uh, like, so there's something very organic about that that seems more true to the Jedi in a way. Whereas, like the lightsabers, when you think about kind of everything we've learned about the Jedi, feel almost like a lie. Yeah. Like it feels more pure to just go with a, a straight up like. Well, sword. I, but isn't that like back... even in Knights of the Old Republic, like they are swords? Yeah. Well, they have yeah. vibro sabers or something like that, and right? They, but they also have light sabers. The, the, their head cannon, I guess, the the Jedi head cannon for it is not so much the existence of the of it as a device, but the elegance of its creation. Right? Well, than the Kyber crystals, like the exactly. idea. Well, it, depending on which canon, you know, once again, you know, it, going back to Snyder minute, F canon. But uh, the idea that it was about you coming to some sort of, it was almost Zen Buddhist in a way that you had to come into Very some Buddhist type. Inspired. Right, yes. right. I, you had to come into some sort of relationship, some sort of peace with the crystal so that the lightsaber would even function yeah. like that was the whole point about building your own lightsaber was you had to be attuned with the crystal so that the lightsaber would function now that's something that you know i still gotta get through clone wars but that's not something that really seemed like where, it stayed that where, much in canon where, 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 no, where, where, a little bit different yeah like where are you at in clone wars <laughs> Oh, dude! Like, it, <laughs> no, it, there's, there's no, 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 no. It's embarrassing how far behind I am. No, there is there is an uh, episode arc that absolutely deals directly with what you're talking about, like directly with what you're talking about, and and and, and the uh, my the, what I always think of in, in in legends or expanded universe when I think of the the Kyber crystals is in the uh, Kevin J. Anderson's Young Jedi Knights when they all have to seek out different crystals and find one that like yeah they... with, Jay with Jason and Jaina having to yeah build and in that road. one yeah I remember they had a, a, a like a sort of symbiosis with the with the crystals but there was way more of a like the act of finding it was way more and like finding something that was personal to them was way more relevant than like the symbiosis with the actual um essence of the crystal isn't that pretty where, much how it is in clone wars too well sort of but in the in the clone wars there is a like the crystal will will like call to you and right you, yeah that's and, like true. the crystal chooses you right. and yeah. um and the reason the red lightsabers are are red is because they don't call to the sith and so the sith in order to to have one they dominate the crystal to make it theirs and that causes it to to bleed and and turn red so it's like 
similar ish but the well the red crystal part is different but the the rest of it is like kind of same neighborhood the schwartz is in you lone star the schwartz <laughs> is in you that's what i just thought about right now i was like hmm i don't know i like <laughs> no. i don't know I, i'm just sitting here going like i mean if they if he does have traditional sh- swords yeah yeah what it's if it have to be some like... kind of special kind of steel or something i don't what know if you, well it's kind of the idea that what if you don't have blacksmiths who may, like what do you actually have to make the sword yourself like yeah you, you have to be your own blacksmith i mean yeah one of the things one of the things that i want to i mean when you when you jump from empire to jedi what happens is like you know um luke makes his own lightsaber you know that's that's talked about like uh, the emperor talks about that you and know, if you go eu you got shadows of the empire where that yeah. actually happens yeah it happens but you in that didn't book. see that in the you know in the movies you had to actually right. like dig into like like what you guys were talking about it was like the whole mythology of the crystals and everything like that i mean that's one of the things that ah, that's that always frustrated me about it's like the movie's just like oh yeah now all of a sudden it's like now we're here now we're this now we're that you know but and then it was all the other stuff that you had to like fill in the gaps and i'm i i'm thinking that you know, when it comes to Zack Snyder, guess what? He's always going to have those gaps like there already. You're not going to have to like read a book or a comic book. Or, he's going to have it already like there for for everybody. And I think that's the approach that he's definitely going to take when it comes to all this. And maybe people will be like, huh, even though it's like Star Wars. Hey, you know, it's a little I mean, we're we're, we're like we we get some like fucking backstory on some of the shit here that we didn't get in the star wars movies i don't know no, here's how you fix not fix but how you how you re reinterpret both the force and lightsabers and jedi all at the same time in a way that allows him to kind of do something similar yet not be a total retread is you go the excalibur route mm. and they don't have to make oh the God. sabers it's that there is a on, there's only a fixed number of them in existence and they are passed down from mentor to student, and the the maybe the power originates from the the blade itself. Mm. And okay. so, Ooh, and so that... you have to find, like, discover or take or inherit one in order to be a member of the warrior monk cast. Okay, um, totally. I'm gonna once again make another connection here. That is totally how it works in the Gunslinger by Stephen King. Mm. Like, because the idea is that. To become a gunslinger, you first have to be part of like this noble cast in yeah. the society. Clan, you yeah. go to school and actually, it, this is in the first book, but the idea is that you actually have to beat your teacher to be handed your first guns. You have to earn your first guns by beating your teacher and then after you've got that you'll eventually inherit the guns of your father Mm. because because in that society in the dark tower gunslingers are an evolution of knights so basically think about a clint eastwood type cowboy who is basically a knight of the round table I like the idea of like there's only a finite amount of them that exists, and like you have to find one in order to be or part earn of that one or earn right or or earn one because because then that you know because you know part of the dynamic in terms of like why Luke had to build one is because well one was passed down to him and then he lost it and it wasn't a case where oh I ha- I can just go to the Jedi Temple and build another one no he had to scrounge and like figure out how to do it himself so it was the case where like oh there's just going to be a bunch of resources laying around for this because there's not so many it's just me right yoda's not helping me build one you know wherever whatever the hell happened to his because he he had one and never we you know whatever but like yeah i like the idea of it of there being a bit more import but see right there right there you place more importance on the sword and that's where the see this is what the secret trilogy should have done people pop right up <laughs> see, exactly what, where I they, mean, just going exactly on just going on what you said man. like this is what the whole movie is going to be about it's just like this one dude trying to make 
a lightsaber type thing. And that's his whole fucking journey to try to make this fucking thing. Like, like to, you know, I'm like, watch the whole, you know, the first, at least the first movie be about that, where it's just something. So like, you know, it's not about, I mean, how, you know, I mean, hopefully it doesn't take like, uh, Oh yeah. You got this, you know, young boy that lives on or young girl. It's, obviously it's going to be a, a female lead. Um, that's just on this planet. And then she goes, Oh wait, I have these abilities. And this one old dude says, maybe I'm something and blah, blah, blah. It's not going to be that. And, but like, but like, what if it's just like, I don't know. <sighs> it, it's seven samurai and they all die. And she inherits one of the swords and seeks out people to take the other six or however. There you go. Or something like that. Yeah. It's gonna be... And so that's how she becomes one of one of them. Or there's a big moment where one of the characters dies and, and she picks up their sword and, and goes into battle with it. And it's and, a... the man, and the mantle is passed on. Yeah. Yeah. It's because... going to definitely be something like that. That I feel like that, that really effectively sidesteps almost all of the, it allows for a different Jedi mythology. It allows for a different lightsaber mythology. It also gives a more finite, like, like let's say the swords come from it. Like if it's an ex literally like when I say Excalibur, I mean like a lady of the lake or something like that situation where um, maybe gets like some math mass effect going in there where it's like the Protheons made these sabers and, <laughs> and they're in there these like, go. you know, All an right. architect, you know, it's some ancient civilization that has been, has come and gone. Yeah. Um, left them behind and they imbue or unlock or whatever these, these powers. And, and that changes, that changes the force that changes the nature of lightsabers. It also gives a fixed size to the, like the Jedi order. So you can, it, it, it eliminates the like, well, anybody can just learn how to, how to do it. It's like, Oh no, you have to have this. It, it gives a, a significance to the item. And then if you have an element of like the item chooses the, the wielder or, or, or or something like that. I don't know. There's there's enough elements in there that it's like that's that's cool and it allows for some original storytelling that is most certainly not like a, a rip off. And, and even though you didn't mean to do it, you just literally described at least two or three things that haters of the Last Jedi will love. <laughs> that's totally it, it, totally, especially sure. with the whole you know not everybody can be a Jedi thing. It's like yeah, that's that's that is yeah. Well, it's not necessarily a I'm I don't know that I fall one way or the other on that even particular debate within Star Wars, but within a mythology period, I think that that is a useful thing to do to set yourself up so that by, you know, later movies in the franchise, it's not everyone's a Jedi now and you've still got this like you've still got you give some reverence to the the um there's only one Excalibur or there's only seven Excaliburs <laughs> or however many there are. And, and it, it gives a, you know, they can't just go make one. They can't just go find one. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a rarity and a, and a value to it. And it removes the judgment on like, because part of the problem with the whole argument in star Wars about, can anybody use the force is first of all, it, it, it gets into the metachlorian stuff, but also it gets into like, people that don't like the idea of um, of kind of the 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 way Lucas took it in the prequels is that it implies that there is a a genetics or a, a predisposition to the, the, do it the, the, which the, the, si the science aspect some yeah. people watch Star Wars and the thing they loved about it was that anybody could be a Jedi and other people watched it and liked the fact that oh this person was a cho the chosen one and those two kind of Part, different people loved those different sides of the the story because those are two different mythological concepts and they kind of came to to butt heads and this is one of those areas where i think you could just sidestep it all together and say no no no, it's not even about the person or maybe it is about the person and it's just about finite resources but you take it away from the does this person have the ability to do it and more did the ancient beings that created the items determine that you know this person should have it or that person should have it or whatever, however you go with it. Well, it becomes, if you go back to Campbell, it becomes the artifact, it becomes the boon. It becomes the thing that the hero has to journey into the underworld to get and then come out the other side because that was the point of the journey was, you know, getting the thing. 
Right, like you know, like 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 uh, like Colwyn climbing the mountain to 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 get the glade. <laughs> What I, I wouldn't be shocked if he gives a meta inclusion of the Campbell journey as a rite of passage for the um like warriors the warriors where it's literally a a map to becoming the warrior is accomplishing these feats as described by in, Campbell in a circle yeah <laughs> in a circle no and uh, dice. Mentioned this right here, like, yeah, give me a full poetic. The blade sings to uh, only the master. Yeah. But, but the first thing I thought about was uh, this right here. If it loads. Oh. <laughs> Roger Rabbit. <laughs> <Wicked> <laughs> rich cries. Yeah. And although I know it's strictly taboo. taboo. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I don't know why. I just like, I was like, oh, yeah. Wasn't that in Roger Rabbit? Yes. <laughs> yes totally. Totally. Who Fred Roger, Fred Rabbit. Roger Rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I, I kind of, I kind of agree oh, with us on that one because, and that's I think what a lot of I think what some of us are, are, are hoping is the case is that this is a fully poetic version of you know like his fully poetic version of a Star Wars esque story, right? You know, do do you necessarily want it to be like you, you're not looking for it to be necessarily as accessible? as Star Wars is as a franchise, which kind of goes back to the whole rated R discussion. The whole rated R idea is like, you know, okay, you're going to make it for maybe a more adult audience. Maybe it's not necessarily family movie, but on top of that, you know, really go for the symbolism and the depth and the development that we don't even see in Star Wars or that we see bits and pieces of in Star Wars. Well, I think it goes back to the idea of, I mean, it, being on Netflix, it's a streaming movie. I mean, all this stuff that you can get away with, like, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to use an example because I, I've gone back and watched now, like in the past 10 days, I've watched five movies, all of them streaming originals. Most of them on Netflix, then add in the Tomorrow War on Amazon. Hmm. But go back to talking about Fear Street it was based on R.L. Stein books. So it's based on books, quote, for kids, even though the Fear Street books are more like preteen, teenage. I was not prepared for full on R rated slasher. And it is like, dude, that's that's, that's good to know. Fuck. Oh, no, no. This is like full on R rated slasher horror uh, movies. How did you handle that? I, I, my oh, eyes kind of uh, just, that's, that's, that's <laughs> a good say. question, Stephen. I didn't think about that. You're right. Um, I, 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 um, I, I do a lot of, I do a lot of this, you know, yeah. look to the side, yeah. you know, yeah, Maybe your face turns into a, an emoji. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> my eyes turn to the side, but thankfully the characters are interesting. The stories are interesting. The time periods, like, you know, there's, it's kind of like yeah. the discussion that Ray and I had when we did like Dr. Sleep and the it movies. It's like when Ray realized, Oh, I like horror when it tells a good story. Like that's what fear street is doing. But there's this idea of this is not meant to be accessible. This is supposed to be like old school, like Friday okay. the 13th, ha a nightmare on Elm street, Halloween. Like, no horror i mean this is this is okay. call that's what's cool about the nature of of streaming is that because audience segmentation is so much different now than it, than it used to be because with television if you think about it like and this is maybe a cynical way to look at it but i think it helps understand the content creation process if you look at marketing and and advertisements if you go to like to TV or even with movies and like product placement and stuff, there's a bit of a gamble of this type of person is going to watch this type of thing. And so we will play our commercials during that time or do our product placement in those movies with an anticipation that your target audience will therefore be exposed to your product. And, and it's smart, but like there's a little bit of a gamble in there of you don't know who, how many people are going to see it and you're hoping that it, that's the right demographic and whatever. And and the content is, is relatively similar. 
where like you put something in the theaters and it's like, I hope they come or you put it on TV and it's like, well, I, I hope they find it. And with, with streaming, like Netflix has the ability to say, we have this many people who like this kind of content. So let's make it that. And you don't have to worry about like the reason that you get these like four quadrant entertainment stuff that ends up getting like really watered down and more mainstream is because you're going to put a movie out. And you're going to say, well, we can't make a movie that only appeals to one quadrant because then we um, then it's, it's there's less of a chance of it hitting across the board or, you know, we can't do a TV show that only appeals to one audience because we don't have a way to give it only to that audience. Whereas like, Netflix, you know, any streaming service can say this audience likes this type of thing, and then literally just email all of, all of them and say, "Oh, hey, we just made a, a, a movie that's designed for you and nobody else." Which they um, do that all the time. Whenever a new one comes out, they'll or, or they'll even suggest it to put in my list, where it's like, yeah. "Hey, we, we noticed you watched this and gave that a thumbs up. Here, try this new thing." And I think that's why sometimes I'm not saying that streaming movies you know, there, sometimes you get some more generic stuff or some underbaked stuff and there's, you know, it's not as well oiled of a machine as like Hollywood is yet. But I think sometimes you get these mixed receptions to things that is interpreted as a mixed movie when really what it is, is that people have not adapted yet to the idea that, Oh no, we're just not trying to appeal to everybody anymore. Cause we don't have to, we have a captive right, audience. This movie isn't for you. Everyone. Yeah. Right. And, well, and, and you know what? And, we have a streaming service and we, and we have all these different audiences that can be cut up by these people like slashers. These people don't. You don't have yeah. to make one that appeals to both. You say, cool, here's your slasher movies. Here's and, your not slasher movies. And, and, and then, and, yeah. And, and by the way, the other thing that allows you the freedom to do that is you don't have a box office expectation. You don't have a minimum screens expectation. There's you know, another, like, thing, uh, another thing that just hit me right now, like going back to Army of the Dead. What did Zach say about Army of the Dead when it when he was like kind of promoting it? And I, I just it just kind of hit me right now because you know we're kind of like how is he gonna separate himself from the Star Wars uh, from anything Star Wars? But when it came to the zombie genre, what did he say? He's all you know what I threw in the tropiest of the tropes of the fucking tropiest shit. Maybe he's just gonna fucking go fuck it. I'm going to fuck people are going to be like, that's just like that. And he's going to like, yeah, fuck it. But I added to it. You're saying I man added- below is a, is a legitimate chance for a character that flies yeah. the millennium Dalkin. And- yes. It's going to be, yeah, he's going to be a dude that has a fucking side. He wears know. a red vest though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I think he's going to throw in like tropes of star Wars. Yeah. But there's going to be something that's going to amplify well, it. And it's going to be R rated. Be- of all this stuff that I'm talking about, that's like, I don't know. I hate falling into this trap because so many, especially Snyder fans do this. And it feels like social media and, and stream stuff is just full of like the, woe is me. Everybody hates the Snyder stuff and like whatever. But um, there's uh, of all the stuff that, that I'm, I'm anticipating with dread ahead of time. There, there's all of the like, oh, this is just a ripoff, and then there's the the parts where he's going to do overt homages to Star Wars or Seven Samurai or or both, where he's gonna lift a shot from, or he's gonna have a hello there, or he's gonna have a you know <laughs> something like that in there as right. as an homage. <laughs> hello, and, I got a bad feeling about this, Stephen. <laughs> mm-hmm. And 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 oh man, are those things going to be the ones with the worst takes about them? Because you look at when he. He does that now and you have one side that's like, oh, and it's homage. It's an homage to this thing that makes it the greatest ever. And the other side is like, it's just a rip off of this other thing. It's like about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, but, but it, it is intriguing to think of what are, what will be the homages? Hello there could totally be one. That could be a very easy one for him to do. I, I feel like he'll stay away from, I've got a bad feeling about this. I feel like he'll <laughs> yeah, stay away exactly. from that one. <laughs> But like, what else? But what else would he homage? Like, what else do you think he would? He might homage the the power will be with you always. Yeah. Um, the power yeah. will be with you always, yeah. Duke. I, I am your dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 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 is he just gonna go the clerks two route ma- ma- mannequin starred blower upper? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
Uh, I don't know. <laughs> oh man, I love I, I love Scott's face when I said that. Right, he was like, <laughs> oh, he really went there. <laughs> Dave, would you expect anything less? From no, me? I. That's why I looked at you and I said it. I immediately <laughs> looked at you and I saw you go. Oh, he went there. Like I, I would be I curious did. to go back to when I'm going to put that on a T-shirt. Duke, I am your dad. <laughs> I, I would love to go back. That'd be good to, for the fucking universe, Duke. Yeah. Well, anyway, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'd I'd love to go back and read some some old because all of the like you have know, Blade Runner and Star Wars and all the a lot of movies that the initial reaction is always something that gets um recast over time depending on where people fall with it. Like the fact that Blade Runner was like really not well received and not a big hit is kind of lost after you know it's now like regarded as a classic or like even star wars well it was absolutely massive and people loved it there were it didn't have like unanimously good reviews and there were some kind of hot takes about it and those kind of just got forgotten and then and now would be considered like a hot take and i'm really i'd be really curious to go look at like how many this is just a rip off of Flash Gordon or that kind of thing was there back then to see if if that is something that we has just always faced and just got lost because of the success of the franchise like success beats out those kinds of criticisms but also on the other hand though you have like Avatar where mm. it's just dances with wolves and Pocahontas in space and Ferngully it, like yeah. it hasn't been able to escape Smurfs yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like, well, it, it I, hasn't well, been able to see that one. Like, really, it's the same. It's just the same deal. It's just myth. It's classic folk story and and myth and fables and legends rolled into one and it reimagined as something new. And some of them people choose to overlook, and some of them and true ex- execution isn't always the same. So I'm not saying that Avatar is like just like Star Wars because they borrowed from existing stories, but it is really interesting how, where people pick and choose which ones are like. Like Lucas literally, and this is not not even a criticism, but like the amount of stuff Lucas just shamefully ripped off for Star Wars cannot be exaggerated. Well, I mean, and, it, but it's cool, it, it's it, awesome because right, all everybody loves. Yeah, so. I mean, it's right at the beginning with the fucking scroll at the beginning. I mean, that right. wasn't no, original. No, that's not a Star Wars. That's not no. original. That does not originate from Star Wars. But when you think about how that that scroll goes like that, you you go, oh, Star Wars. But it's like, no, nah, but he. Well, these right. are all things Star yeah. Wars is known for now, yeah, and it was right. all taken from other other stuff. Totally. Well, you, you know, I, I think what hurts, biggest thing that probably hurts Avatar is that there's only one of them. There's only one movie, so it's like okay, until well, it be, until it becomes yeah, a. Yeah. Fr- they've been saying for now for what ten years? Like how long have we been waiting <laughs> on those sequels? Like. God. Uh, we might see the air cut before the Avatar sequel. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but the but like the the I I've noticed. Honestly, Stephen, like in the last couple of years, especially like lately on social media, I remember hating the prequel trilogy. I remember not like I okay, the Phantom Menace was like horrible, and I had a thousand reasons why I didn't like it. And I remember not really being a big fan, that big of a fan of Attack of the Clones. And and Thank I remember you, I remember saying for years that like Revenge of the Sith is the only saving grace of the prequel trilogy, and that is it. And that was years ago. And now there are literally there are staunch defenders of the prequel. I have been like people have come at me like, how dare you defile the legacy of Jar Jar? People openly defending Jar Jar Binks and the prequel yeah. trilogy to me like that. There is a strong oh. contingent and- of Star Wars fans that have just pushed. All of that aside from 99 to 05 when we or said George they Lucas- were kids when they saw it right. and that was their Star was their- Wars. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. I was never as harsh on it as as a lot of people were, but I was down on it for a while. And I've I think the thing that I've been most shocked about in in the past decade or so is how much the Phantom Menace has grown on me Too, um, which as like and 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 Jar Jar too, which like is I don't know. That's always a dangerous one to get into. But if you look at kind of Jar Jar and what Lucas was doing with him and how he fits into like, like if you look at Jar Jar and then you go to the Empire Strikes Back and you, well you see that like Jar Jar is the reason that like the whole Empire fell and everything is because the Jedi were not like didn't take him 
didn't take him seriously or kind of looked down on him as pathetic life form, right? Everyone kind of swept him aside. And then along came Palpatine and he's like, oh no, I'm your best friend. I'll let you save everyone. And so in the moment of like trying to prove himself to everyone, he hands Palpatine the keys to the, the government. And then you see like a generation later, Luke ends up on Dagobah. And what does Yoda do? He pretends to be basically Jar Jar to see how Luke treats him so he can determine whether or not Luke is going to make the same mistake as the Jedi did. Um, and wow. that doesn't mean that like Jar Jar is less annoying by any stretch. I mean, it's, <laughs> he's annoying right. as all hell. But there's some really fascinating kind of thematic stuff going on with his character that just totally didn't even get analyzed at all. It's like, oh, the voice is dumb. I hate it. And then well, like well, that's the extent of the, the well, analysis. Uh, well, it, it wasn't just the voices. We'll, we'll go. I'll go ahead and go there. It wasn't just the voices dumb. It, it was that this is a, this is buckwheat. This is a minstrel character, like the way that. No, it was like that's what the, I remember. Aaron Magruder of the Boondocks wrote a comic, basically <laughs> highlighting yes, Jar Jar Binks is a racist stereotype, and there are definitely people out there that still think that. And to that, you know, I I, I had this, but my auntie had this discussion years ago because, like, you look at the Phantom Menace, it's like, okay, George, I see what you were trying to do. You were trying to make allegories of like real life ethnicities within, you know, like the trade federation and, you know, the Nemoidians and like the different alien races in the phantom menace. And perhaps you did it a little clumsily. So it comes <laughs> off stereotypical, right? You know, when you see how Watto, when you hear how Watto speaks, when you hear how any of the, how the viceroy speaks, like in any of his people, it's like, okay, I get what you were doing. You, you didn't go it, it, you went too far into caricature. You went too far into stereotype with it, but you weren't trying to be racist. You were, right. you just, well, and it at didn't the same come time, off as, as cleanly. Exactly. Well, at the same time, you've got like Newt Gunray, the name is inspired by Newt Gingrich, right? Who is like a white dude, right? Right. And so, and so I think that even, even that metaphor, or I, I, if you were to say it's a metaphor, it gets, it gets muddled, which I think means it, I don't think that was explicit. Like to your point, I don't think it was explicitly the intent. I think it was just an amalgamation of all these different things. And each, each race kind of got a ethnicity assigned to it in the same way that different nationalities would have different cultural ethnic, ethnic tendencies. The problem is that when you're doing an analog to real life cultures, you end up in, in like, it's hard to not like stereotype <laughs> or it is. Well, or, it because how do you, how do you be like, Oh, this is, these people are kind of like Asians without like being racist. About well, the well, way you, well, well, you, you know what you brought it, you, you brought up mass effect earlier. And I don't know if you've, have you played th yes. the series? Okay. I'm in the middle of, I'm in the middle of legendary edition right now. And I like just, got, I'm like however many hours into the third game. And so like Shonda and I were actually talking about this, about how like that game has allegories for like real life ethnicities and real life cultures but it manages to avoid stereotype because, well, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't give, you know, the, the Turians don't speak like Israelis or, yeah. and the Koreans don't speak black or, you know, like the, anything like that. But you know that who that's what they are like in a thematic sense. Like they just, they looked at the social ramifications and they built like allegories around what was going on with them instead of just picking the surface stuff and mm -hmm. throwing it in there and saying, well, that's clearly what they are. Well, Star Trek did the Klingons with the Soviet Union. Right, exactly. But they, but by the, when, okay. Now, if we go but back to the Soviets is like hardly a, like you're not going to get in trouble for racially stereotyping Soviets though, in the same well, way that you are. For well, well, that. okay. True. However, if you did it the way that they did it in 1966, you totally would. Because that was essentially brownface. Right? Yeah. They're taking John Calicos and Michael Ansara and they're painting their faces brown and they're giving them Asian features, you know, with the eyebrows and everything and like the, the Fu Manchus and stuff like that. No, the way they did it in 66, no, that you can't get away with that today. However, what the Klingons evolved into, you know, from like the movies on, perfectly fine, which that was something that they learned. They're like, okay, we need to hone this and, and add some more depth and development into it. So that as an allegory got better over time for star Wars got a lot better, but the way they first did it, no, they, there's no way they can do that now. 
Of course not. <laughs> but a lot of things. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. but yeah, no, like it's but but it's but again, it's not something that I hold like I've never held that against Lucas necessarily. It's like because again, I look, I watch the movie and it's like I see what he was trying to do. Yeah. He just didn't go as far enough with it as I felt as as, as, as maybe he should have in terms of that. But like, look, when you talk about the Phantom Menace growing on you, it's like, yeah, I did the the whole rewatch for Rise of Skywalker, and I was like, okay, no, I I mean, Jar Jar is uh, Jar Jar's annoying. This aside, this actually isn't an awful movie. Yeah, it's not, well, you know, the the politics I think are way more interesting than people give them credit for. It's just a different pace than the rest of Star Wars. But like the 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 idea of the of I don't know I'm, that the, lightsaber scene though with Darth Maul is just so funny. Oh yeah, exactly. Or or like so good. I, I, not that so it gets good. overlooked because it it doesn't, but also it's in the middle of the movie and doesn't it does, it gets maybe under um underappreciated is like the pod race scene, like the sound design alone. For the like when Sound Sebulba, design's good. I don't like know when, if the visuals are as good as they should be. They, but they're they're pretty impressive yeah, though. Man, and like, a lot of shots of the it's just like good 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 good. It's like well, I guess that would be like more cinematography. Like uh-huh. that, that's a lot of I don't, maybe more cinematography. I don't know, but also the the pod race. A lot of that is taken from Grand Prix. Like speaking of Lucas ripping stuff off, oh, go like watch. Going, yeah, there's a, yeah, guy, there's a yeah. YouTube video where it's literally the movie Grand Prix has okay, like the okay. same. Like the okay, same, so that same so way. that scene, I mean, yeah, obviously you have like that side shot where like the pan, the camera literally is going like this and following it, just like a mm-hmm. good, 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 good. I guess that's kind of like a parallel to when uh, in in Return of the Jedi when they're on the fucking speed bikes things. Yeah. You know, they kind of did. Uh, he did that same shot. I, I have I have forever considered the pod racing to just be NASCAR. It's what it yeah. is. Yeah. It's it, a it, NASCAR it, allegory. Because NASCAR well, was Ben Hur, but you know, ben- yeah, you know, okay. As far as the arena and everything, yes, you're right, absolutely Ben Hur. Like, well, because the, the prequel trilogy racing. is basically his allegory for the fall of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. I mean, go yeah. and watch Rome on HBO, and you know, yeah, they totally ripped all that stuff off from Lucas's Star Wars on that <laughs> show. I can't believe they would. No, but it's the whole <laughs> idea about how do you lose a republic and gain an empire i mean that was that was even one of lucas's stated goals was i wanted to recast the you know the 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 story of the roman empire yeah well and simply going into the prequels with the with the the predisposition to understand that the jedi were not supposed to be there was so much cognitive dissonance with the jedi in the prequels because Obi-Wan called them like the guardians of peace and justice and they're the heroes. And then people go in and they're trying to force them into that paradigm where once you kind of separate them from that, you watch the prequels, you're like, Oh no, this is about all the ways they fucked up massively, massively all along the, like, like from, you know from the fact that they are embedded with the government to the fact that like they were, they were so dismissive of Anakin to their arrogance to the, like all those things. And, but that, they became the status quo. Yeah. Right. Um, and that that got lost, I, th- I think, A, because it wasn't very like heavy handed, but B, because people's mindset and was and still, you know, you look at like, for example, the backlash to the the Last Jedi. And while I'm not like a big Last Jedi fan, I'll say I see a lot of backlash to the Last Jedi where it's like you guys understand the Jedi were never supposed to be the heroes. Yeah. Right. right. Like it, like Luke's Luke's discovery in Return of the Jedi is that is that 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 is not what they were supposed to be and even obi-wan and yoda are advising him they tell him to kill vader and he doesn't like like every every jedi but luke and qui-gon jinn and maybe obi-wan a little bit is like wrong up until like up until that point and that's kind of the whole point of the story but people kind of want their their um you know heroic space wizard story and it kind of forced it into that paradigm. And then they go back like, it doesn't make sense. Like, well, it doesn't make sense because you are forcing the Jedi into this heroic role. Whereas like, if you look at them as responsible for Palpatine, you're like, Oh no, that's actually like a much more um, fateful story than, than it seems if you twist it the other way. You know, what's interesting about Phantom Menace. Um, it very much, I mean, being that it's the first one in the new trilogy, it's very much like return of the Jedi. In that final act, because you have you have that ground fight that's happening, that ground war, you have the lightsaber fight, and then you have the space 
like, you know, pilot fight, you know, you have three yeah. things that are happening in that final act that you didn't, see, you know, you kind of really didn't see in the, uh, you know, in uh, New Hope or Empire so much. I mean, it was always like, oh, there's part of that. But Return of the Jedi had, you know, the ground yeah. war, had the lightsaber fight, and well, then it had the space fight, too. There's even Phantom a lot. Menace was like, it was, it was almost like George Lucas was like, well, let me just put it all on this one, and then I'm going to try some new shit with the next two. Well, it, There's it was a like... lot of, of Return of the Jedi parallels in Phantom Menace. If you look up oh, like, yeah. the Star Wars ring theory, that you see that that Phantom Menace, while well, people say that it, it, it's like just a remixed A New Hope, it's actually more like Return of the Jedi than it is A New Hope. Right. And you and the, totally. the two trilogies kind of actually move in, from in outside backwards. inside. Right. Out, yeah. yeah. Well, because yeah. exactly. like I, 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 the I opening shot theory. Of, the opening shots of the Phantom Menace are the same as like the shuttle approaching the Death Star in yep. Return of the Jedi also. Well, and, and like you think they, they were talking about how like an attack of the clones, like instead of the camera going down, it actually goes up toward like in the first shot when they're headed toward, to, to Coruscant, which that's a reversal and like how that film is really, I mean, it, it's the middle film just like Empire is. Yeah. Well, and one of my favorite parts about that too then is when, is in um in attack of the clones when anakin goes down into the tent to find his mother is the same as luke going down into the cave in dagobah to find the image of his father and for both of them that was a test and and they both they, I both, guess they both failed, failed they right both and failed. then they go out in yeah. different directions and then and then and i guess this one is this is return of the jedi and, and revenge of the sith and so it's less of the inverted structure but you have the, the the moment of anakin standing over dooku before he cuts him down is a parallel to luke standing over vader before he cuts well, him you down got palpatine in the chair yeah. like like that talk about an homage like that shot is framed to be <sighs> that scene uh, yeah so yeah exactly and so Do it's it. and so like I, it's one of those things where like I, I there's a few parts about ring theory that I don't buy 100% but the parts that I do buy 100% make the the whole the at least Lucas's six movies it elevates them significantly especially the the prequels because you understand what he was doing with the story there which may, which kind of I think a lot of the the frustration with those movies is not knowing how or like why he's making certain decisions and once you recognize the way that it it yeah, subverts, inverts, replays original trilogy stuff, and kind of reframes the whole thing. And and I think it was one of my biggest disappointments with the with the sequels was that they the the general lack of plan also meant that they didn't. There was only a few superficial ways they were able to do anything that seemed like it fit into Ring Theory, which then makes the whole thing kind of fall apart in the last trilogy when, which is really your like. The aspect, and, I, and while I'm frustrated with the, um, the Last Jedi, the Rise of Skywalker is really, or the is that the Rise of Skywalker? That's the, the last one. Yeah, I can't. I just forgot the name of a Star Wars movie. Episode nine. <laughs> yes, <laughs> My, Rise um, of Skywalker. That is the movie where you have the opportunity to like make the whole thing sing by tying the entire like franchise together, and um, and like, and especially if you you if you tie into these themes that are established in Ring Theory. And, and they, and they, and they, that's where they abandoned it the most, I feel like, which is like, it, it, it I don't know, there's parts of the, I don't, I, I don't, there's parts of the, 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 the sequel trilogy I like, there's parts that I don't like, but the one thing about it as a whole is that it, it's hard to take, I don't think it elevates the nine part saga in the way that the six movies that Lucas made elevate each other, adding the next three movies on. Sure. Let's say they're, they're great. They're enjoyable. They're whatever there's nothing you include them with the other six or you exclude them. The quality of the whole doesn't change. Uh, I, I, and as somebody that staunchly defends the sequel trilogy, I would largely agree with that. Yeah. I think it's my biggest criticism against them too, is like, yeah, "Yeah, they're, they're fine. It's just that when you look at the five Disney era, star Wars movies, you could legitimately argue that rogue one and solo do more to lift up the franchise than the sequel trilogy does. That's yeah. where I stand as someone who actually was in, found himself enjoying the anthology movies more than the saga. Oh movies. yeah. Rogue one. Was yeah. 
Yes. Well, you know, and, and I and I talked to you know I had some mutuals on Twitter uh, that were that really don't like Rogue One and think it's How? like a, a waste okay. of a movie. That's and one I'm of the like, weirdest takes like, that I, and, is common. People think well, it's trash. I don't. Well, because the it, and it's weird sense. because they're like, who cared about that? Their question is, who cared about? the story of how they got the plans. And I'm sitting there, a fan of the original trilogy, like, I've been waiting years. I've yeah. really been waiting <laughs> years no, to I hear mean, how they got the damn plans. Okay, <laughs> if you watched if you watched that original, if you watched New Hope and didn't think, wow, that would have been be kind of cool to see how they got the plans, fuck you. Well, that's what's so exciting. The movie starts and it's like, just so you know, something just as exciting as what you're about to see already happened. And you're like, whoa, wait. <laughs> like, right. Well, yeah. and, well, uh, and, and not only that, not only seeing how they got the plans, but also like, you know, finally answering the question about the damn exhaust port, which I wasn't expecting the movie to do. I was not. I didn't go into Rogue One wanting an explanation for why the damn exhaust port existed. That was something that I had made peace with many years ago. And yeah. lo and behold, freaking Hannibal Lecter tells me <laughs> I put it in there on purpose so that I and I knew they wouldn't find it because this is a machine of death and you have to destroy it. You know what's even better is in the uh, the tie-in novel Catalyst, um, which is like one of the better novels I think of the of new canon the, um, of the new canon. Um, is which weirdly because I think a lot of like the tie-in novels were are not always as as good, but but this one, um, it was like a Rogue One prequel basically, and. It, um, it told the story of how the exhaust port came to be via like emails, basically, like it was transcriptions <laughs> of the emails they were sending around, and and Galen Urso basically utilized the bureaucracy of the Empire against itself, where he kept on he he was using like the math of like the heat generated from the inclusion of these protective plates and whatever and and basically just like was creating so much paperwork for these guys to double check his math that eventually they started rubber stamping stuff <laughs> and so he just like, <laughs> he got it through see i um, mean it, it's stuff like that like right. it, it really is stuff like that where like you make it kind of you know it it, it makes it real i guess you could say and i and, and i go back to like you know, Quentin Tarantino has been in the, you know, in the spotlight lately. And I remember one of the things that he talked about when he talks about like making his movies and like what makes them unique. It's like, yeah, I'm going to make these stories about like these people doing these things, but I want them to feel real. That's why you have like uh, Vincent and Jules just having like these random fucking conversations about, you know, what is a fucking Big Mac and, you know, overseas, you know, Royale with cheese. It's like, you're trying to make he's all he's all hey when i want like a character who's like running away and he like st he's like gets in a car and it's, the car's a stick he can't drive a stick you know <laughs> it's just you want those like those real moments for for like some of these you know these extravagant stories you know and 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 i almost think that hey maybe zach is going to like incorporate you know he's going to have like elements of that too when it comes to his stuff where it's like Maybe like when he was watching like Star Wars, like, well, what about what led to that or what did to that? You know, what little story can be incorporated that what, what where can I add another layer to that? You know, that's what I'm hoping for when I when it comes to Rebel Moon is like those little those layers, because we know he likes to do that, especially when I mean, you watch Sucker Punch. Anybody who's like doubting. Like, oh, what is he going to do with this? It's like, well, look at Sucker Punch. Look what he did with something like that. I'm like, what the fuck? You watch that movie and a lot of people go, I don't know. What was that? And then all of a sudden you you try to break it down. And even I didn't have it fully until I watched it with fucking Justin. And I didn't realize all the fucking dick Im imagery that was <laughs> all throughout the movie. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. Well, and you also look at... Um... I don't and think that's, have this isn't necessarily this is all outside the movie stuff, but what's fascinating about that, and not everybody knows this, is Sucker Punch has a animated like prequel short for every single different little world that they go to in the movie, mm -hmm. and it gives like a little bit of history and backstory and like some really cool sort of action. Like every, like each of those places, it has its own mythos story. Yeah. built out, and that's and, what Jeff does, and that's awesome. why I'm like. How do you not get excited for this? Because you, if you, you look, to... if you if you're actually paying attention yes. to Zack Snyder's <laughs> filmography, 
I don't see how you can logically have so many questions about what he's going to do with a space opera or a space fantasy. Like, I mean, it's for- all like, just look at what he's done. Well, look, look at when he had a placeholder for Wonder Woman. He had an entire backstory for that image that didn't even make the final fucking movie. Like, you know, because he knew that it was going to get replaced by wh- whatever happens with the Wonder Woman movie. Yeah, that's going to put right there. But he had a placeholder. He shot the photo and he had an entire backstory for Wonder Woman. And it's like, holy shit. But then that's like totally lost now. But at the same time, you go, that's how detailed he is when it comes to like, not everything is just going to be like, oh, put that there, put that there. No, he's going to have all this like, oh, yeah, well, this is the reason why that's there. That's there. And that's there. Well, and, and the, 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 the really frustrating part, Dave, is when you try to point this out to people and they just... Yeah. They, they they're just like oh you're you're making shit up you're apologizing he's no, not he's that, making shit up right but it's like he he's not that deep of a filmmaker he's Michael yes, Bay yes. on steroids <laughs> he doesn't think about all this shit in real life like that's not how he it's not what he does as anyone who follows uh, at least the early episodes of BVS by the minute knows oh. that's like a running like joke that I, <clears throat> that I had f- excuse me. <laughs> Um, I'm eating granola. Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was like a running joke that I had in like the, at least the first episodes of that was. There's all these things. There's criticism like like that where it's like, is it make up your mind? Is it too subtle or is it too on the nose? Because it, people would always say like, oh well, he's just ham fisted because of all these whatever. And you say, well, what about this? And they're like, well, that wasn't obvious enough. And you're like, well, I don't. So you're saying like the you're saying he doesn't explain this and you say he does. And then you say it's not obvious enough. And then the, and then the other thing you're like, Oh, that's like, I don't like make up your mind. Is it like, you can't say it's, it's both. And I think that, yeah. And that's, and, that, and we're going to get that again, with, especially yeah. with this more than any, yeah. like weirdly, oh, God, gonna yes. get that. like I know, and, and I, yeah. and I, and I know I love- this is not Batman or super, like the fact that this is a, outside of the star Wars franchise should be good for it. But, in a weird way, people are going to get territorial about this one in a weird way. Oh, yeah. Totally. That's like, dude, it's not Star Wars. It doesn't matter, but it's going to be like, oh, this is just like, let it let it not be Star Wars. Like, let it be kind of Star Wars, but not like, why do you, they're going to force it to be Star Wars and then say it ruins Star Wars. The, the, the because- saving, the saving grace of that, though, I think, Stephen, is that because it's not Star Wars and because it's on Netflix they're going to get territorial and the general audience is going to be like, what the fuck are they talking about? Whereas at least with Batman and Superman, unfortunately there was a case where the general audience had an idea of Batman and Superman and was like, could kind of see where the territorialism was coming from. In this case, they're going to go, this isn't fucking star Wars. What are you talking about? It's called rebel moon and it's on Netflix. It's not star Wars. Star Wars is happening. So maybe they'll just look dumb in in front of the general audience. Well, yeah. what's going to be fun is like, you know, even now when like when he starts explaining like the backstory about certain elements, when people ask, I mean, that's what's so great about that's what's been so great about um, this whole journey, like with him in the DC universe is like, he'll, you know, people will ask, oh, why this? Why that? And then he just automatically he has the answer because he's thought about it. It's not like he's just going, oh, let's do this and do that. He always thinks of like every little piece to just be like, okay, well, this is the, like I said, this is the reason. And I love the fact that when he explains it and then all of a sudden everybody goes, oh, oh my God. I, I, I will be honest as a writer, it's fucking intimidating. Yeah. I can't, th- I can't think of shit like that. Like I can yeah. think of intricacies and I can think of story ideas, but it's like his level of detail is like, fuck, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's, you feel self-conscious about it. And, and I, Honestly, I really feel like that's where a lot of the shit comes from. All the jealous YouTubers and all the jealous, you know, failed filmmakers or whatever. They're like, I can't think of that. Fuck him. That's probably what it is. It's totally, you know. It's crazy because like, who was it? It was just someone was just talking recently about working on like Man of Steel and how they're working on like the Smallville battle. And they would know what was going on in this like particular spot. But Zach also had like in his notes what it looked like like down the street and around the corner and like three blocks the other way. 
And yeah. and it's like even though the camera never went there, his worlds are 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 fleshed out in that way. Like I said, with with Sucker Punch, even though it's not in the movie, every single one of those worlds has a consistent exactly. mythos. Or like Krypton, the, the amount of work that went into Krypton. Jesus Christ. That isn't seen on screen. I mean, they developed a language that is not like a spoken language that we don't hear in the movie, a written language that is only barely seen. And people that don't even it's, it's an Easter egg, really, is the only place we even we even see it. Um, and like there's so much he's got. He knows like like the moon is cracked because a, a doomsday cracked it like which we didn't know about until he mentioned that. Yeah, exactly. What, but this is all ago? this is all established written stuff that informs the way things look in the hat and how he tells the story. <clears throat> and, and, you know, same thing for army of the dead. They've got this whole like backstory thing worked out and they've got, you know, I'm sure for rebel moon, they've got the same, um, but only like a sliver of it even makes it onto the screen. And it's kind of, it, it, it it's fascinating to like, if anyone got the army of the dead, the making of uh book, is um Scott Reed report? <laughs> oh, I thought he was gonna pull it. I it's, it, it, it. it's it's not at my ankles. I, I'm no, just pointing Stephen. That oh, is not Steven at my ankles. Actually, reach for it. Oh, okay. Hold on. I, I let me do one. Yeah, I got that one. Yeah, I got the signed one. What's your number, by the way? Two fourteen. No way. No. Uh, I was about to say. Um, I was like, no fucking way. <laughs> I want to know who's got it. I'm surprised someone hasn't like. Uh, two eighty one. That's what true. You You'd think the person who has two fourteen would be would be blurting. Well, oh yeah, that'd be about it. up. It's Twitter. probably someone not on Twitter. Um, yeah, that's true. But um, there's a um, it's <clears throat> the fact that his his crew is like so loyal to him is is really interesting because there's a side of me that can almost see them like being frustrated. <laughs> right. I'll stop Take eating a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, because because you read stuff from like like Julie Berghoff, his his production designer, who talks about like all the stuff like like that destroyed Vegas. They made this whole thing. They had steel and wreckage hauled in because in the desert they can't make like prop sets because the the wind was too high. <laughs> so like all of that stuff is like real steel girders and like junk they had hauled in and dumped there and and in like real cars and all this all this stuff that they don't normally have to work with on movie sets and and these refugee camps were like like they built a refugee camp like an actual refugee camp i mean maybe not quite as big but like they had this all worked and there was posters and propaganda and and the costume design like there's this there's this insane level of detail that like sometimes you glimpse it on on the camera but so much stuff goes into it that that you don't even ever ever see whereas like if i were making the movie i'd be like okay we need to worry about this this frame you know like 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 my office here man you don't want to see anything on this side or this side of my camera well, yeah. like, same thing with, same thing with my little like, corner right here you look you know it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. but no but like if this is, if this is next matter, he's gonna pull this off he's gonna turn it around and it's gonna be every single thing is in place even though it's all it's gonna only factor in behind the camera and obviously that, that informs the actors it informs story decisions it informs the, the the totality of it but every time i read this stuff like in in the making of book or the, the the tech manual the the art art books or whatever for any of his movies it's like whoa it's crazy how much work these artists and stuff do that like gets unrecognized is, yeah. it's not even stuff necessarily that's like left on the cutting room floor it's stuff no, that like was never even there. necessarily intended to to be in the movie it's kind of like absolutely fascinating well and i, and I, I think that's just a testament to how not a dick he is and, yeah. and, and 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 i mean even further than that like it's less that it's it's you know part half of it is he's not a dick but the other half of it is you know they all whenever you hear the loyalists the the, the loyal crew that he has talk about him they're always talking about his energy and his enthusiasm and how like contagious that is on set. So it's literally a case where he has the ability to inspire his crew to make all this shit. That's never going to get seen because he's excited for it. And you got to think that these are crew members. These are people, costume designers, set designers that have worked for so many others in Hollywood who just don't give a damn, you yeah, know, well, and, and, and just don't not- care and are like dismiss their work. Yeah, and the fact that he's on set, on the ground, doing it from sunup to sundown, 
just like all of them, I think makes a difference too. He's not going back and sitting in a trailer and saying, call me when we're ready. Right. Um, or you look at like, if, if you guys haven't listened to it, the, the nonprofit podcast, did you guys, any of you check that out? The no, Mark White I interview. Got, it's three hours. Is that the three hours? I listened yeah, to, I, to I think I got it halfway is, through it. Yeah. yeah. If anyone listens to a single interview with Zack Snyder ever, listen to to that not just for snyder but mark twight himself is fascinating and of course there's anecdotes about all manner of people that caught you know rich citrone and samantha Wynn and damon caro and like anyone who who is shared as like a part of that crew like mark twight was not from hollywood he worked with zach because of commercials because again we're talking about the amount of work that goes into this stuff he came on to help do like this rock climbing thing like literally in one of the commercials he was doing, a guy was going to like fall off a wall or whatever. And it was like a two second shot, but they wanted to shoot. They, they shot it. Like they did all this extra work to make sure it was all done. Right. Even though it was only a glimpse and Mark Twight was like, wow, this guy's different. And so Zach convinced him who like this very anti Hollywood guy to do, come on and do like the, the training programs for these actors. And, and he would, it wasn't just like getting them in shape, but he would like transform them as, as people. He talks about Michael Shannon. Apparently Michael Shannon had a transformative experience working with Twight. Um, and, I don't doubt um, that. I don't doubt that. and, um, and, and I think I, I imagine there's some sort of like mental breaking that goes on in order to shape them into these physical specimens that he, that he does. And then he, he quit Aquaman and, and is not will not go back to Hollywood, and that was like his his ta- his 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 mark on the industry is he made the Spartans, he made Henry Cavill, he made Jason Momoa, he made Zod, and then um and then he quit because what happened to Zach, and that's and that's like his, anyway. So, but the point is, there's three hours of him and Zach just like talking, and so going back to why I originally brought that up was <laughs> um um. I don't know. Were we still talking about? You forgot. You forgot. Oh, oh man. No, Engines. The, 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 the loyalty. The Zack Snyder loyalty. Like the... Yeah. It's, it's, um, there's, there's a really, really fascinating story that he tells at one point in that that really proves the point that I was making. And so the point is, everyone should listen to the three hour podcast yeah. to remember the yeah. point that I spent five minutes building to and then forgot. <laughs> um, you really well, I mean, need to, like, like, you I mean, to write yourself a good look before you man, want imagine to if do I had, the contact. Imagine if I stuck that landing. That would have been a great <laughs> little, but like, I, no, I, you, just, I you need just, a little sticky note. Like, uh, write down your thoughts, Steve. Put it right on your screen. Put it I'm, right on the screen. I'm go just glad. Your context and then let's take the landing. There I'm just go. glad I'm not the only one that does that. Because that happens, and, and it's one of the worst feelings it, in the world, it, too. Sometimes it it's about the journey, not the destination. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> but then yeah, we but, wonder what the hell was the journey about. Yeah, <laughs> but, but 100%, I, I can unequivocally say, if, if you have to listen to it in five-minute chunks or whatever, everybody needs to work their way through that podcast. It's, it is illuminating and fascinating. If well, I mean, in I mean, and how he works and, and, how, yeah. and why people work with him. Well, I mean, Zach's just, he's just, he's just a, an odd duck in a good way. I mean, the fact that he's come on here many times just to talk. I mean, the last time, I mean, I, uh, over the 4th of July weekend, I, you know, one of my good buddies who I haven't seen in, in a bit, he was like, dude, you had Zach Snyder on. And I'm like, yeah, more than once. He goes, yeah. It was like, anytime that I was, I like went to your videos and saw that, I'm like, that's a big deal. And I'm like, and I just, to me, I was like, yeah, the guy just likes to shoot the shit. He just likes to talk about this kind of shit. He doesn't mm-hmm. let the fucking, you know, where he's at get to him. He just wants to just, hey, these people like my shit. I'm going to talk to them, you know? And there's been many times where <coughs> if I send them the link to the vodka stream, he doesn't show up. I don't expect him to. I'm not like, but then he'll like text me the next day. Hey, sorry, I missed that. That's fine. I know you're busy, dude. I don't care. I'm just, I'm just sending you just open door policy. That's all it is. But the fact that he does do that, you know, and, and it will happen again. And it's just, he's just, he's just an odd duck in a, such a good way where it's like, it's, it's different. You're not going to get a James Cameron or somebody like that to do something where he just shows up on a random fucking, you know, I think the closest to that maybe be a Quentin Tarantino, but at the same time, it's uh, like, 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 like Quentin or or maybe Soderbergh because I know he's, maybe, I know he's yeah. on podcast. But, but a lot of those guys though are more like or like or like um, Ryan Johnson is like that too, yeah. where they're like buddies 
with people on like film Twitter and we'll, we'll have them to set or, or talk to them off the record and stuff, but, but don't do like the, I don't know to say it's all publicity or press necessarily, but like not going to jump on a stream by any chance though. Like they're just like friendly with, with people, but quietly. Right. Um, like with what Zach does, it's very different. Yeah. Yeah. Very well, it, well, cause he's not a product of, he doesn't seem to be a product of the system. Yeah. And a lot of these yeah. other yeah. filmmakers are totally a product of the old Hollywood system and like work within it. He is, and, and, and that's where a lot of the animosity, that's where a lot of the, the, the budding heads with like Warner brothers and shit comes from is he bucks too much of the old Hollywood trend and too much of the old Hollywood guard. Well, and they don't have leverage over him sort of. No, as a result. I think another, another interview, a print interview that I always reference from, I think it was from the New York times back before like BVS came out, like back before the narrative on him started to really shift. And I'll get to the point on this one. So I don't lose it. Um, <laughs> That one of my favorite like, anecdotes from it ever was they said something like, what does Zack Snyder do on the weekend? Or like, what is your, what do you do for Rick for fun? And, and he said, I, so, um, I don't remember the exact answer. I just remember him saying something like, oh, you know, a lot of, a lot of basketball games. And they were like, oh, you a Lakers fan. And he's like, oh no, for the kids. Um, and it was just such a, a funny thing. And you could see the, both the reader and the interviewer were like, Oh yeah, big Hollywood director got courtside seats probably, or got a box. You know, he goes to the games all the time, and he's like, no, he's got like a kid who plays high school basketball, and that's where he spends like his. You know, he's got eight kids or what, five kids, whatever, <laughs> and that's where he that's where he spends his his like time is like. Or he was on was it on somebody's show recently? He was on he was on a podcast recently, and um and he was like, well, I got to go. I've got to take uh sage or one of the kids to uh to the to her writing lesson and it's just like it's so like real person and on in a way that like not that other directors don't have families or do stuff with their families by any stretch i mean there there's lots of family people in hollywood but no not anyone that's like kind of a normal person at that level that's like like open about their normalcy i don't know well i mean like when i interviewed uh when i had deborah on I'm just talking to her and then Zach just pops in. Hey. Yeah. And then he like sits down for a bit. One of his daughters is like jumping on him, blah, blah, blah. And then he talks for about two minutes and goes, I'm going to go make chili. <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, okay, cool. Yeah. From scratch, by the way, from scratch. And I'm like, no, yeah, man, I'm sure that, yeah, I'm like, send me a fucking bowl. And he just goes, yeah, well, you know, just, and then he just walks off. And that was it. And then I finished talking to Debbie. I mean, that's just that's just the kind of guy he is, man. It's it's awesome. Yeah. But uh, we're almost going to four hours here, Scott. You look like you're getting antsy to like. Yeah, I saw the. You, you, you know, I got the cat. You know, I've got the baby monitor like yes, right yes, here. I, just, and I'm just I, like, I, I, I was like, I saw the yawns. I think Ray even kind of was like, all right, it's, it's yeah. time to get this. You can uh, tell when I go on. Uh, the second I the second I lost track of my my Mark <laughs> Twight story, I was like, yeah, eh, it's time to wrap up. I'm like, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anytime, anytime I'm looking at, you know, anybody's like, you know, faces, stuff like that, I'm like looking at the time, like, yeah, it's getting pretty late. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. And uh, of course, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you to Zaki uh, to, uh, for showing up. I uh, really enjoyed talking to him. Great dude. Um, uh, follow him, of course, and, uh, you know, follow his podcast, uh, the Movie Film Podcast, which is. Uh, you got it right was, this time. I got it right. I know. I was like, film movie. I was like, mm, shit. Yeah, but I got it right this time. No, it's a, it's a good podcast. He has a good dynamic with his uh, buddy, Brian. Brian, right? Yeah, Brian. And um, yeah, and his commentaries, too. I haven't really listened to those ones, though, because, um, you know. If I I, I I should be watching the movie that he's actually done. I know he did the Rocket. I got to revisit the Rocketeer. Yeah, I, you we do. Brought that you up do. Tonight. Yes, you do. Ooh. Yeah, we I brought that know. up tonight, too. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. Like, you know, who directed that? I'm like, hmm, yeah, the correlation to that. I'm like, I definitely made her. I haven't watched that in pff, probably since the 90s. So, yeah, oh my definitely got to revisit it. All right, let's go around the horn. Scott, last, of course. Um, let's go with Ray first. Uh, my show, the flight cast and my blog, uh, is at the and also, uh, the show is where you can find all podcasts on 
you know, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, all Stitcher, all that stuff. I'm on Twitter at the Flatcast, which is usually where you can find me and converse with me about anything and argue if you wish to, depending <laughs> on what you what you want to say. Debate, debate. D- debate. There you go. That's that's a better way to put it. Debate. Yeah. Yes. Ray. 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 Okay, <laughs> and now uh, we got throw a knife at Stephen. Good, yeah, uh, I'm Stephen. You can find me on on Twitter and Instagram and all the places at SM Colbert. I uh, you can find my writing at ScreenRant.com, and you can find m- lots of me talking about Zack Snyder movies, usually in single minute increments. <laughs> at oh, uh, we're gonna get a Rebel Moon by the minute already, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he, he's he's I, I like that he's making so many. I. <laughs> I don't wish that he would slow down. I just wish that it was easier to, to. Um, I, I wish that we were the the content You're not even through PBS, right? Because yeah. you know that Stevens, because you know Rebel Moon's not going to be short. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> For all yeah, you know, going to be a series. <laughs> you can find um, you can find all that all those podcasts at uh, SnyderMinute.com. And uh, I do know that we we've done a quite a bit of of recording recently, and so so fans of the shows um, will have uh, some some cool surprises to look forward to in the uh, coming days. Nice. All right. Then finally, Scott. Oh. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at ScottDC27. You can find my podcast, the DC Film Squadcast, wherever podcasts can be found. We're on Vero, Facebook, YouTube. You can find the entire network of shows at squadcastmedia.com. You can find me every Saturday night talking to this guy about Batman the Animated Series. This week, we're going to be talking about the classic mob episode, It's Never Too Late. And then eventually, when Meg is a little less busy, uh, I'll be back <laughs> over at Wonder Meg talking about Dune chapter by chapter. There it is, man. You do that so well, Scott. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's why he's last. That's why he's last. <laughs> oh, and, and, by the way, episode by episode and by the way, I know it's technically stuff. the next day, but <laughs> happy birthday, Ray Porter. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. Is that the McFarlane yeah. one? Yeah, yep. it's the McFarlane one. It's the 10-inch? Uh, yeah. Uh, is it? Nice. Oh, yeah, it is. Huh? Yeah, it is. Nice. I've got mine are supposed to be eventually, but that's that's a good size. I'm Man, between that and the, the Hot Toys, I've got some cool stuff coming that's gonna be nice i'll have to stop doing the soft focus on the background so you can actually see i know right it's like hey, I see this stuff, right? There, yeah. there is a little bit of kind of this like, what is that over yeah. there <laughs> he's just trying to do that you know that that uh dream dream uh lens right there and anyways guys um yeah thank you for uh joining and like i said thank, thank you to zaki for uh coming in and uh of course talking to me for a little bit uh good conversation right there Make sure you hit that like thumbs up before you leave. Hit that notification bell so you know when I'm doing this stuff. Hit the join button if you want to join Film Junkie Support the channel. Get some um, members-only vlogs. And uh, once a week, I do a stream as well. And then, of course, the Patreon if you really want to help out the pirate ship to get some uh, early access to things. And, of course, partake in the Patreon stream, which will happen tomorrow. And then, of course, Film Junkie Closet merchandise down below. All right, guys. We love you, and uh, we will definitely uh, talk to you later. (laughs) 